Councillor Carlone. Councillor Carlone. Yes. The has arrived and you have a quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. I call this meeting of the Finance Committee to order. The call of the meeting is to conduct a public hearing of the city budget covering the fiscal period July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. There will be additional hearings on May 18th at 10 a.m., May 19th at 6 p.m., and May 20th if needed. The following sections of the budget have been pulled in advance for questions from counselors. It's, it's very likely that additional uh, sections might be pulled during this morning. The, the areas that have been pulled for this today is budget overview, that's finance and budget, executive, and then executive related to domestic violence prevention, executive relating to housing liaison, executive related to public information office, and then fire department, inspectional services, law department, license commission, police department, and traffic parking and transportation. The governor's executive order issued on March 12, 2020 has authorized the use of remote participation at meetings of the city's public bodies in response to the threat posed to the public by COVID-19 virus and issued guidelines for the city's use of remote participation. In addition to having members of the council participate remotely, we've also set up Zoom teleconferencing for public comment. Please be aware that Zoom is primarily being used for public comment. In order to watch the meeting, please tune to channel 22 or visit the city's open meeting portal on Cambridge's website. If you would like to provide public comment, please visit the City Council section of the webpage, of the city's webpage. Instruction for how to sign up to speak is posted there. Once you've completed the sign up procedure, you will receive a link to this Zoom meeting. We will not allow any additional public sign up after 9.30 a.m. Mr. Clerk, please take a roll call of the members present, and with that, all of today's votes will be by roll call. Mr. Clerk? Good morning. Oh, oh, Vice Mayor Mallet. Present and audible, thank you. Present, Councilor McGovern. Present and audible. Present, Councilor Nolan. Present and audible. Present, Councilor Simmons. Present. Present, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Present and audible. Present, Councilor Toomey. Present and audible. Present, Councilor Zondervan. Present and audible. Present, Mayor Siddiqui. Present and audible. Present, Councilor Carlo. Present, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, today's agenda uh, or format is the following. Departments and budget book sections being considered are already listed on the agenda, what I've called out. We'll, we will then discuss department budgets that are pulled by counselors. Um, I'll thank counselors that in advance who have submitted their questions for discussions by the requested deadline. Uh, we will obviously entertain uh, any important questions that have not been pulled to date we will recess for lunch for about 45, 445 minutes at approximately noon. That will depend on the discussion. It might be a little later. We will remind counselors to keep questions and comments directly related to the budget in front of us. 
In the interest of time and moving discussion forward, please limit questions for each department by each counselor to two. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask my co-chair who's present, Councillor Simmons, if she would like to add any additional comments. Councillor Simmons. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Co-chair. Uh, thank you for the opening remarks. And I just want to be sure when you said we will keep you to two, you mean two questions or two minutes or both? <laughs> he said. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Councillor. So I want to just welcome to day one of the Finance Committee hearings for Fiscal 22 budget of the Cambridge City Council. And as I agree upon by myself and my Finance Committee co-chair, Councillor Carlone, we have divided the duties of these hearings by placing me at the helm of the primary chair during last year's round of budget hearings and placing Councillor Carlone at the helm this year. Therefore, I look forward to Council Carlone driving this process forward today and, of course, these hearings. And I will stand poised to step in during those moments when we need to step away, when the chair needs to step away. And I have questions for various departments as well. In terms of my general open remarks of the budget hearings, I just want to say that I applaud the work of the city manager, the finance department, and their team. And I've done as much as I can to to support them, but also to applaud the fact that they've done so much work to maintain critical city services throughout most of our challenging periods uh, that any of us have lived through. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it tremendous challenges. The City of Cambridge has only continued to function and maintain our existing staff, and we have established lifelines, fiscal and otherwise, to some of our most vulnerable community members during this time. I do want to state that it's imperative that the city continues working to lift up and bring relief to our black-owned businesses, black and brown-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, which are among the most hardest hit uh, during this past year. If businesses are to fail, if these businesses are to fail, it will send ripple effects through our community, and likewise, if they succeed and thrive, that shall create positive ripple effects. So I want to keep my remarks brief, as I know we have a very long day uh, ahead of us. So I'll stop there and just thank everyone who worked so hard and diligently to put this budget together. I look forward to the presentation and to the question and answer sessions as they unfold throughout the hearings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield the floor. Thank you, Co-Chair Simmons. I want to add that you speak for both of us, and I greatly appreciate your comments. So uh, for the public, uh, we want you to know that um, the budget book is an inch and a half thick and uh, very detailed uh, in many areas. One of the things that we ask the administration to do this year is to explain a, more about the process. They've done that. Um, it probably added 20 pages, but um, if you're interested in, in greater detail of how the process is done, um, please do look at it. It includes definitions as well. In the past, we've asked some general questions about that, and I greatly appreciate it. This year, obviously, um, the past year has been a difficult year for the city. Um, both in figuring out the budget and in balancing situations, uh, less income in some areas that I think the manager might just casually mention, not in great detail. So this is an unusual year, and Cambridge uh, pretty much comes out in a very good balance uh, state of affairs. Um, there are always issues. Um, Councillors have particular issues that are important to them, and this is the way we discuss those issues and question scope. But the questions today by council, as I said earlier, will relate to the budget and scope, um, and uh, we will go from there. Uh, the next portion of the discussion is an introduction by the city manager. Mr. Manager, uh, could you uh, please present your preliminary thoughts on the budget today? Uh, no, certainly. I'll make some open remarks and then turn over 
to David Kale for specifics. But first of all, I want to thank the two co-chairs, Councilor Colon and Councilor Simmons, for all the work they've done throughout the year, working with myself and my finance team in terms of the finance position of the city and really helping deliver and work with us the budget we've produced today. So I want, I am pleased that we were able to receive some of the council's submitted questions in advance of today's hearings. I think that's always helpful. Our staff work incredibly hard and have demonstrated their commitment, flexibility and creative creativity to residents of our city, particularly during this pandemic. It has been a very challenging year and you have in front of you a budget that I think would be the envy of most cities in the Commonwealth. All departments dedicated an enormous amount of time and preparation of the budget and really how it addresses the city council priorities. I can't stress enough that the department has have really spent the tremendous time focused on city council priorities. We think the council should ask questions and concerns they have with the budget and no question is too difficult. However, what concerns me is that some of the submitted questions that we have received perceived to be having a negative tone it can have potential impact on the test staff. I raise this issue because I don't believe it's the intent of the council. And I hope that all of us, as we move forward, can keep this in mind during this important budget discussion. I'll now turn it over to Davis for the financial position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Kale. I'll just be brief. I think as we talked about last year, when we developed the 21 budget, we had to make adjustments and we talked a little bit about that last night about holding positions till uh, April um, in the way we budgeted them uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, while things look like they're improving, clearly one of our strengths in the past has been our ability to use non-property tax revenues. Um, we are continuing to use those, but frankly, they're at the lower amounts that we established when we set the tax rate in the fall. Hotel motel tax is uh, budgeted um, approximately to what we budgeted. We were getting $16 million a year. We're getting far less than that. We're budgeting 75% um, uh, less than that amount. Meals tax looks like it's uh, a rebounding, but again, nowhere near than the five or six million we were normally getting. Traffic and parking funds are coming back, but again, we've been conservative and have made adjustments to their revenue streams. You've approved the water and sewer fund uh, budgets uh, with the tax with the water and sewer rate again we had to make adjustments with our revenues there um, state aid um, again fortunately has not been reduced and is being increased uh, uh, based upon the governor and the house ways and means budget so there's pluses and minuses again in the departmental budgets we've done, been conservative to make sure that we don't over budget our revenues um, and hopefully by the time the fall comes, uh, we will have a better sense of where things really will be um, in, in September and looking forward to the remainder of the fiscal year and make any adjustments. Um, I know that the manager uh, may want to speak to uh, uh, levy increases, but again, I would just point out that the levy increase in this budget is 8.95%, uh, which is one of the largest increases that we've had in recent memory. And um, even though while in the fall we tried to reduce um, that percentage increase in the levy, uh, we've been able to do that by using our reserves and non-property taxes, revenues that uh, we feel we could expand upon based upon actual receipts in the prior fiscal year. I'm not as confident that we're gonna be able to do that in the fall. And I think that, um, and the manager may expand upon this about you know, impact on property taxpayers in terms of what we're presenting in terms of their tax bills in the fall. Again, we've been very fortunate to be able to produce budgets that have expanded services that basically have had limited impact on the uh, levy and the impact on people's actual property tax bills. Um, uh, again, though, I think our for the, one of the things that we're fortunate is that we are below the levy limit, but we are going to use some of that in terms of balancing the budget in fiscal 22. As I said last year, 21 um, was a bridge year. Um, we're on the other side of that bridge and hopefully things will continue to get better. But as we also said, it's gonna take a few years before we get back to where we were in 19. And I think while things look encouraging, um, you know, our revenues are not what they were um, with regard to the um, non-property tax side. So that's gonna have an impact on how we balance the books. So um, I don't see you wanna add anything, Mr. Manager. 
Thank you, Mr. Kale. Uh, are there any other additional comments by Mr. Jennings or others on your staff? Uh -huh. um, thank you through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks again to staff, department staff, city manager, um, fiscal staff. Uh, the budget book is obviously very comprehensive. It has a lot of information in it um, and takes a lot of work to put together. But it's really critical that it's clear to you as a council. It's understandable to not just the council, but also the community members who are interested in it, um, because there is a lot of information and it's important information about how the city uses resources and where we set priorities um, and the work we do. So happy to move forward with the discussion. Look forward to helping clarify anything and answer questions that come up. Thank you all. Mr. Manager, did you want to conclude with any comments? No, I, I would just say, you know, obviously the second part of the budget hearing becomes in September with the tax rate. So one thing that is tricky is that when you vote for a tax rate in September, October, it's really based on what happens in these hearings. And as David had mentioned, uh, primarily due to the COVID uh, finances, uh, we are looking at a larger tax increase than usual. I think we will continue to do everything we can to keep that number down. But obviously, there are demands that we our residents expect. And uh, we think we're giving you be the best of both situations. But uh, it is this is a year where we will be seeing about an 8% levy increase. Uh, and it'll be the fifth year in a row that the percent of the levy has gone up, but I think we can explain why in all those situations. So I think I'll look forward to these discussions. I know the department heads are ready for your questions, so I'm ready to stop when you are. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Manager. I'm so, going to- um, So Mr. One, Chair, excuse me, Mr. Chair, but just a point of information. Yes, Councilor. Um, I was just reviewing very quickly the questions and it looks like the mayor's questions might've been left off the Yes, I, I have it, thank, thank you. you. Swan McAware, thank you. I, I was just um, going to go over the list already. Thank you, Mr. Uh, this is the list I read earlier and I'm going to read it again was the list that was put together by the clerk from questions and requests for pulling certain departments as of Friday uh, noon. Uh, since that time, uh, we do have uh, other questions and these departments have not been pulled as of yet. So the questions that came in later, if after I read the list again, if you wish to pull a department uh, that you have a question for, um, please let me know. So I, I will read the list one more time just for clarity. And I will list the counselors who have asked questions related to that, again, that came in on Friday. Budget overview, uh, questions from Councillor Toomey and myself. Executive questions from Vice Mayor Mallon. Executive Department questions on domestic violence professions from the Vice Mayor. Executive Department housing liaison questions, and these departments have been pulled from Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Executive Department Public Information Office questions from Councilor Sabrina Wheeler and Vice Mayor Mallon. Fire Department, questions from Vice Mayor Mallon. Inspectional Services, questions from Vice Mayor Mallon. Law Department, questions from Councilor Simmons, co-chair. License Commission, questions from Councilor Sabrina Wheeler and Vice Mayor Mallon. Police Department, questions from Councilor Sabrina Wheeler, Vice Mayor Mallon. Co-Chair Simmons, Councillor McGovern, and myself. Traffic parking and transportation questions from Councillor Sabrina Wheeler, Vice Mayor Mallon, and, Council and myself. Now, in looking at the additional questions that came later, I suspect uh, there will be other departments pulled, and this is your opportunity now uh, to pull them. Uh, I don't see hands raised, so counselors, uh, just call out if you wish to uh, 
to address the full council and the committee. Mr. Chair? Councilor Sabrina Wheeler, yes, please. Um, there were a couple that, that may have been followed, and so apologies if I, if I missed it, but uh, I wanted to make sure we pulled information technology and the housing liaison. Information technology. I'm sorry, and the second one, Councilor? Uh, housing liaison. Um, I should have, I did mention that, but maybe I skipped over it. Yes, that's already been pulled. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Chair Carlone? Yes, Councillor Nolan. Yes, um, and sorry, it, it appears that um, I did send questions late over the weekend. That's fine, that's fine. There was a, um, although these are relatively um, simple questions that hopefully can be addressed. Um, employee benefits? Employee benefits. I'm just writing this down, so one sec. Yes, Counselor. Budget policy. Budget. Um, okay. Is that, that, Mr. Chair, could we define what that means, please? Is that budget overview, Counselor Nolan? Well, it is. Um, the, uh, a very specific question I asked was was just related to how it is that we will in this budget at least reference the fact that we will intend to change our budget policy in line with the council order that was passed about divestment from fossil fuels and private persons. We recognize we won't have a full policy, but I want it to be reflected that we will be working on it. So, okay. Mr. Chair, I think that would probably be deferred to next week under financial summaries. Okay. I, I would defer to you. What I see on the list is budget dash policy is one of the um, actual uh, elements. If it's next week, that's fine. So, Mr. Kale, you believe it is? The financial summary is the, po the investment policy is under financial summary. Okay, thank you. So sorry, I, I just want to make sure we have it right. Financial summary. And fi after financial summary, it was investment policy? That is, that is part of the financial summary. Yes, investment policy. Yes. Thank you. Any other counselors? Yes, electrical. I, I'm sorry, you have to repeat that. Electrical. Sorry, electrical. 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 Oh, electrical. For some reason, I'm not hearing it very well. Electrical, yes. And, and I believe those are the only ones that uh, are in addition to the ones you have called, several of which I also had questions on. Thank you, Chair Carlon. Thank you, Counselor. Madam Mayor, do, you, do you, yes, please. Um, Council is on there, Van. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to pull the clerk's office as well. Clerk's office. Yes, Councillor. Anything else? That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Madam Mayor, is there anything that you would like to pull? I think all the ones that... Um Okay, I'm just looking at your your list. I think diversity committee and committee on civic unity. Made yes, that. yes. You also have. Oh, that is already pulled. Yes, you're correct. Everything has been pulled. So, um, unless I hear otherwise, that'll be all the departments that are pulled. And I'd like to move to forward the balance of departments. So, Mr. Budget. Chair, Council? are you asking for a motion to move the balance of those departments with a favorable recommendation? Thank you, Co-Chair. I still move. So move. Um, Mr. Clerk? On that motion? Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes. Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes. Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes. Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes. Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes. Councilor Toomey. Yes. Yes. Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Was that a yes, Councilor Zondervan? Yes. Yes. Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes. Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes nine in favor, zero against. Thank you all. Uh, we're going to open up public comment now, 
and depending on the number of people. So uh, at this moment, no one has signed up, and so we only leave it open for five more minutes, correct? Okay, I think we'll start right in um, in our discussion, and if someone joins us in the next few minutes, we'll pause and let them speak. So I will go through the list as we have it here. So the first um, department is the budget overview, parentheses, finance, comma, budget. Uh, the first question is by Councillor Toomey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. To you, to, um, Mr. Keel, uh, Mr. Jennings. Uh, I know last year was $7 million was allocated for travel and training, and I assume the, the city had in place a, a, uh, a pause on any type of travel. So I assume there's some several million dollars that was saved uh, from that. And now I see that this year we're setting at, at $5 million. So my two questions are, do we anticipate that there will be an increase in the travel account? And, I also saw, which kind of surprised me, the Veterans Department of budget, uh, I think it was 70% 70 of their budget is going to travel and training. And I was wondering if I can get some specifics on why that is. I think it's, it's almost 70% of the veterans budget is travel and training. So I assume if we have the figure how much that was saved by uh, no travel and training last year, uh, if there was, what, what the amount was, and do we anticipate uh, now with some relaxation on the COVID, but I don't see much travel uh, coming up, and also on the Veterans Department, why that is uh, such an such a large portion of their budget. So I, I guess I can start off, and then I'll turn it over to David and Taha for more detail. Uh, the travel and training budget, it, it's a category that's set by the state in terms of municipal finance, what falls into those categories, and what has happened is the real training amount of that $5 million is about a half a million dollars. That That is what we put in there for travel. Uh, the rest of it is almost 600,000 professional development uh, to subscriptions and then there's judgment and damages, which also includes the veterans payments, which is the largest number. So about of the bulk of $500,000 that we budget for travel, uh, you're right council, most of that was not spent as last year or this fiscal year. Uh, we are starting to open up based on the governor's guidelines and based on discussions with the health department, some of our travel. So it, it's about a $500,000 budget. But I'll let David and Ty, if they want to jump in with more of the specifics on the veterans and the rest of the statutory categories. Um, Ty has the details. So I'll let him do that. Uh, for last fiscal year, uh, we had an unexpended balance of about a million dollars in the travel and training account from balances not being expended. And Tao, why don't you talk about, again, some of the specifics? Yeah, and, and as the city manager and, and David mentioned through you, Mr. Chair, uh, most of the travel and training budget is not actually for travel. Um, of that amount, it's really about half a million that is actually set aside for travel purposes. Uh, when you take out the you know, the amount that goes towards the school department in that category, um, which is about 1.2 million. Uh, professional development and tuition reimbursement is about 600,000 of that. Uh, dues and subscriptions, which also falls under that category, is about 274,000. Um, and then the judgments uh, and damages also falls under travel and training. And there are a number of things that fall into that category, including uh, medical services and also veteran um, benefit payments. That's the reason that the veterans department travel and training budget seems so high. That's not for trips or things like that. That's actually where we pay uh, veteran benefits out of. And, and as a reminder, the statutory categories that we have, salary wages, other ordinary maintenance, which is supplies and services, travel and training, and the extraordinary, which is equipment, 
that those uh, categories are established by the state in their accounting practices. So even though some of the categories that are under quote unquote, the travel and training statutory category are not as obvious as you would think, for example, um, the workers comp medical services and the like in the veterans payment. So, um, or when we have appropriations uh, that get charged to the law office uh, uh, damages account. So again, it's, it's counterintuitive about the title, but in fact, what is contained in those statutory categories in terms of specific object codes. So it is a little confusing. Mr. Chair? Yes, Councillor, please. Thank you, and I appreciate the, uh, the response. And uh, it's, you know, very uh, rewarding that we are providing our veterans uh, with uh, services. And I think that's so important and we appreciate what we're doing for all our veterans. So it just seemed to me when I looked at that account that 70% was going to travel and training. And it really, you know, it probably should be in a different category, but if it's a statutory requirement, it just looked to me like, and the, the whole travel and training was $5 million toward, um, but um, I guess, you know, that's the way it has to be reported. But, and, and I'm glad that this money is going to services for our veterans who have served us well over the years. So that's very important. So. Uh, but I wish it was kind of categorized in a different way so people would recognize that we are, in fact, providing these benefits to our, to our veterans. And, and it would be, if it was in a different category, people would appreciate much more than seeing that, that this money was going directly to veteran services and not to travel and training. So I appreciate the response. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your question, Councillor. Uh, I'm next, and my comments were more... Uh, comment related than questions, but uh, has the city entertained, and I'm talking about budgeting now, entertain an evaluation program? Is there an eternal evaluation program of uh, looking at previous budgets, what worked? I assume there is, but we don't really talk about that. Um, Mr. Manager, Mr. Kale, um, do we have such a program department by department so i can jump in so in the budget discussions uh we often take a look and work with the departments on what services they're providing that may not be providing as good a service as possible however in because of the financial position of the city we have often not then addressed those positions by reducing them or putting the money elsewhere we try to figure out ways of making those programs more successful yes so we have those discussions, but they're not really to discuss whether or not the program should really continue, to be honest. It's more about how we can improve the employment. Uh, and that's been an ongoing discussion probably for the last 30 years about how to improve rather than should that money go to a different program uh, because we try to do as much as we can for everybody. So the discussion is there, but in terms of evaluating on a program with a discussion is it worth per se with the dollars we spend versus something else uh, because of our financial position, to be honest, that's a discussion we often don't have, but I'll let David and Taha talk a little more on that if, if they choose. Um, I would just say that as, uh, again, we're, we're in a, a good position in the sense that we have the ability to look at these things in a holistic fashion and a prudent way. So as opportunities, as the manager said, present themselves, we try to take advantage of those. And I, I know that, uh, um, you know, the place where we have a lot of programs such as human services, I know that uh, Assistant City Manager Semnoff does that um, uh, constantly. Uh, for example, when we had a vacancy in the general services department, we basically did consolidation so that it fell under the finance department and we were able to make uh, some reductions there and still provide services in the print shop and the uh, postage area. And then um, when we had a vacancy in the weights and measures, we evaluated the program and we were able to consolidate that within the inspectional services department to basically take advantage of some economies of scales and basically provide uh, better service in my opinion. So um, as opportunities present themselves, and I just gave two examples, we do look at that. And then on the programmatic side with uh, uh, regard, regard to the social service side, I, I think that happens constantly. And uh, as the manager said, I think we try to make improvements uh, to make the service delivery better. Um, but it is a constant conversation that does take place. It's done in a, 
in the budget hearings, but it's also done year round to be honest with you as opportunities present themselves. Thank you. So in essence, you are constantly refining scope and programs um, over time. It, yes. Especially yeah. programs that don't affect the residents directly is, yeah. what I would, is, is most. Yes, thank you. My, my second question, which I realize is, doesn't have to be in this meeting, but I have it here. The scope of City Hall renovations, um, it's been almost a year since we talked about it and construction's going on. Just briefly, can you tell us, um, are the offices for counselors in this scope or is that a second year scope? So I, I can have David go over the specifics and I know the council is aware of this, but I will remind them again that about six weeks ago or seven weeks ago, there was a concern that how we can keep the council more updated of what's going on. And that is not specifically addressed in your account question council, but I do want to remind the council that for the last five weeks, we have been giving them the updates of where we are. That, that doesn't give you long range plans, but it does keep you up to date of what's happening in the building. But for your question council, which is more of a long range question, I'm going to have David give you an update on that. Yeah, as a brief overview, what we've started it, uh, the construction now, and basically the first phase is to basically uh, run the new electrical and plumbing throughout yes. the building. And that's happening and that and putting in smoke detectors um, and then providing juice to the different floors. Um, that, that should be wrapping up in the next month or so, uh, give or take a uh, month and a half. And then um, the elevator will be replaced over the summer. So that'll happen. And then at the same time, uh, the plan is to start the renovations to the basement level so that the assessing offices can move from the second floor to the basement level. Um, and then once that done, once that is done, uh, then we'll be able to work on the vacated assessing offices to provide uh, office space for uh, council and the council aides. And then the project will be done. And uh, um, it's about a year and a half away, but basically that's the phasing of the project in broad strokes. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Nolan, it looks like you have a question for finance. Is this, this is just overall in the budget overview is the section we're on? Yes. Okay. Um, I do want to um, add on to your question about the municipal improvements. I, I also had inquired about what are we doing in line with our policy of any time we do building improvements that we pay attention to our own policy regarding um, getting closer to net zero and Commissioner O'Reardon sent me a list of the various ways in which this upgrade is trying to reduce the um, the impact on adverse impact on the climate that our own operations at City Hall have. Um, and I and I know they're they're seeking to do more and I will continue to push us to do more. It's an old building, but we really have to get to a better place. But I really appreciate it and wanted to um, thank the city for that response to my question on this on this issue. If thank we're you. in the budget overview section, I'm not sure if this is the um, correct place to, to be, but there is a mention on page I-26 of the future of the public safety task force. And we can either talk about it here or at another time, but I'm incredibly- that Another time then, we'll get okay. to it. Thank you. I, I just noticed you had a finance question and uh, Would that- you, On the, uh, oh, on the pensions? Well, I know an entirely new budget cash management pos policy will not be ready in time. Right. I believe that's the one that, um, uh, Director Kale said we should hold off until next week. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I think I, I do think on the precursor to for the entire budget overview, I want to echo that it's an incredible job to get this out there. It would be really helpful to me and I think to others as well. To in many areas, the specifics of the outcome and performance measures are not actually very specific and they do not include outcome measures. And some departments excel at that and others don't have those outcome measures. They're not SMART goals. They're not specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, or time-based. And I really encourage us to move to a, a situation where every single 
one of those are. And again, I appreciate there are many departments that are getting there, but there are others where it's very difficult to know how we would measure success because it is not any kind of measure of what the actual outcome would be other than, for instance, holding a meeting. We want to make sure the meetings held are effective and produce some kind of outcome. Uh, thank you. Are there any other comments about budget overview or questions from counselors? Yes, I can't tell who's speaking. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Councillor Zondervan. Yes, are, Councillor, are you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are you able to see us raising our hands on Zoom? Because I, I was trying to use I, It's not coming. Okay. Raise, uh, he's raising hands on Zoom. I, I wanted to go back to, um, to uh, Council Nolan's reference on page I-26, the public uh, future of public safety task force, because that's actually the only place in the budget where it is mentioned. And my question is simply that uh, it states in the budget book that recommendations will be made, it's anticipated that recommendations will be made in early fiscal year 22. So my question is, does that mean that this alternative to public safety is not funded in this budget um, and, and will not be funded in this budget. I, I guess I can jump in and then we can. Mr. Manager, I could my so. minute police, but Maka, Denise, I don't know, but I certainly, Mark, I'll turn it over to you then. Yeah, if I can. Um, so we have, we're, we're expecting, um, we're working on the draft of the report currently. We're expecting that that draft will be submitted to the task force uh, very shortly uh, and to the um, city manager uh, soon after that. One of the things that uh, has been made clear throughout um, the task force conversations is that we wanted to uh, certainly move quickly uh, as this is an issue that you know people are very concerned about but at the same time it's a complicated and complex issue and we weren't going to we needed to do our due diligence and we weren't going to put something forward just because we felt we had to put something forward um, we wanted to try to do it uh, uh, well um, what has sort of uh, developed is and I, anyone who's been on a task force uh, would notice this or knows this is that sometimes you come out in a different place than where you started or what where you thought you were going to end up uh, it's looking more and more like uh, there will be recommendations around continuing this process in a more broad way to include more, uh, to get more feedback from the community, to look at this closer and further define what an actual alternative program might look like. Um, one thing that the manager has made clear from the start, and I think we all know this, uh, given Cambridge's strong fiscal position, um, unlike other communities where if, a, if an item does not get a program or an item does not get a line item in the budget, it doesn't get funded for that fiscal year. That is not the case with Cambridge. We fund things constantly that are not in the budget. Uh, we get allocations all the time uh, around that around that issue. So as uh, Councillor Simmons and I have said to the task force and to others, if there is not a specific line item uh, in the budget, that does not mean uh, that that moving this forward will not be funded in the budget and that money might come forward with a uh, through an allocation uh, request to the council. So, um, you know, right now there's, you know, there is not a line item in the budget that is partially due to, you know, there was a tight time frame to get this done. The more and more we talked about it, uh, the more and more we dug into, um, you know, what this issue really, uh, you know, how you would operationalize such a department. It's not as simple as just throwing money at it and saying we're going to create it. It's really complicated to do it right. Um, it's looking more and more like, you know, we will be coming forward with recommendations and there'll be a further allocation that will come. Um, but it may come through a, a uh, you know, a, a budget request and not necessarily the line item in the budget. So um, it's moving. Um, those recommendations will be coming shortly. Um, but just because you don't see it in the budget doesn't mean it's not going to be funded, just like a million other things that we do. Uh, if I can follow up, if that's okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, I really want to thank 
Council Simmons and Council McGovern for their leadership. I want to thank the task force. I mean, we said early on that we really didn't want to let the budget process dictate the outcome of this. It's just too important. And even though the budget submitted, I think, May 3rd, and really to have an opportunity to have the budget get the work done, you really had a deadline of, of really early April, and it just wasn't realistic. So we will uh, continue to work. Uh, we're making great progress. I want to thank the police commissioner as well, and we'll get those recommendations, and then we will be coming back to the council, as we thought was going to be the case, to be perfectly honest, when we started. And Mr. Chair, if I may. Councillor Simmons. I thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to concur first in support of my co-chair of this committee. Um, what was implied in what he, a lot of what he said was that this has been a, a extremely powerful experience. We have had a number of meetings. We have subcommittee meetings. People have been meeting on their own. And it became evident very early on that this work was very important in, fee, in folks in their desire to do a good job, respectfully asked, you know, do we have to make this deadline? And we went to the city manager, city manager says, don't let the budget drive your decision or your decision process, which is really important because what we didn't want to do was try to make a budget deadline and not have a fully formed response and then have to go back and, and revisit it. So with the support of the city manager and the members of the advisory, we've slowed the tempo, and because of that, we've gotten so much more information. What we, you know, without going into the report that you're going to get very soon, we've had a number of people in from what I call community experts that have donated their time, I mean hours of their time, to inform the committee so it could come back with a rich and coherent and competently done response. So we're pleased to say that we're getting to the end of the, what I want to call the first phase. My colleague says maybe we'll stay um, together with the um, uh, support of the city manager to, to look at other issues that kind of were not within our direct purview, but certainly came up so that we can continue that work, but we do see ourselves coming to coming back with a recommendation to you fairly soon. And again, what the city manager was saying, because there may be budget implications, do not rush this work, do it right, take your time, do it. We will make sure that whatever budget um, recommendations that come out of this, he would meet those budget recommendations. And of course, this would come forward to the council um, as well because of anything that has uh, a budget impact over a certain amount of money has to come before the council. So uh, again, uh, it's been an ex instructive process. I'm glad to have participated in it. Uh, we thank the people that come um, every week every week. So this is not like the average committee. They, these folks come every week. Uh, I, I do thank them for the, taking the time to do this important work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield the floor. Uh, one second, please. So we have a number of counselors who wish to speak, but let me just summarize. So what I understand is that the work is ongoing in the committee. There will be a report soon, and the manager is definitely aware of it and open to it, and um, a financial resolution or a budgetary res resolution of an effort will be done, I assume, before summer session begins, because once we get in the summer, we don't meet very often. Is, is that an accurate summary? Mr. Chair, I would say that's an accurate summary, and we're going to certainly work to get to that particular okay. deadline. Mr. Manager? Yes, I mean, I've attended almost all the meetings as Great. well, and I, you know, I think we're on the same page, and there will be no delay. Once we get the recommendations, we will uh, address them and come back to the council, with them. but we want to make sure that we had every, uh, enough time to come up with the recommendations. Thank that's you. So I have three counselors waiting with your... With, I have three councillors waiting with their hands up, and it would be unfair. You will get your opportunity. I, I still have the floor, Mr. Chair. I asked the question. The question was answered. Have, continue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. 
Um, I, I appreciate all the work that's gone into it, um, but but I am disappointed that we don't have a proposal before us, and I am aware that uh, the community has been working really hard on sourcing its own proposal um, that that is ready to be funded. So um, I, I just don't understand how we can be here uh, one year later and not have a fundable proposal before us that we can present to the community so that we don't continue to uh, respond to, to crises in, in the wrong in the wrong way. And, and other communities across the country have implemented these types of programs and have informed us on how they did it and how we can do it here in Cambridge. So uh, I don't understand why, why this is so delayed and, and I hope that we can uh, rapidly move this forward. Uh, to to meet our promises to the community. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair. And that's yeah. one, one second, Council McGovern. And that's why I said that we're looking forward to this uh, happening as early as June and before the summer session. Council McGovern, I know you want to comment. I would just point out that yes, we are. This was talked about a year ago. Um, the task force did not come together until February. I'm sorry, Councilor Zonderman doesn't understand that this takes a lot of time. No. Uh, and it's complicated. It's not a cut and paste kind of issue. Uh, we are meeting every week to uh, address this issue and are working hard on it. I understand there's frustration around concerns around transparency and who was involved in this process and who wasn't. Um, I think we stay very clearly that this is not, you know, you know, if we rush something forward, we'd be accused of rushing something forward, right? And And I guess, you know, some folks just wanna, you know, aren't happy but um you know we're going to do this right we, we we have uh we're going to make a a recommendation there's been a ton of work that has gone into this um and it's complicated and it start again it started in february and we've met virtually every week some weeks there have been some weeks off for various reasons um but it's complicated it's not you don't just file a policy order and magically things happen so um you know, I, I will defend the work of this task force and the volunteers that have given their time and their effort. Um, you know, it, it, it's uh, sure it would be great if we had something in front of us right now, but that's not the case. And it's not for a lack of effort and to suggest otherwise is really insulting. Uh, okay, a point of order. Uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, I Mr. just want a point add. of order. Can, can uh, you please, please remind my colleagues not to. You will get an opportunity. I don't want this to be a. We're talking about a budget. There's been an alternative Mr. offered. Mr. Please Mr. let me finish. The as please as let McGovern, as the chair. Please right. let me finish. You will get your opportunity. You both spoke. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I'm not trying to debate. I'm asking. Mr. You Chair, if this is going to continue, I'm going to ask for a recess because this is inappropriate. Maybe we can need to talk to our colleague offline just to have the try to follow the, the basic rules of courtesy. So if this is going to continue, I'm going to ask for a recess. Mr. Chair, if I may. Just, Mr. Clerk. Just through you to the body, the, the chair has the uh, authority to grant the floor to individual counselors. So if uh, one section of conversation is ended, the chair has the right to uh, assign the floor to another member to continue the, the discussion. Thank you. So I share the interests as deeply as you do. I see this conflict in timing there isn't two efforts going on, and people have asked for it to be resolved in June. I promise you I will vote for a, a positive program going in the right direction. And um, they have asked for an extension to June. That's how I look at it. I have other counselors who wish to speak. They might say exactly what you're saying, but it is their turn. We are still in the we excuse me. We are still on the first topic, and I want we. I have to manage this through the whole day. You will get your opportunity to talk, but I don't want a repetition of the same comments. I realize there is a conflict here in opinion. I'm. I am. I, I, 
and I am going to go on and to the next speaker. Please, the point of order, Mr. Chair. I am going on to the next speaker to, to get other people's opinions in. You can come back after that, but at that point, then we're going to move on. That is my job, is to move on. I know we're going to have disagreements on this issue. I get it. I support it. But I also want it to be a fair process all around. An independent study, as much as I believe it's correct, has to also be followed by the managers look at it. And this is what is happening. As much as we don't want it that way, that is the process. So Councillor Sabrina Wheeler is next, followed by Councillor Nolan and Vice Mayor Mallon. Thanks, Mr. Chair, um, thanks to the chairs and to staff for- uh, Could you speak a little louder, Councillor? We're not hearing you. Yeah, how's this? Can you hear me a little better? Yes, we can. Thank you to the, to the chairs uh, and to staff for putting together um, the FY22 budget and these hearings. Um, I had two questions on this uh, budget overview section that hopefully will be uh, pretty brief. Um, the first is after some of the, the large public conversations around the budget last year, we had talked about holding meetings earlier than uh, May this year to sort of give the councillors, give the public more time to, to weigh in, you know, starting in either the winter or even the fall. Uh, I know Chair Carlone has heard me ask about this uh, a few times. Um, that didn't end up happening. Um, and I know there's been a lot going on with the pandemic, but I, I um, did just want to give, you know, both staff and the chairs a chance to explain for councillors and members of the public why, you know, we didn't end up holding finance committee meetings earlier this year. Uh, I'll leave that up to the chairs, but I'm not sure what type of finance committee meetings you're talking about. Uh, the budget uh, process is based on a calendar. In the middle of COVID, we were able to accomplish that calendar. Uh, so we have followed the format uh, to a T. I can't tell you how proud I am of city employees and the budget to get us to this point, but I know we haven't missed a meeting that I'm aware of. So if there was uh, an additional uh, format that I'm missing, I'll leave that up uh, to you. Mr. Manager, in all fairness, this is on uh, the co-chairs, not, not you per se. Uh, I did say that we would have meetings. And quite frankly, we've had so many meetings in this council in the last year that even during COVID that um, we didn't get to it. It's simple as that. Do I think we should have policy meetings in finance? Absolutely. But it didn't happen. And, and we, uh, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler and I did communicate, I think it was about two months ago, and I said, you're right. Um, and, you know, I don't know what more to say. It's been a tough year, that's all I can say. And, um, we have so many committee meetings that we have a hard time getting ordinance meetings in. Um, that, that is my only response. Thanks, uh, Mr. That's but fair, and I, think but I agree with you is my, my point, and I see it as I've, it's a disappointment for me. Please, Councillor. Thanks, Mr. Shire. That's, uh, and figured that would be a response, and I know it's, it's been a really challenging year for, for everyone. Um, uh, and you know the, the city and beyond. Um, yeah, just sort of putting on record that for the FY23 budget, I uh, would love to see us start the conversation uh, earlier. Um, I think you know today's an example where going through I think more than 20 different departments and, and today's meeting, it's just not a lot of time to really go uh, in depth. Um, I've been talking with city councilors in other cities about the budget process there. Um, Boston is a really uh, interesting example where the, the city council and administration uh, do meetings like this, but they also do public working sessions where they're they're really getting into the details of line items. Uh, budgets are going up and down according to uh, you know the wills of the elected body. Um, this, I'm really grateful for these hearings, but once we get to this point, the budget is not really changing that much. We're asking questions, but things are are pretty set, at least they were last year. And I think we can do uh, a lot more to sort of make the, the process transparent for the public and also just make it more, more engaging for elected officials, for members of the public to actually have a say in our, uh, what's you know a financial document, but ultimately a moral document uh, as folks often say as well. Um, my second I, I, question- Mr. Hold on, Mr. Chair, I, I have to respond to that. This is a city manager form of government. And as much as the council sometimes fails, it isn't, it is. We have allowed the public to be involved in every process. The budget is based 
on what the residents of this city want. So it is unfair to compare our process to Boston. I would put our process up against any city. I would say the services we provide to the public is as strong as every city. But there is a charter in the way you do budget when there's a city manager and when there's a mayor. And we just cannot change that because the councilor feels like we don't need to follow the format that reflects the city manager. This is over and over again happening with the challenge of the city manager's position and authority. And the simple answer is you either work with the city manager's position or you remove it and go to a different function. But you can't change the government that you have as long as there's a city manager. And this is an ongoing discussion in so many areas that it, it needs to be addressed because it just continues to come up and it is unfair. This is the government of Cambridge. This is the process we have. It is something I am proud of. I think if you look at our resident surveys, they're proud of it. And I think the council should be proud of it. And I'll stop with that. Uh, thank you to the, uh, the chair. Thank you, you know, uh, to the chair for giving me the opportunity to speak. I do appreciate the city manager's comments. Um, I gotta say, I don't appreciate the tone as much. I've tried to be very polite in my tone and provide constructive criticism. And uh, okay, uh, let's uh, focus on the subject. Thanks. I, I just want to address that remark because I'm trying to be very, you know, clear and constructive in my remarks. Um, the second piece um, I just did want to ask about, um, and I think this is a question for for Mr. Kale. Um, and sort of to address the budget as a, as a whole, you know, the city council, the charter is very clear, has to approve the budget. You know, the, the charter is very clear that we have power over that in that area. And that's why it's, you know, appropriate to ask these questions. Um, the second question I had was um, on the levy capacity. And I know the, the tax rate is set um, in the fall that, you know, here we're setting the budget and the, the tax rate will come likely in October. Um, but did just want to ask if we have a sense of, um, you know, what the excess levy capacity is going to be with the, the budget that's before us today. Um, we really won't know that till the summer because the assessors are finalizing the values and we haven't finalized the levy, but the levy is going up $42 million, which is one of the largest increases in levy in the last few years. And so basically, um, I believe our excess levy capacity was uh, $188 million, uh, but I think we'll eat into that. Um, and I think that we're assessing the uh, issue of uh, assessed values that the assessors are working on and what that translates into. I would uh, point out that the reason why, unlike other cities and towns um, that are looking at overrides or looking at budget reductions is our ability to basically bring you a budget that frankly can increase 8.95% in the levy and not have to worry about it because we do have excess levy capacity. And I think that is one of the things that outside rating agencies look at, look at is our flexibility and our ability to meet challenges. And, and I think that we faced it this past two years and we'll continue to face it in future years where our ability to have strong reserves and, and flexibility allows us to have a budget that you have before you that increases money to priority areas of the city council. So I would say that we'll know exactly what our uh, excess levy capacity will be um, as we get closer to September I suspect it will not be as large as it is now, to be honest. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, and just briefly, um, you know, I know this is a point I've brought up before when we talk about the budget and the tax rate, but um, most cities and towns in Massachusetts, uh, many, if, if not most, I should say, um, do use their full levy capacity. Um, and I, I know there are trade-offs between the, the levy um, and the tax rate. Um, but just do want to bring up that we have among the lowest tax rate um, of cities in Massachusetts. And so when, when we aren't using that full levy, to, levy capacity, we're leaving money on the table, you know, the bulk of which would come from the large corporations in Cambridge. Um, and that's money that, you know, especially in a pandemic, could go to affordable housing, it could go to supporting local restaurants, it could go to municipal broadband. Um, and so, you know, I won't belabor this point too much, but did just want uh, to, to bring up that point while we're on the budget overview. Um, so I'll go back, thank you. Uh, and so if I could, Mr. Chair, and again, I appreciate what you said, Council on uh, 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 Sabrina Wheeler, as, as working in two communities that were at the prop two and a half limit, is a, it is a very miserable existence. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. And I will respectfully jump in and say any one of those cities who are at the levy limit would change the situation with Cambridge in about two seconds. Uh, they're not at the levy limit because they chose to go to taxes. They're at the levy limit because they have no choice. And the flexibility we have is something that is something we should be proud of. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Sabrino Wheeler. We're going on to Councillor Nolan, followed by the Vice Mayor. 
Thank you. I won't belabor the point too much, but I certainly agree as someone who's lived in Cambridge, we have a phenomenal spending, we have phenomenal rates, and yet we also still have people, even with relatively low tax rates, with our high valuations. Okay, questions, questions. Okay. Um, I do want to, since it was raised, I, I hope it's okay if I do just say a little bit about the part of the budget overview on the, which we had some discussion earlier on in the um, police review task force, because it was, um, incredibly wonderful to see the council order from June of 2020, suggesting that we look into this. I found that the Commissioner Bard's um, response on in September of last year of the incredible array of programs that the police department has taken on was quite um, extensive and thoughtful and it certainly dovetailed with what I had learned on school committee about the number of programs we have for diversion. And the task force work has been ongoing. I will say that I, as we move forward and there may be a budget allocation, I found it incredibly exciting to see the collaborative process that co has come out of a community process where literally hundreds and hundreds of people in the community have responded to a survey. This group has developed a proposal that is to me exactly what we need to do to build on, to take that as a start. Point of order, okay, Mr. Just, we shouldn't have to recreate something. So I, I'm really hoping that we counselor, can get what, to that point. You can bring that up in the police discussion um, that's not you, in this area. Thank you. Vice Mayor Mallon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to have a clarifying question around the police task force recommend, when we will see those recommendations come forward. Uh, this was one of my questions, but I'll pull it forward earlier from the police budget. It just says in the budget book under key initiatives that the it is anticipated the recommendations will be made in early fiscal year 22. So is that summer? I guess I was reading that as uh, early 22, which I was, was thinking it was in January, but is that, are we saying the summer? Yes, I mean, we're hoping to have it as, as soon as possible, but yeah, that, that was not meant to be January. No, absolutely. It's fiscal year. Sorry if there was confusion with that. Mr. Okay. Chair, just so I can answer the, just, so we are looking at the, we're, we're drafting the final report right now. Um, we're meeting again on, uh, the plan is to meet this coming Tuesday, where the entire task force will take a look at that report. We'll get input from task force members to make sure it captures what the task force is thinking. There's a lot. It's hard to get consensus, and there's people have different opinions, and that's going to be reflected um, in the task force because it is complicated. So the hope, I think, is that we will have a report, you know, to the city manager by the end of this month. Um, and then it's with the manager at that point. Thank you, Councillor, for clarifying that. Um, Mr. Chair, can I? I, I, just, I just wanted to add one thing, uh, Vice Mayor. Councillor McGovern, you're going to have quite a Tuesday because we have a finance meeting before your uh, committee meets. Um, so good luck with that. Vice Mayor. Thank you. I just wanted to say, you know, just doing the math on the number of months that people have been meeting. Um, you know, three and a half months for a task force this important is that's a really short time frame. So I appreciate everybody getting this together and doing it in four, <laughs> four months. I know just doing the arts task force took us nine months and um, that was not as big of a community conversation. So I look forward to those recommendations and thank you for the clarification on when those will be coming forward. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councillor Toomey is next. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, are we still under the... Uh Budget overview? Believe it or not, yes, we are, Councillor. My question, hopefully, will pertain to that. Um, and I don't know if the, uh, Mr. Keel or Mr. Deep Squall can answer this question at this point, but there's been discussion about um, the spending. And, you know, it's just a reference right now to large corporations paying a large share of that. Has there been a um, has the city received requests for tax abatements from these large corporations? And with, you know, I get the bank and tradesmen, I think everybody here does every week. And the prices of property are just incredible. The people are paying five, 10, $15 million for homes in the city of Cambridge. So with the increase, increase assessments is gonna be a huge increase, I assume, in, the, in taxes for individuals. And I just wanna remind my colleagues that you know, there's still many, many working class families and senior citizens that are struggling to stay in Cambridge. So 
you know, it, it's great with, with we're able to spend all this money, but it, you know, we, it's not going up, going up the backyard and taking the money off the tree. So I, I just want to raise that caution. So, and the tax bills will be coming out just before November. And it will be interesting. I've seen it happen here before in one neighborhood that was a revolt uh, with their tax bill. So has to the manager, has we seen any requests from corporations, large corporations for tax abasements over the past years, and from, I guess from individual homeowners? And what we anticipate the tax rate could be is a significant jump. Thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off and then I'll turn it over to Gail. Uh, we'll let the city assessor, but Council Toomey, that's a tremendous point because even under the COVID guidelines, we're going to see that assessments of one, two, and three family houses will probably be up. Condos will remain level. So there will be a dramatic increase in property taxes at the current projected levy. Uh, we're going to try to do what we can to reduce them a little, but we have been able to control taxes. This is a difficult year. Uh, with all the COVID revenue losses that we're facing. We're trying to be fair to our business community. We're trying to be there to our residential taxpayers. Uh, abatements are developed not on your assessment. They're developed on whether your bill goes up or down. And in Cambridge, we have had less than one half of 1% of our residential population property owner apply for abatements. That's not because their assessments are low. It's because we have kept their taxes down. If and when the assessments go up and their tax bills go up, we will see a major change in that as we did many years ago and we stated we would not let that happen again. So fortunately, uh, most of the councilors here have not had to sit through a very, very difficult taxpayer year because we have made that a priority in the city while providing an incredible amount of services. But as someone who did sit through it for a year, it is very difficult situation for our residents, our taxpayers, and for the department. So we will continue to try to avoid that. On the commercial side, Gil can give you more information. But as bills go up, the reality is abatements will go up as well. Gail? Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I think that the city manager is absolutely right, especially on the residential side. What people are filing on is the impact of what the increase is, not necessarily the value. Um, I think that we are still reviewing our values now. Um, so I'm not able to say what we think will happen um, for the bills, but you know, looking at what's happening in the market, looking at the uh, interest in single family homes as people want to have their own space due to COVID. Um, it's certainly concerning for us, the idea that you could uh, have the residential values going up and the commercial values going down, specifically issues around the hotels, around office space, around retail space that are all being affected by COVID. Um, so that's certainly concerning for us. Um, thankfully, the um, abatement rates have been fairly stable. Um, fiscal 20, we had 485 abatements. Fiscal 21, we had 421. Um, I think that the flexibility that the city has in having free cash and being able to use that at tax rate time is certainly something that helps protect the homeowners and ensures that we don't have these large bills coming up and having the excess levy capacity also gives us the ability to not be forced to shift value onto the residential class, which is what some of these towns have to do when they're at the levy limit. And it's our flexibility that really helps ensure the stability of what the homeowners are paying in Cambridge. And, and I would just add that while we are continually outreaching to our commercial and hotel motel um, uh, property owners, remember what happened last fall. Uh, the values are, were as of 1120 before COVID hit. So basically, this current tax season will be reflective of the impact on folks. Uh, commercial property um, with regard to uh, vacancies in their property or uh, uh, occupancy levels very low for hotel motels. So we will see abatements being filed because the impact of the COVID will be reflected in the FY22 values, which is at 21. And as Gail said, and I think as the manager said, um, the worst thing that can happen is our residential uh, component 
of, of the bill um, gets shifted to more residential. So basically any increases in levy aren't necessarily split that two third, one third, but get shifted more to the commercial side, which happened several years ago, which had a, uh, a chilling effect on folks' tax bills. And I think um, uh, we should just keep that in mind. We've got a couple of things going on. The impact of COVID on the values for FY22 and the, the shift between who gets assessed um, the value of the uh, property taxes and making sure that that doesn't necessarily shift entirely to the residential homeowners. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, please go ahead. No, I, I appreciate the response from, from everybody. And again, I'm just throwing caution to the wind here. Uh, I've been through it when it happened. Uh, there was what we called, we never thought we'd see in Cambridge, uh, you know, the, a really a tax payer, uh, not a revolt, but certainly one ward certainly was impacted tremendously. And actually the city council in that ward actually lost that election because of that. So I'm just throwing that out there that, you know, with these abatements coming in from these corporations and they're entitled to it and the shift more to the residential, it's going to be impacting a lot of people, especially the working class and seniors in the city. So again, just throwing caution to the wind here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Toomey. So people who wish to speak the first round have spoken. Now we go back to Councillor Zondervan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do um, want to make a brief comment and, and I would like to request um, that you recognize my earlier point of order because we, we are trying to have a very difficult conversation uh, of as one of my colleagues said, the, the budget is a moral document. And last time I checked, we still do live in a democracy. And, and as the elected representatives of the people, it is our job to ask difficult questions. And I appreciate that, you know, sometimes those questions might be uh, perceived negatively or, or you know, not, not be received um, in, in a positive light. But but it, we're just doing our job, and, and I recognize that uh, everyone else is as well. So it's really important that we maintain decorum and that we do not take these questions personally and that we do not um, you know, speak to each other uh, inappropriately during these, these conversations. And, and that happened earlier, and, and I would appreciate a recognition of that fact and, and a reminder to follow our, our council rules of decorum and to speak through the chair and, and to not uh, assume intent or, or assume that what people do or do not understand um, and, and to not speak to each other uh, by name uh, during, during these debates. Um, I would also like to uh, ask for clarification because several times while we've been uh, asking questions about the future of, of public safety, it's been said that that should uh, be discussed during the police budget, but, but in fact, it is not referenced in the police budget. So I, I don't understand um, why that would be the case. Number one, the chair's job is to be fair to everyone and to move the conversation along. We've been on this subject over an hour I felt you made your points. I felt other people made their points while, uh, while different counselors were waiting online. I knew we were coming back to you. Um, I still feel I did what was proper. And um, if you wish to discuss it further, we can do it offline. I meant no disrespect. I think you know, everyone knows me that I, I try to respect everybody in their tent. And as far as goals, you know that I share many of the goals on this subject that you brought up. Um, but my job today is to get through the budget, to get a vote on each pulled section, and um, that's my job. And I have to be somewhat neutral on the subject. However, as I said, you know I support doing the right thing vis-a-vis um, -vis the committee that's in process and the black response. Um, 
and uh, I will stop there and I, I appreciate your comments, but I have to do what I feel is right. And uh, we just have a lot to get through today and that's my goal is to do that in a fair way. We've certainly talked about the topic a lot tonight, this morning, just like we talked about it a lot in committee. The manager has responded, the committee has responded, and people on opposite viewpoints have responded. And that's my response. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess um, perhaps you're not um, understanding my question. I, I'm, I'm not questioning that I should have been recognized to express any further opinions. I'm, I'm asking to be recognized for a point of order because the rules were broken and colleagues spoke in, in a way that is not in accordance with the rules. And I'm simply asking that that be addressed so that we can have a productive meeting. And I'm also asking whether this particular topic is or is not in order during the police budget discussion oh, because it's not actually referenced there. Thank you. My comments are for the full council, not just you. And you have a point there that they just spoke up. But I'm, I'm not going to continue this conversation, council. I know you're both good people and you're both right. Please. I just wanted to offer my apology to Councillor Zondervan if he felt offended. Can I get that on tape? So you both can share it. I, I, I agree there was tension there. It's unnecessary and I wish I had stepped in sooner. And, and I, 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 Mr. Chair, I'll just say, you know, but there's, we do have to be, there are ways that, um, yes, I should not have mentioned Councillor Zondervan's ways, but there are ways that people are throwing insults without mentioning names and we should all be a little more careful. I, I agree, and I failed there. That's on me. Okay, I believe we've come to a point uh, where we're going to vote on moving the budget overview uh, forward. Mr. Mr. Clerk. On that motion, Councillor, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councillor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councillor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councillor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Present. Present, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Present. Present, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councillor Carlone. Yes. Yes, motion passes, seven in favor, two present. Thank you all. The next section that's been pulled is executive. Let's see if there's a more refined no, just executive and the first person, maybe the only person that is Vice Mayor Mallon. Uh, Vice Mayor, um, could you please tell us your preferred question first? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the city manager and his team. I was excited to see a line item for translation services as uh, $45,000 in the fiscal year 22 budget. This is something I think we all have seen over the past year has been incredibly critical as we um, push out information on the public health crisis to our residents. But it is something that I think we've been talking about for a long time that has uh, been really needed across the entire city and the school department. There are a couple of other um, line items for translation services that I've noticed in the budget. And I'm wondering um, how these different departments are gonna be working together to um, create synergy around those different line items. So there's uh, $45,000 in the executive office. There's 130,000, I think, in the school department, 10,000 in the mayor's office, and $75,000 in the family po policy council budget under an initiative that the mayor and myself and many, many people in the city are working on a language justice initiative um, that hopefully will be coming forward with budget recommendations. So my question is how, um, is the executive office, the mayor's office, the family policy council and the schools all working together um, on some kind of uh, synergized uh, translation services for our residents? So I guess I'll turn it over to Lee, but before I start, I do wanna say thank you because in this budget, that was an important feature that we wanted to make sure we added to the budgets and individually we talked to all those departments to make sure what the appropriate department was. But the fact that 
often is the case. There is money in many departments. You do need to make sure that someone's kind of organizing it so we get the best value. So I appreciate the question. I'm going to turn it over to Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm excited to see translation really, you know, really moving up in our our budgets. The money in the executive really is to handle what we've learned over the past year of what we expect for our normal translation services that we are now um, doing. And as you know, since March, we've been putting out information in eight different languages, and we're going to continue. And at the same time, it's really great that the Family Policy Council has been. Uh, engaged in the language justice work. Uh, Bridget Martin, who's the communications manager at DHSP, has really been serving as um, our liaison to sort of stay connected. And um, we're going to take our lead from the recommendations that come out of um, the Family Policy Council. I think we do need to have a citywide approach of how this works. Um, they seem to be really uniquely positioned um, to be able to put out those recommendations, but it makes no sense for the public information office office to be doing something completely different um, than DHSP that's doing something different than the schools. We probably will have unique and some differences at times, but having a unified strategy is going to be key. So we'll be taking the lead from um, what comes out of the um, Family Policy Council. Madam, Madam Vice Mayor, any follow up comments on that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say thank you to Lee and to the city manager um, for really thinking about this in a holistic way. I think you're you're right, like we need a citywide strategy. We've needed one for a long time. And I just wanted to make sure everybody was working together and that that's, that funding will um, help what we end up coming up with from the Family Policy Council with the many, many focus groups and conversations we've had with other municipalities. There's been a tremendous amount of work in the language justice area. And I'm excited to see almost a quarter of a million dollars really being uh, allocated to this effort this fiscal year. So. Um, Thank you for that clarification, and I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mayor Siddiqui, followed by Co-Chair Simmons. Mayor Siddiqui. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to just uh, echo this. Like we had a lot of conversations with uh, the city manager's office uh, around this and the importance, and um, I think we all recognize that uh, the recommendations from the Policy Council, which I chair, and uh, which, as you know, uh, we have Vice Mayor Mallon as a as a member, and um, Member Wilson from the School Committee, and, and then many, many, many others. Um, David Kills on that too. So we're all trying to work together um, to have some really robust, um, you know, resources on this. So I think we, you know, in my office, have seen such a need throughout this year, um, and I think uh, you know we're the, probably the first mayor's office to really say, you know, moving from now on, we have to um, have translation. And I think we'll see this happening throughout our departments once we have the recommendations from the Policy Council, which will be available uh, very soon. So stay tuned on that. Thank you. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, I also want to thank the mayor. She has been a real leader in making sure that departments have this in their budget and has had many, many conversations with me. So I want to thank her for her leadership in this matter as well. Thank you. Any follow-up, Mayor? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, Co-Chair Simmons, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Just briefly, um, it, because there was mention of it, but I don't see that it's in the budget. And I think Mr. Kale spoke to it, and so I would like to see maybe going forward, even if it's something that's out of the budget cycle, which is how do we make this more comprehensive? I'm excited to see the, uh, this language justice effort going forward, and um, I would agree that it is it will only be as effective as its coordination. And so I, you know, just would like to urge the city manager as he is going through what may very well be a supplemental budget, uh, which is something we always do, uh, what is normal to us, um, that we might consider what a comprehensive language engagement policy might look like and how that would be funded so that we have parity across the community. Because you, um, as everyone says, a lot of people are doing it very well uh, but it's not consistent across the uh, city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You the floor. Thank you. All good comments. Please. 
Did someone wish to add their comments? Mr. Manager? No, I think we will uh, move forward and take a look at Great. this. It's clearly a priority and something. If Thank you. Do, whatever the money will be available. I don't see any other hands raised on this issue. So there are no more questions, I believe. Mr. Chair? Yes, please, Vice Mayor, go ahead. I had another question please. for the Executive Office. Go ahead. Um, my question is around the position for the Deputy Manager. Mm. There is still a line item for the Deputy Manager position and a salary listed uh, for $250,000. The Deputy Manager um, retired in January. And I haven't heard anything about replacing that position if it's been online or, or, or noticed. Is there a plan to hire a deputy city manager? And if so, um, what is the expected timeline for that process? Mr. Manager? So like all vacancies, we've put almost every position on a hold. Uh, uh, we are in discussion on whether or not we are moving forward with that position. Uh, I'm not gonna say yes or no yet because we are in discussions on, you know, how we're gonna handle that vacancy. So obviously it's an important position, it's in the budget that way, but how we fill it, when we fill it, to be honest, is still in discussion with me and the personnel director. But as soon as we come up with a plan, I'll make sure the council is well aware of it. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. I think, um, I think this is a really important position, particularly knowing that there will be a change in leadership next July and, um, making sure that we have somebody in that position that is well suited to perhaps, you know, fill in for a few months. I know when, um, when you were hired, Ms. Peterson actually was the acting city manager for several months while the contract negotiation happened. Um, so I would just like to say today that I hope that, um, I hope that we are moving forward with filling that position. I know it's a, probably a difficult conversation to have knowing that there will be a transfer in leadership. Um, but I, I think for this, the health of our city um, and the health of the executive office, it's, I, I would like to say, I think it's a good idea to fill that position and, and pretty quickly, I'd like to see somebody in that role. I know Ms. Peterson did a, a ton of work and um, I know that there's probably a big hole in the office, although I, I think that your, your team has been admirably pulling together and, and making that happen and making it seamless, but I would love to see somebody in that role that was really dynamic that we could, um, bring forward into the next administration and, and make sure that we don't have a, a hole in leadership should something happen or contract negotiations go on a little longer. So um, I guess I'm glad to see it still in the in the budget and that there are conversations still happening and I look forward to any updates from your office. That Those are all my questions. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield the floor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. You raise a great point and I completely concur. So at this point, I'd like to move to accept the executive budget as we just discussed, Mr. Clerk. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councilor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Our next area is the Executive on Domestic Violence Prevention. Vice Mayor Mallon has the first question. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you um, to the City Manager and to Ms. Speakman, um, there, my question is there's a significant increase in the OOM for the fiscal year 22 budget around $70,000. During the pandemic, there were additional dollars allocated for things like funding for hotels and other expenses, like a citywide marketing strategy called You Are Not Alone to make sure that domestic and gender-based violence victims understood that even in a pandemic, um, they didn't have to stay with their abusers. There were other options. I guess I'm just wondering uh, if this additional funding in OOM is to continue some of this critical work or if it's going to be used as we start to recover. I just was wondering if um, Mr. Manager or Ms. Speakman could speak a little bit to what that funding is for. Uh, Liz, do you want to jump in? Sure. You can hear me okay? Yep. 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and I appreciate all the support um, from the city councilors on the work that we're doing on domestic and gender based violence prevention. So um, the additional 70,000 is kind of going to be split up in a few different ways. Um, the city has committed to supporting a new position at Transition House. Um, so part of that position will be funded by the city and they're going to find other funding for the rest of the position. It's going to be called um, director of Equity and Justice, um, and that position is going to really focus on internal and external um, ways that we can better improve our response to survivors of domestic violence who have traditionally been um, marginalized or voices have not been heard as much in the process. Um, so that will include outreach um, to communities that we don't often um, hear from. Um, additionally, we're going to have um, an additional $10,000 that's going to go towards the emergency fund um, at Transition House. So that will provide um, various um, emergency related assistance for survivors of domestic violence. Um, and then we've also contracted with someone to provide a need to partner with us to do a needs assessment on um, how we can better support black and brown survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and so that's going to be a um, extensive process that's starting this month and we'll hopefully wrap up with a report and recommendations in December. Um, and so part of that additional funding is going to go there. Um, we are doing continuing to do outreach. Um, when we first did the quarantined but not alone outreach campaign, when the lockdown first started, um, service providers were seeing a dramatic decrease in calls for service. Um, and since doing that campaign, I'd say late summer, um, they've seen a dramatic increase in calls for service, including many more consultations from providers who are looking for um, advice and um, suggestions on how to support survivors. And so um, I think that campaign was pretty successful and we're very pleased with that and knowing that more people are getting access to the services that they need. So we want to make sure that we're really reaching all members of our community as best we can. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at with that funding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to Ms. Beekman, um, I, I know this has been like a, just a huge, huge explosive issue in the COVID pandemic. And I think your team has done an incredible job responding in each and every moment along the way. It has evolved, as you said, in the spring, there were no calls, which was concerning. And then over the summer and continuing, there's that increasing calls are happening. So it looks like a lot of this funding is, is being used very wisely to fund a position at Transition House to provide that $10,000 worth of emergency funding for things like T passes and cell phones and um, all kinds of manner of things that people need once they're leaving their abusers. So thank you for um, just explaining what that additional uh, funding will be used for. I look forward to the needs assessment coming out uh, around supporting our black and brown domestic and gender-based violence victims, uh, because I think that is a really critical piece of this that um, deserves a real long look. And so just thank you for the work that you did over the over the course of the pandemic. You don't, you don't get to come to city council very often, but I know that you are doing incredible work for some of our most marginalized, some of our most vulnerable, and particularly in this pandemic, um, the, the some of the hardest hit uh, men and women and, and people in our community. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield the floor. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Elizabeth, for what you do. Um, I don't see any other counselors have raised their hand. So I'm going to move that we accept this budget as presented. Mr. Clerk? On ex on accepting the executive domestic violence. Chair, e e yes. Point point of order. Can can the clerk clarify what we're actually voting on? I don't understand what we mean by accepting this budget. It. So it's my understanding that this is on referring this portion of the budget to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. On accepting and referring the executive executive slash domestic violence prevention uh, portion of the budget and referring it to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Council, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes. Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes. Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes. Councilor Simmons. Yes. 
Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councillor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. The next section that we'll be exploring is the executive portion of the housing liaison. And the first person that pulled this is Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Councillor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, really appreciate all of the work um, that the Housing Liaison uh, has done this past year, especially. I know I have reached out about a number of situations during the pandemic uh, with uh, folks trying to do in-person apartment showings during the height of it. Um, uh, I'm glad that there's now another person uh, in that office uh, working alongside it. Um, I wanted to ask, and I know this is something that has brought up before, about doing more, about um, having an office of housing stability in Cambridge. Um, this is something Boston has. Uh, Somerville has an office of housing stability um, with seven different staff members, folks in the office speaking Spanish, Portuguese, Somali. Um, I know we have housing assistance in other places, in uh, the multi-service center. I, I just wanted to, to ask about this more. I know it's something I brought up last year. What what the holdup is or what what's stopping us from moving towards that Office of Housing Stability approach in Cambridge? I think it would be incredibly valuable to, to have it all in one place, to have one place you know called the Office of Housing Stability, um, because I know I've, I've had a number of residents confused about what the multi-service center does, where they can go for services. I just wanted to ask about, about that approach, if it's something we've talked about, thought of, um, what what the reason we haven't moved in that direction is. I, I can start and then I'll turn it over to Mara, but we've had had this discussion. Um, Mara's been really my lead person on this, and I think she can explain it far better than me, but we feel the form that we have with the multi-service center and with the work Mara's office is doing provides a better service, to be very honest, or at least an equal service. Uh, as you said, it's more about a title, and we feel that the service we're providing is strong, and Mara can really talk about why we think that, but I want to say, and I appreciate Council Willow mentioning it, the work that Mara and multi-services have done during this COVID pandemic has been exceptional. A lot of the palms have done exceptional work, but I think in Liz and Mara and multi-service center, they have been leaders, so I'm going to let Mara talk about the specifics that hopefully can answer your question. Mara. Thank you, City Manager. <clears throat> and um, thank you for the, the question, Councillor, and to you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I understand the question, um, but I would offer that the Office of Housing Liaison is that dedicated resource that's embedded in the city structure as, as you formulated the question. Um, in fact, you know, the housing liaison, as you said, the staff support and respond to the city's housing crisis by addressing displacement issues and concerns, working on landlord tenant disputes, and providing housing search and case management, um, and also by engaging in policy review and advocacy efforts. And then also, um, the position serves as a primary point of contact for, for um, complex housing situations, such as large building sales and displacement of fires. And also, uh, and here's where it's, uh, I think, similar is, a, or we have a different model, but similar services that we work very closely uh, with CDD and DHSP and other relevant departments to coordinate initiatives that result in strategic change. So, but for the name differential um, from OHS to OHL, really the focus and activities of each office, Boston, Summerville, and Cambridge are comparable. Each share basically four or focus on four different areas, tenant support, program development, policy review, and advocacy. Um, and I, I'll make this brief, but I just want to go over each of those uh, of the cities. Um, the city of Boston was the first in the region to establish the Office of Housing Stability, as you probably know, and it's a division of the Department of Neighborhood Development. Um, they primarily offer resources and services for tenants facing the housing crisis. Uh, they provide emergency funds, tenant workshops, information, uh, as well as services to local providers. And much of the direct service work beyond information referral that they offer, uh, including the administration and disbursement of city funds, is contracted out to partner agencies. A lot of that work is done through the multi-service center here in Cambridge. 
Uh, the city of Somerville established the ho Office of Housing and Stability in 2018, and that office is housed in the city's uh, Office of Strategic Planning and Development. And as you know, it's staffed by a director, a couple of co-deputy directors, and a number of staff. Um, and the office, again, provides tenant information referrals, workshops, landlord uh, outreach, and policy advancement. And certainly, the director has been instrumental um, in Somerville in organizing local and regional responses to affordable housing uh, legislative initiatives. Um, they also manage vendor contracts for homeless prevention services, including legal services, housing search, and tenant education, and outreach. And again, that's a lot of that is done through DHSP and in particular uh, MSC. So in Cambridge, um, as you know, we started in September of 2019 and we're housed in the executive department. Um, and again, the, the focus and activities are very similar in that we provide direct services and we engage in program and policy development. Um, and I think what's important to note is the additional staff that was hired in December of 2020 uh, to do ongoing intensive case management. Uh, that is field-based intensive case management. And at this time, neither Somerville or Boston had the capacity within the direct staffing. So I think we're all trying to kind of fill the gaps that are relevant in our city. Um, and so to appreciate the fullness of the Cambridge response, I think we really have to look at the work and services that are offered by existing and proposed staff in Cambridge in the three main departments uh, that work on housing, CDD, DHSP, and the Nidal Liaison's office. But similar to the work um, that staff from Somerville and Boston do in their housing stability offices. Um, and in particular, and MSC has been noted, um, you know, Cambridge, even before, before any of the uh, offices of housing stability or the housing liaison was established, Cambridge had the most comprehensive city-funded array of affordable housing programs and services. Neither Boston or Somerville had or have a city multi-service center. And so again, a lot of the, with the offices of housing stability in Boston and Somerville do um, fill that role. So the addition of the housing liaison position added capacity to DHSP and CDD. CDD does a lot of policy work. Um, but I recognize that, you know, because of COVID, much of the focus for Cambridge has been on direct service and just local policy implement implementation. Some of the planned activities, such as launching a citywide outreach and information campaign, which we're embarking on now and hopefully will clarify some of the um, distinction and uh, help residents recognize uh, the, the collaborations that we have within the city. Um, that and, and other programs and, and policy events and were postponed or delayed. Um, but, um, you know, we have contributed to many of the vital city initiatives and will continue to do so. So, I guess in summary, I would say that the three points of contact in Cambridge, CDD, Housing Liaison, DHSP, have a very comprehensive um, and coordinated approach. Uh, it is a decentralized approach. Um, but I believe our model uh, does offer a, a robust, coordinated, and no wrong door approach um, for housing stability services. And we utilize the expertise of each department. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, but I'm happy to talk more if you need me to. Councillor Sabrina Wheeler, do you have a follow up? Thanks. Yeah, just br briefly um, through you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that response. And again, really appreciate all the, the work uh, that the, the Housing Liaison Office and other departments have done. I you know, understand there's a lot of overlap between the, the work Cambridge is currently doing through the different departments and the, that the Office of Housing Stability is doing in, in Somerville or Boston. Um, I do really think a, a dedicated office would help with communication, would help with collaboration, and would also make it a lot easier for residents to have a, a one-stop shop and not have to, you know, figure out who to, who to go to or get referred. Um, you know, we do a, a biannual community survey, as I'm sure staff know, uh, and the biggest issue that always comes up on it is by far and away housing of something the city could be doing better. Um, I'm really glad we have a new person uh, working with the, the housing liaison office that we got. We're able to start earlier in part through the, the police budget reallocation uh, in the, the budget last year. Uh, but the Somerville office has, has seven staff members and we have them in, in one office. And I, I think that you know would really be uh, an improvement. And I, I hope that's a, a direction we can head uh, in Cambridge. So and I'll go ahead and yield back. 
If I may just follow up on that, I, I understand that. I do think if we combine the staffing of MSC and um, the housing liaison office, um, and we are in one office and work very closely together, um, we actually probably outpace uh, what some of the law Boston has. Um, again, I think with the, uh, the launch of the campaign, continued information sharing, um, I think that will help residents. Um, and I do think we're reaching the point where folks know that there is one place to go. But also I think it's important that if they do go to another place, it's it's coordinated and we communicate really closely with, again, CBD um, and MSC. So it's it's a no longer approach, which I think is important. Thank you both. Uh, Mayor, you had your hand up, but it seems to have evaporated. Do you uh, wish to say anything? Yeah, I'm, I just, I got a quick call. Let me, um, oh, okay. hand it up. I'll be back in one minute. Yeah, that's fine. We'll go on to the next comment then. Uh, Council Zondervan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I, I agree with my colleague. I, you know, I, I've done a lot of, um, had a lot of interactions with um, the housing liaison uh, during this pandemic, and and I have certainly uh, appreciated the support uh, that they were able to provide uh, as we were trying to provide direct services and assistance to um, our constituents, and I believe that they are still understaffed and um, I, I look forward to um, the new hire coming on and, and um, being able to you know, increase the capacity of, of the response. But I also worry about um, the end of the, of the moratorium that's coming um, and, and what, what that will do um, to our, our tenants uh, in the city who, who will be scrambling for for housing and and housing services? So, um, you know, and, and we saw some of that during the pandemic, even with the eviction moratorium in place. And and I'm just really concerned about what we will see once that uh, is lifted. So, uh, I'm I'm going to be voting no, not in, in as in any kind of rebuke or um, you know any anything negative about. The, the department or the staff, but simply because I think we should be uh, putting more funds into this uh, office and and really providing even more services to our unhoused uh, and and housing challenged residents because uh, they really need it. Uh, it's it's a real crisis. We spent a lot of time in my office um, supporting constituents directly. Uh, as they're dealing with these challenges. And I think we need to uh, apply more resources to, to support our residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, M Madam Mayor. Are you available? Yes, yes, I'm back. Um, one of the questions I said I, I had was around one of the objective goals, um, which was uh, around the data develop and implement a data tracking system in order to identify and report trends. I'm wondering, um, you know, is that like smart sheet or is it, um, do we need some extra budgetary support for that? Thank you, Madam. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mayor, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, we did put money in the budget for that. Um, it's, uh, we did some research to figure out uh, what would be needed and we found that we might, we will, are going to be tapping into an existing database system that will have minimal cost. So that is in there and it's uh, being worked on to, to get that up and running. Great, thank you. Um, and then the second question was around um, this, I know that in Envision, um, there's a section around policy work related to tenant displacement. Uh, and uh, I know you, the office does case work, there's policy work. Um, and I think, you know, now I'm reading this um, 
the, there's a sentence in here about how the office will monitor staffing needs and capacity um, in order to continue effectively address the ongoing housing crisis in the city. You know, I think um, a policy, uh, you know, there's so, and that, I think I know we utilize interns to look at evic eviction, we utilize interns um, in a variety of ways, but I think just, this is more of a comment, but having an additional staff um, to help with some of the policy work in collaboration with CDD in the future could, I think, could be a benefit. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and that is, the, as you, there is some money in the budget for additional staffing, and I think that's a strong consideration in terms of, you know, data analysis, administrative, and, and uh, research and policy development, so thank you. And yeah, I think, you know, to sum up, uh, you know, I think I want to respond to some of the comments that, that were made. I think, you know, our offices have worked very, very closely and, you know, through and, you know, obviously multi-service center as well. And I think nomenclature, I recognize that for some, they've seen in cities that they have the housing stability there, they have this and we have different names. You know, I think we can have another conversation in the future about if people are unclear, making it clearer or considering, you know, future name changes. But I have to say all the work that this office does the housing liaison office and in conjunction with a multi-service center, um, you know, it is more staff than um, many, than Somerville and um, uh, Boston. And I think the 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 caseload uh, and the, the type of work and the case intensive studies um, is really unique. And I think even, I think maybe last year, even a year before at this point, I was, I think less clear about what multi-service center was doing and, you know, still learning. But now that I've seen it firsthand and have really <laughs> worked very closely with both, both teams, it's very clear to me that um, the, you know, I think there's, um, there's a lot of great work happening. And, um, you know, I think if we can have conversations around what's needed, uh, if there's future um, support needed, I think uh, I look forward to those. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, state, there's a lot of support being given to our legal aid providers, the Novo and some Cambridge and some legal services. I've called, you know, I've made calls of what do you need? You know, the city is ready to help. And they're like, you know, we're, we're doing well, <laughs> you know, we have support. And I think, uh, that's one of my things that I, you know, we want to know what the trends are, where help is needed, and to respond um, adequately. So, you know, I think, um, as I said, happy to have future conversations and work with, you know, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler around the nomenclature and, and so forth and think about ideas. But, um, you know, just wanted to thank you for all that you're doing. And it's a pleasure to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Councillor Nolan is next. Councillor? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank everyone who's gone before and all the work that's gone into this. I, I want to build on something that um, uh, Director or Housing Liaison Penzac said about the fact that we do have an amazing array of programs. We are doing a tremendous amount. It's just scattered around in a few different places, but it brings together um, I, I think a wealth and in a way in a comprehensive approach and that's what we're trying to build. My question is whether, given that this is really a regional issue, I mean, if every town around us was doing what we were doing, we know this would make everybody's job who are working on this much easier in the city. Is there any uh, thought or a, any kind of additional support that we need to bring to bear to ensure that the regional nature of this uh, problem can be um, addressed. I know that obviously we are a city, we can only control what we do within our borders, and yet this is clearly something that other municipalities struggle with. They do not have our resources, they are not able to provide uh, many of these services, and certainly at the state level there really needs to be this addressed. I'm not sure if that's part of the plan, but I certainly support uh, giving uh, your office or uh, through the city manager as we think about this anything that we can do to ensure that the far-reaching nature of this 
issue, which affects all of us far beyond our borders, is something that we don't get totally overwhelmed with, frankly, because of, of who we are and our resources and keeping that in mind that it's quite a challenge. Thank you, Kasla. Um, I can respond briefly. I know that a number of years ago, <clears throat> um, I believe then Mayor um, McGovern is, uh, created a regional focus group or regional task force that worked on this. Um, and I also uh, know that uh, DHSP a few years back uh, created the, um, I'm blanking on the name, but it's the, um, it's a, it was a whole day's effort. It was a French term for, so. A charrette. Uh, charrette, thank you, thank you. Um, so I think that there is opportunity um, for uh, at least the three groups, um, Somerville, Cambridge, and Boston, to get together and, and think about this and, and try to you know, uh, do some thinking on how to kind of resurrect some of those efforts that were made and uh, talk about it in the original approach. Um, I know a couple of us have had you know, some conversations a while back and then COVID happened. So I think it's a good reminder uh, that we can certainly take a stab at doing that again. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I know you and the mayor's office and the former mayor's office really took this on and addressed it and has created so many um, ability, uh, it has increased the ability of the city through the city manager's allocation to this to address this. So if there's anything, again, further you need for us to do to try to enhance that work, um, I, I certainly stand ready to support you in that. And I'm very grateful. I'm sure you're another of the 24 seven or 48, 14 work club this past year. Thank you. I yield, Sheriff. Thank you both. I see no other hands up. Mr. Chair, can I just jump in? Yes, I please. Sure oh, always, Mr. Manager. So I, just, I want to let every council have an opportunity. I think this is an important discussion. I mean, housing is clearly the number one priority of the city council in this administration. And the fact that I'm proud of the fact that on the your guidance, actually, Councilor Calone, we have put a consolidated budget together when it comes to homeless and housing. We are spending almost $50 million, and that's something we're very proud of. Also, when there is need of staff, we've tried to address those concerns. I don't think any area has had more staff added to it over the last two or three years as I, since I've been city manager as housing between multi-service, community development, and the executive office. So obviously we'll continue to look at this. It's an important service we'll provide, but we really have tried to address the concerns of the council and the residents with adding additional money. And I think even Monday night, we put up a letter saying that we've put an additional $500,000 in other areas. So it is a priority. Appreciate the council's time on this, and we will continue to provide funds absolutely when we feel it's necessary. Thank you, Mr. Manager. I'd like to um, move to forward the department's budget to the full council with a favorable recommendation, Mr. Clerk. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councillor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councillor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councillor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. No. No, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councillor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, eight in favor, one against. Thank you. Chair, Chair Carlone, would you like to uh, move to close public comment at this time? Yes, I think that's a good idea. On closing public comment, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councillor McGovern. Uh, excuse me, yes. Yes, Councillor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councillor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councillor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you. So the next section is in the executive portion under public information office. And two councillors have submitted questions. And we'll begin with the first, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I had pulled information technology. Um. I see, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. 
I see the question is in the wrong location. So, um, Vice Mayor, although you did bring up some of this, would you like to talk about your submitted question? Um, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think my that question was now number on a number of different uh, departments, so they can be crossed off. My question was answered uh, okay. the first go around in executive. I, you, I, I thought so, but I wanted to make sure that you felt it was addressed. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, just through you, the the, the um, administration did go through the questions, and I believe they they put it in this section. They may believe that it's appropriate to respond to I'm referring to Councilor Sabrina Wheeler's question. So I don't know if you want to ask the administration if this is the right place to respond or if it should wait for IT. Okay. Um, I, th I think we'll wait for IT. I don't have a preference, whatever the council. Yeah, I know I think we will, but I notice uh, the mayor might have a comment or it's an old hands up. Mayor? Um, Mr. Chair, this is, um I'm sorry, this is public information office. I think I had a quick question and uh, on this, which was, um, I think the expenses and ordinary expenditures and just clarifying what what that was going to in the PIO office. I'm sorry if I missed it somewhere, but. <laughs> That's okay, Lee. Sure, um, Mr. Chair, through you, um, Madam Mayor, there, there are two increases in this year's uh, PIO budget. The first is 45,000 for the translation services, and the other is uh, 216,000 for us to really be able to expand our capacity to be able to support departments in UX, UI, animation, graphics. If you've noticed over the past um, four months or, show, or so, we've completely redone our COVID page, our vaccine page, and our communications are now really starting to be aligned. Uh, and the conversation you just had with um, the housing liaison is a perfect example of how we will use money um, to, to support departments. You know, as she has special needs, how can we have it so departments can come to us and say, I have these communications needs, whether it's related to web, whether it's related to print, whether it's related to outreach for us to be able to say, yes, we can help you and have the capacity to do so, uh, which we don't currently have under our um, our existing budget. Okay, okay, so it's, okay, that makes sense. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Council is Zondervan, I thought I saw your hand up and now it's not there. Did you wish to add something? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just um, trying to understand if we were trying to address the municipal broadband question, um, whether it should be in this department or... Uh, we will do that under IT. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we will get to it. Um, so I see no other hands up. I uh, propose we move to forward the department's budgets. Hello? Yes, Councillor Nolan. Sorry, I did. That's to... fine. Go ahead. Um, I appreciate all the work that this office has done. And if I understood it correctly, the $200,000 is not under salaries and wages, so we're not increasing the staff in the department, but we are increasing external use of. Uh, so our plan funds. to be as nimble as through you, Mr. Chair, is to use outside services to help us with this. There's so many specialized um, areas, whether it's graphic design, whether it's animation, whether it's website design, that really will be better served to have outside folks helping us so we can be nimble so we can act quickly and we can have the right resources um, when we need them. Thank you through you, Chair Carlone, to the city. I look forward to that. And I, I hope that as we move forward, we do just like in any other area, look to see if there's cities that have managed to figure this out and have a really robust program um, because cities have the same goal. They're all trying to communicate to people and I certainly know that there are many cities that have kind of conquered this. And, and I hope that we're doing a, as we move forward, a best practice round of, if I go to a city website, I'll try to remember to send it on to you and say, wow, this city really does this well, so that we can move forward with, um, in this increasing communication age, people are turning more and more. And we know that from our, our city 
um, uh, survey that sends out to residents that they are turning more and more, and especially the pandemic. So it's critically important that we up our game in terms of having our website be very, very user friendly. And I will reiterate and, and I'm glad that we're doing what we can for translation. There's also um, folks that uh, I did log on to a couple of sites recently where they just an automatic translation. You know, you just push a button and even if it's Google Translate, it's better than nothing. And I wouldn't expect us to translate our entire site, but we should definitely be looking into that in addition to the ways that we're thinking of bringing on translation services. Thank you. I once, oh, uh, Councilor McGovern. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, real quick, um, but Councilor Nolan reminded me, I, I sort of bring this up um, every year. Um, you know, the in terms of being user friendly, and you know, there are some folks who are more comfortable um, being online and, and using the web pages. Um, the city departments, all their web pages are different. The format is different. Where you go to, there's some similarities, but there's a lot of things that are different. You know, where you go to click on different information is in different places. And I just think as much as we can kind of get that stuff unified. I think it's it, it eliminates a lot of that confusion. I mean, I even get confused. I'm like, wait a minute, on CDD, I got to go here for this, but on DPW, it looks like this. And, you know, so, I mean, I know we want we want departments to be individualized in some respect and, and, and support that, but there is some benefit to consistency. So that's something I'd like you to, you know, take a look at. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that's a good suggestion, even if it's just the main page is organized, so it's under standable from one department to another. Um, good comments. There are no other hands up, so uh, I propose to move to forward the department's budget section to the full council with a favorable recommendation. On that motion, on that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Yes. Was that a yes, Councillor Zondervan? Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councillor Carlone. Yes. Yes, motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, the next uh, department is the fire department, uh, pulled by the vice mayor and um, Madam Vice Mayor, it's your call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to the city manager and the uh, police chief, or sorry, the fire chief. I'm just pulling up my questions here. Um, I think I can speak for all of us. We're very excited to see that the fire department cadet program is in the budget for $700,000 um, and that that will be moving forward this year. I think as a big proponent of this plan and uh, idea uh, modeled after the police department cadet program, the idea is to create an, a vehicle for greater diversity on the fire department, both uh, in ethnicity and in gender. So I just wanted to ask some questions um, around how that will be achieved uh, through this program, what kind of levers will be in place? So. I know I sent my questions in advance, but I'll, I'll mention them again here. What is the estimated number of fire cadets uh, that we're expecting per, per year? How will diversity and equity metrics be established? Who will be deciding on the criteria and goals for such equity metrics? And who will be considered diverse and or equitable? And lastly, how will the fire department be working with the diversity, equity, and inclusion office to create metrics and criteria for this program, I think, the, re the reasons behind kind of asking these questions is, you know, it would be a shame if we had the first fire cadet program and it looked very um, similar to, you know, what we're seeing when we see new recruits in terms of gender and ethnicity. So just really kind of digging in a little bit on this, the $700,000, it's a, a lot of money, it's an exciting program, but how are we going to be ensuring equity uh, and inclusion and diversity within the cadet program? So I'll, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to turn it over to the chief and uh, the personnel director. But I, as I think everybody knows, one of the first priorities I had when I became city manager was to bring back the police cadet program for the exact same reason. And, and the commission of Bod's leadership, it's been a tremendous success. So 
even though the fight is a little different, uh, we will follow obviously what we've done with the police in terms of absolutely making sure the cadet program reflects the city of Cambridge. And I think these are great questions. These are discussions we're in, it's still in the early stages, but I agree with you. Uh, we cannot not have a cadet program that reflects the city population and the people we serve. So I'm gonna let Sheila and the chief talk about that, but we are on the exact same page. I wanna assure you on that one. Chief or Sheila, I don't know who wants to go next. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. DePasquale. Uh, through the chair, uh, to you, Councilman Mallon, uh, we are very excited about the uh, potential for this program as well. Um, we will be working closely with both the personnel department and the Office of Equity and Inclusion to design the metrics and, and establish benchmarks. Um, we have some significant challenges ahead of us with respect to the actual design of the program for a whole host of reasons. Um, fire service is, is different than the police department, um, obviously. Um, there is no uh, similar program in this area that we're aware of. Uh, I know a special act of the legislature was passed for Boston. They're, they're, they're grappling with the, with the same issues of how to design the program and set it up. Um, we have done a little bit of looking, uh, actually quite a bit of looking uh, across the nation for similar programs. Uh, got some ideas from some places, uh, particularly out west and, and in the southwest. Uh, I would estimate that that in the first iteration of the program, we'd probably only see four to six candidates maybe. And, and as it progresses, I would estimate that we'd have probably no more than 10 at a time. Um, you know, the goal is, as as you have stated, and, and as the manager has stated, the goal is to uh, make significant improvements with respect to the diversity of the department. Um, you know, we we have some ideas on a curriculum uh, to, to maybe a potential partnering with community colleges for, for classes in fire protection and safety technology and so forth. Uh, EMS training is obviously another component that we're uh, giving some serious consideration to. Um, but, you know, I, as I said, um, I think we're up to the challenge. We look forward to uh, to seeing what comes back to us from the legislature and, and uh, getting things moving. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I didn't know if um, Ms. Katie Rawson wanted to add anything. Um, thank you, um, through uh, Councilor Mallon, through the chair. Um, you know, we're equally excited about this program. It really is um, something that um, all of us have wanted to do. And we've been very pleased that the fire union has been so supportive of the program as well. Um, we, you know, the key to this in terms of diversity is going to be the recruitment. Um, and so, you know, the fire department is doing a really good job now of laying the groundwork in terms of, you know, the youth academies and really trying to get out into the high schools more and more to get generate excitement about a career in fire service and the diversity of jobs that are available in the fire service, particularly um, through EMT programs and paramedic programs. So we will be, you know, working with the fire department to focus it, on those areas moving forward to, to ensure that the, the first class is a diverse class. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, when are we expecting the first class um, to be up and running? Um, my understanding is, you know, it's still with the legislature. So it's sort of unclear when um, it would pass. Um, so it probably is not, um, definitely not in, in this fiscal year. I don't know, Mr. Manager, if you have more information on that. Yeah, so it's, it, it was a delay in getting it to the legislature. We found that out. We've resolved that. Uh, but I assure you, we've got a priority at the legislation, and we will, as soon as it's available, we will start. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to give you more information on when a starting date is. But I want to assure you that this is a top priority in terms of getting it started. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I, I think Ms. Katie Rawson said it probably wouldn't be in fiscal year 22, given the, um, the legislature. So we're it's in the budget just in case there is an opportunity for it to be in fiscal year 22. 
I think she meant 21 is what I'm guessing when she said the current year. But I do. It, we think it'll be in 22. So I, I think there was a little confusion. I think she meant before June 30th. Obviously, we won't be yeah. ready, but we will be ready next year as long as we don't have a issue with the legislature, which I don't believe we will. Okay, yeah, great. That's correct. Celebrating fiscal year 21. Yeah. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, I think you know we have a real opportunity here. I'm really excited about this. I'm excited that the fire department and the and the union and the personnel department are working hand in hand with the diversity, equity, and inclusion office because I think we have an opportunity to be really groundbreaking here. And I'm I'm looking forward to you know the Cambridge Fire Department really coming forward and, and being groundbreaking and being a leader in this area and taking this on. So um, I look forward to having more updates on that. And just um, I guess that that was those were all of my questions. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Mr. Manager, Mr. Mr. Fire Chief. Thanks. I yield thank you. Back. Thank you all for your work in this area. So I don't see, oh, I do see your name. Councillor Nolan, please, you have the floor. Thank you, I'm totally excited about this program and I also hope that we move forward in all city departments to address the issue of diversity in hiring that I look forward to us uh, looking into civil service. We're waiting for a report that um, we expected last summer and I really look forward to moving us into an era where we can uh, hire the best of all across the board, all uh, folks um, in every department without um, having to uh, to develop separate programs that end up being sometimes problematic. And yet I'm completely thrilled about this program and look forward to moving forward as soon as we can on a range of other initiatives in this. Thank you. Thank you. So we have completed a discussion. I propose that we move to forward the department's budget section to the full council with a favorable recommendation. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councilor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The next section that we will discuss is inspectional services. And uh, the Vice Mayor has uh, two questions, and I believe that's all that's been submitted. Vice Mayor, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to the city manager and um, the inspectional services team. My question was around the number of current FTEs that are showing as vacant. There's 29, I think, current FTEs in the, the department, and six of them are showing uh, as open positions. Some of them are, are pretty high-level positions, a sanitary housing inspector, a building inspector, and a manager of building inspections. I wanna say that over the last 15 months, inspectional services has been one of the busiest departments in the city, um, you know, going above and beyond for our retailers, our restaurants, and you know, making sure that everyone was complying with new uh, policies and procedures that seemed to change each and every day, while at the same time, we still had a tremendous amount of building happening. Um, it, six out of 29 positions is about 20% of the whole uh, department is currently considered vacant. I'm just curious as to those positions, were some of those positions holdover positions from fiscal 21 that weren't filled? Are these ongoing positions that we, we need to be filled uh, now? I'm just, I'm concerned about this department that I think does a tremendous amount of work with not a lot of people. Um, and just um, curious about those six vacant positions and where we are in that process of filling them. Sure. So I can jump in and I'll turn it over to Ranjit and David Kale, who's actually been a point person for me. Uh, some of these six have been filled. Uh, we've also used some temporary help. These positions have never been on a freeze. We've attempted to fill them. We've had some difficulty filling them, but it's been a priority. But I think David can give you an update on each one along with Ranjit. But we've really tried to work with inspection because you're right, the workload's been incredible. And we've just had some difficulty filling these as quickly as we would have wanted. Uh, but I, we have been able to bring in some additional staff that is not in a permanent position for temporary help. But the goal is to fill these. So I know David's been working closely with Ranjit. So I don't know if you want to give us an update, David or Ranjit, on each one of the positions on the list. But I think it's important to address them. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll run through the list and um, Ranjit can uh, fill in. So the admin assistant position, that position was posted. It's now closed and interviews will be scheduled. Um, the access analyst was listed as vacant, but as it turned out, the incumbent uh, had decided to stay. So it really isn't a vacancy. However, we are uh, in discussions about trying to do a transition plan and continuity so that um, if and when he decides to go, that we have a plan in place to make it a seamless transition. The sanitary housing inspector position, that individual started Monday. So that position is filled. Uh, the building inspector position is filled. So that's done. Uh, the records coordinator um, is uh, will be posted this week. That, that was uh, a vacancy that was created when the incumbent uh, took the code and uh, compliance position for STRs in the department. And the manager of building inspections, uh, that is posted, has a sixth street closing date, and interviews will start thereafter. Uh, frankly, we uh, inspection decided to wait holding, posting that till they got some of their inspector positions filled. Um, and just in addition to that, uh, the department did have some other vacancies that it did uh, fill, which is a zoning specialist that has been filled. Um, electrical inspector, a position that uh, was vacant that has been filled during the fiscal year, additional building inspector positions, and as I mentioned, the, um, the uh, code compliance officer position was vacant that has been filled. So, um, so yeah, we have not held the positions as the positions come vacant. We have a process and we try to uh, get them filled as quickly. And I think in addition to these positions, there have been some other that have been filled in the interim uh, during the fiscal year. So they've been working on uh, filling these positions as quickly as possible. And Ranjit, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, I think in addition to what Mr. Kale said, uh, we have a part-time building inspector as well as a part-time housing inspector. And also we have a temporary uh, person who is dealing with the records room. So, Vice uh, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for that explanation. Now I can rest a little easier knowing the Inspectional Services Department <laughs> is fully, almost fully staffed. I just want to really a shout out to this team, this really small team that has been doing a tremendous amount of additional work over the last 15 months. I just want you to know that it, it hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, and I, you know, when I saw those vacancies, I just got a little nervous that this team um, didn't have enough help, but I'm glad to know that we are, are all set, um, but really a huge shout out to ISD for um, all of your work over the last 15 months. It has not been easy, but it is fully recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield the floor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Councilor Nolan, your hand is up. Do you have a comment or question? Yes, thank you, Chair Carlone, and thank you, Vice Mayor Mallon, for saying it, uh, setting the tone for this is an incredibly difficult time. It's been challenging. Uh, we do continue to hear from people that it's very difficult to schedule inspections. And I know that's because with the safety issues, people are in the office or not in the office. And it, the more that we can do to ensure full staffing so that uh, people can be out there would be uh, wonderful. I have a question, which is we had talked last fall um, and I know um, that it was uh, ISD had said the leadership in uh, the city had said this would be something that would be relatively easy to do, which is to have online ability to look at building permit applications. And I was just wondering the status of that, whether that was a, a any additional budget was required, which I was told at the time when we first asked about this, that it would be no problem since building applications are actually filed online. It's just a matter of getting them online. So I'm just wondering about the status of that because it's now been a few months and we haven't had an update. So I will leave it over to David, who's been the point. We were hoping to send the council uh, an update on that about two or three weeks ago. There is some concerns that have come up and I have David in the law office and going, Ranja can go over those concerns, but that we have encountered some difficulties in determining whether or not this is the right thing to do. So we can address them or send them up in the council order next week or so. But if you're ready to talk about them, David, we can do that now. I think we, ISD and the law and um, IT have talked about this. Um, I think one of the challenges is, is that a building permit, building permit application is a ongoing document that gets amended based upon information that is required and needed. And um, we're not quite sure that posting building permit applications online and then having to make sure that the amendments and the like are implemented uh, gives a true picture. So at this point we're investigating, but I think the initial 
take is that something that we probably do not want to do, which is post the ongoing applications online. Once a building permit is approved, it is available in its entirety uh, with regard to the completion of the process. But um, basically the moving parts of an application that is being reviewed potentially by several departments or individuals that gets amended uh, is viewed to be not a um, process where basically it, it, it leads to a benefit uh, just because of the maintenance and the upkeep that's required. So that's where we are right now. We continue to explore that, but that's the initial blush about the request. And I don't know if Nancy or Ranjit have anything they want to add. I know it's been the three of them that have been working closely on this. Um, I, ISD has been working with the law department on this and we are concerned about changes to applications that happen all the time. So we don't want to add to something that is will be changed frequently. They change them because of zoning or other reasons. So that's the question we have and working with the law department on this at the time. And thank you, Rajat. Nancy, anything? Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Manager, and through you to the chair, through the chair. Um, one of the issues is that we have a fairly short turnaround time once somebody submits a building application to do the review <coughs> that often is done by a number of different city departments. And there are potential implications if that period comes and goes without the permit application having been acted upon. So uh, if, if it were a live application while it's being changed and while we're trying to keep track of the various changes, it just adds that much more potential for confusion or possibly dropping the ball. So I, I think that's the main reason, along with what David and, and Ranjit said about it. Councillor? Yes, thank you. I was just waiting. I think I was just waiting to recognize that. I, I, I kind of understand, but I look forward to some memo. This was, um, we had talked about this. It was said it was easy to do. I believe these are public records so that if I walk into ISD, I would be able to see this application. So if, if that's true and it's already a public record, I, I understand there are changes made. The council was asked to make the request formal, which we did November 2nd of 2020. So I, I, it, it's unfortunate that it's gone this long, I guess. I was, I'm just surprised to hear there's even any question, but I believe the city manager said maybe they would write something up and explain. Again, I understand there may be changes. However, there had been a sense that this was a positive, transparent effort to, you know, put everything that was public available to the public. So I guess if the city manager and the and ISD and the city solicitor will will explain this, then we can look at it. But I'm just I'm I'm surprised that it that it hasn't moved forward and wouldn't understand why if it's a public document that it wouldn't be available with the understanding that it should be marked that this is a draft or maybe changed. And Councillor, that's one of the reasons why it's not come up yet because it was our understanding that we were going to be able to do this and it was not going to be difficult. But after reaching the point, I wanted to make sure before we said we weren't doing it that we had dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's. So that's why we've held this up a little to make absolutely sure. So I appreciate the question, but we right now are facing some roadblocks, but we will be getting something up to the council shortly. But I understand your concern. Thank you. Um, glad I asked so I got the update. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other question, and, and this is, I, I, I know that there's a, a challenge sometimes. We, we have so many things going on. There's, it's the multidisciplinary nature of so many different areas of the city sometimes make it challenging to coordinate. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's, um, with the increase in staffing in ISD, if this will also mean that there will be an ability to better coordinate with some of the other departments of the city, for instance, um, make sure that whatever ISD understands that the license commission is dealing with, because sometimes there can be delays in ensuring that all those departments are working together. And because sometimes they're working on a similar project and they have to dovetail and, and have the various points of information be shared. So I'm just curious as to whether that's also something that is, is in the works with as fully staffed up that that will be able to be uh, a more a coordinated response sometimes, whether it's online or, um, or just in person. I, I'll let Ranjit or David talk in, but I can tell you, I feel right now that the license, the inspection, all the traffic, the public work are truly working as a team better than we ever have to get these things done quickly. Matt Nelson's also been a point for a lot of this, as has David. So 
We understand that, but I think we've done a much better job getting everybody on the same time to move these things quickly, be on the same page. And I think we're in a lot better place than we were maybe when we, these concerns came up. But I don't know if Ranjit wants to add anything to that. If they, I mean, we have been working with all the departments regarding building permits or other restaurants or any other permits. Uh, we coordinate almost daily with all these departments because um, building permits have to go through all the departments, DPW, fire, historical, maybe license, sometimes CDD, water department. So all these departments are coordinated uh, for building permits, for housing and, uh, and the restaurant, we coordinate the licensing, DPW, and traffic sometimes before we use and we coordinate and contact the applicant through these departments too. Should I? Th thank you, I appreciate that. I, I will say I, I continue to hear some concerns that um, the efforts are much appreciated and yet they're not always um, felt perhaps. So I think what would be good, and I will certainly communicate and forward to Vice Mayor Mallon as chair of the Economic Development Committee, some of the concerns I've heard, and, and she may be able to take that to the Small Business Advisory Task Force so that we can continue again. After this challenging year, it's been it's been difficult. And I have heard city manager that there there is an appreciation that there's been more um, attempts to try to do that. And yet I'm continuing to hear some concerns. So I just want us to make sure we're in a position to to do everything we can to be coordinated and as quickly and as responsive as we can. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, there are no other hands up at this moment. So I move to forward the department's budget section to the full council with a favorable recommendation. On that motion, Vice Mayor. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mellon. Yes. Yes, Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councilor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, we will now discuss the law department budget. Uh, Councilor Simmons has pushed it, uh, pulled it, excuse me, with a question. Councilor Simmons, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Councilor Carlone and Mr. Chair. Regarding the solicitor's budget, what is the monetary amount of 5% of the solicitor's operating budget? What does that mean? Because that was bandied about in a council order that was earlier put forward. And I'm curious to know if, and if this money were spent on obtaining outside legal counsel for the city council as called for in the recent council order, what would that look like? Um, so basically, what is 5% of the city solicitor's budget? And um, what does, does this mean by way of services to the city council? Because I know it, that what the order said, I'm just not sure is the interpretation from the uh, solicitor's office. So through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. DeFasquale or, and or Solicitor Galoa. Mr. Manager. I'll be happy to start and then I'll turn it over to Nancy. So 5% of the total budget counting salaries is $184,000. Uh, what I would suggest if we go this way, it would be to define a number based on what we really feel the need will be. And if it's more than that, then we should provide more than that. If it's less than that, we should provide less than that. So if, if we're gonna go this route, I think we should just discuss what we feel the amount is gonna be needed. And then we would come up with a number that would feel comfortable as we have in the past. And as has been stated earlier, whether it's in the budget or not, if it's a priority and we feel we need to find the funds, we will. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to go over some of the details. But, you know, the money, I think, on this 5% is really not the issue. So I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Uh, thank you, Mr. DePasquale. Ms. Kloa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, what I wanted to do was to um, refer to the order that was passed, and, and not so much in terms of the monetary amount, but with respect to the authority issues that were raised um, I, I, I know that people, ra councillors raised questions about um, the charter issue and whether this is in fact a charter violation. Um, I wanted to uh, advise you that we've gone back and researched these issues further, as well as talking with a number of municipalities, including all of the municipalities that were mentioned by council in the meeting that we had. 
about the opinion that I had submitted, um, as well as other municipalities. I just wanted to remind the council that in, under Massachusetts law, the, the way a, a municipal government is set up is that there's a legislative branch and an executive branch, and that there some of the confusion that may have arisen, which I know the council knows, but some of the confusion that may have arisen in, in the prior discussion was what form of government the particular municipality has. So in, in the plan E charter, the chief executive officer is the city manager, who is also the contracting authority. Um, and uh, also under the municipal code and charter, the city solicitor is both appointed by the city manager, but also serves as the legal counsel to all departments, boards, commissions, as well as the city council. With respect to the, uh, the, I believe that we had mentioned in our prior opinion that in Newton, or maybe I didn't mention that, I apologize. In the city of Newton, this issue was raised and uh, it's a slightly different charter, but the city, um, the mayor, excuse me, it's a strong mayor form of government, um, had a similar request from the city council there and informed the council that there would not be separate legal counsel provided uh, because that would be a violation of the charter. Um, the councilors um, brought up um, uh, both Boston, which um, as I previously said, there was a lawsuit uh, that went actually to the appeals court where the court confirmed that this would be a charter violation and that that authority rests with the mayor. Um, in Waltham, uh, the city solicitor had given the city council that it was the mayor, not the city solicitor, excuse me, city council that had the authority to hire council. Same thing was true in Somerville where we have confirmed that the city solicitor there gave a report to the city council that it was the mayor who had the authority to hire council, not the city council. Um, Newburyport was brought up as an example of a city with separate council. And we were informed by the city solicitor in Newburyport that while the city council at one time had wanted separate council, the, the solicitor gave a legal opinion that that would violate the municipal charter and the council there did not hire their own council. They do hire outside council in that town to serve as municipal council, but it is um, under the direction of the mayor, not the city council. Uh, with respect to Methuen, which was raised as an example, that's uh, a city where the city council appoints the city solicitor, um, but the city council itself does not have separate legal counsel. So they have used outside counsel to work on complex matters like collective bargaining, but it is not an appointment that would have been made by um, the mayor in that instance. Um, so I wanted to confirm that we have carefully looked at the questions that were raised and uh, all of the information that we have reviewed um, is consistent with our original legal opinion. And uh, so I wanted to confirm that to the council and hope that that assuaged the council with respect to uh, the concerns that they had raised. This is in fact, not something that's within the council's authority under the charter. It would be a charter violation to um, dictate that. However, uh, since we do want to be responsive to the city council and provide the best legal services available. Uh, we would hope that the council would rely on this office as um, designed and to particularly with the getting back up to being fully staffed, we would provide the services um, in a more efficient and responsive manner. But we also wanted to say that uh, we, we would be uh, willing to work with a, a, an ask, um, a modified version of what the council order was in that if a majority of the city council votes to request that the city solicitor seek outside legal council assistance on a particular um, opinion or legislative drafting issue, we would then enter into an agreement with outside council and as always in contracts for legal services, the outside counsel would report to the city solicitor and the legal advice would come back through the city solicitor to the and through the city manager on the manager's agenda to the council. 
So I wanted to uh, make that point in response to the council order. And of course, I'm available for any questions. And whatever the financial ramifications are, we would forward that to the council for their vote. So I think it, it certainly addresses the concern of whether or not we can get to these items quickly. I think both myself and the city solicitor understand that concern and wanted to try to address it in the best way possible to make sure the council understands. So we appreciate your concern about making sure these orders get turned around quickly. And if it means outside council, that we would be quickly able to do that. However, it would go through the city solicitor and myself. Thank you. I, I have four councilors with their hands raised. Mr. Chu. Uh, Co-Chair Co Simmons, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to say that was a, that information is certainly helpful. I, I mean, I un, whereas I understand my colleagues' desire, uh, I want to make sure that we're following not only the, the, the letter, but the spirit of the law. I'm sure it's no one's intention not to flagrantly break any municipal law, code, or, or edict. So th this is helpful information. I'll look forward to hearing a more fleshed out uh, report from the city manager. But I just want to, I, I, it said X percent of the city's solicitor's budget. But I didn't know what that was. And I don't think the council knew. So now we have an idea of what that is. And we also have the, to share with that is the strong um, advisory from uh, the city solicitor about what um, the way it may this order may be may be written does not conform to the letter and the spirit of the law. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield the floor. And thank you, uh, Co-Chair Simmons, because your question allowed the solicitor to clarify uh, the office's position as well. So we have four counselors um, with their hands up. I'll list all of them in the order. Councilor Nolan, Councilor Zondervan, Vice Mayor Mallon, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. And the, and the mayor. So uh, Councilor Nolan, you're first, although your hand has disappeared. Did you wish to speak on this? No, it, I think it had been up from before. Oh, it's you're an honest. I'll, I'll, I'll yield to the others, and then if, if, if what I wanted to say isn't said, I'll come You're an honest person. You could have gotten a double there. Uh, so, Councillor Zondervan is first. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I would like to yield as well. Wow. Two in a row. That's great. Uh, Vice Mayor Mallon, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am going to take the floor. Thanks to my colleagues for yielding. Um, I just want to make sure I understand the city solicitor's proposed modified version of um, the suggestion around having outside legal research. So if I understand it correctly, a counselor could bring forward or a group of counselors could bring forward a request to the full city council to request a legal opinion or a drafting of perhaps zoning or an ordinance, if there's a majority of the city council that votes for it, then the city solicitor would engage outside council to do that work. And then it would come back into the city solicitor's office and then report back to the full city council through a city manager's agenda item. I just wanna make sure that I understand that that's the process and not that we would vote to move it forward and then the city solicitor would come back and tell us how much it would cost and then we would vote it again. I just wanna make sure I understand the process that has been outlined here. I, I can turn it over to Nancy, but I, there, there is outside counsel in the law office budget. So I think we would have some balances in there. So my intent would not to be to come back every time to have the council to vote on an appropriation. However, this budget, if this budget needed more money, just in general for all outside council, rather than just tying it to what the city council is, at some point we would come back for a recommendation that says, do the things we're not doing, we'd like additional money. But no, I would not want to hold it up to sort of go, we'd come back for another vote. And we would try to move, but I'll leave it that to Nancy. Um, if I may, through you, Mr. Chair, um, thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, yes, we certainly wouldn't want to take that extra step. That would be unnecessary. And as the manager said, we do have um, outside counsel budgeted in our uh, 
budget already. I would just like to uh, point out that to the extent that the council is concerned about um, the not the, the service legal services that are being provided not being as responsive or as efficient or timely. Um, I, I did want to point out to the council for your information that a lot of these issues do require a lot of research that includes looking at operational impacts and issues that relate to other departments work. And so the benefit of having the legal research as well as drafting handled in-house is that often we are working with multiple departments when we get the research assignment or the legislation to be drafted. Um, and we are also able to use our expertise as municipal lawyers who've looked at a broad range of issues over many, many years to make sure that we're giving the work product to the council that's most responsive, most up-to-date. It also often involves looking at similar issues around the country or around the state, um, often checking with state agencies about various issues that may arise. So we do very thorough work. I, I, I did want to confirm with, the, with what the vice mayor had said that what, what we're proposing is that the a counselor or more than one counselor would submit a proposed order if the order is passed by majority vote at a public meeting to request a particular legal opinion or legislative services that would then be forwarded to this office and we would work with um, retaining outside counsel to provide the services and report back to the council. I did want to offer, however, that I think that that may often end up taking more time than if we got right on it, particularly if it involves issues that we already have some familiarity with and to the extent that it involves checking in with other departments, if it's a council order that involves multiple parts, not just legal drafting or research, but other operational aspects of um, working with the traffic department or the Department of Inspectional Services or zoning implications. These are all things that we're working on regularly um, in this office. And I, I think that in many instances, the work would be more responsive, more on point, more efficient and faster if it were done within the law department. So I am still very hopeful that this will not need to be used very often because I do believe that we can work harder to both um, get back to the council more timely and, and reassure the council that we are um, able to do this work in a way that the council can feel good about. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Ms. Gloa, um, you know, I think we're having a couple parallel conversations here at the same time. Um, I guess I'm intrigued by this modified version. However, I think there would have to be some work done up front by counselors who put in a motion for, uh, you know, a majority vote by the council to to say I've I've spoken with the law department. This is uh, this is the route that we've decided to go because there isn't capacity at the law department, or this isn't something they don't they feel like they're specialized in. I just want to say that I think that there would have to be some preliminary work around capacity uh, to go this route, so that it doesn't feel like um, we're being asked to vote on the floor for something that no one's ever had a conversation with the law department about. So I'm gonna I'm gonna yield the floor to my colleagues because I see that there's a lot of questions. But thank you for clarifying um, this modified version and and the route it would take through the council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And I wanted to say I agree with you that preparatory conversation uh, is critical in in your evaluation of what you want to do and knowing what the next step is for the solicitor. So I I concur. Um, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler is next, followed by the mayor. Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, as always, I you know appreciate the solicitor's work and opinion and the, the work of the law department <clears throat> in general. You know, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like this proposal is an improvement you know, over the, the status quo, as was the sort of the, the previous version that was presented at the council meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, I think Vice Mayor Mallon sort of made the same points. It would be helpful to, to see something in writing and, and to talk about it um, some more because I'm, I'm still a little unclear about some of the details. Um, you know, I, 
the broad uh, picture is that I you know, continue to, to disagree that the, the city council couldn't request this under the charter. Um, I don't believe it's a, a charter question, but a question of how the legislative authority of the city council is defined under state law. And that's how we've seen city councils in uh, a variety of different cities with different charters uh, hire, have a budget for their own outside legal research. Um, and so I don't see anything that would preclude us. Uh, and it would be great to have an outside legal counsel to give us, us an opinion on this. I think it sort of it really illustrates uh, the need for it. Um, uh, so I'd still prefer to move forward with the city council having its own budget for outside legal research. Um, I think it's our authority uh, to approve or not approve the budget and, and to you know, request it in there as a result. Um, uh, I also understand though that I'm, I'm one vote of nine on this. Um, I'm happy to, to talk more about this. Um, but you know, as, as the vice mayor, I'm sure others will say this, this is the first time hearing of it today. So um, I'm gonna need some more time. Again, I, I just wanna state that we are not opposing giving outside council help. We're just saying it should come through the city solicitor. Uh, it can't be directed to the city council. So hopefully we've come up with a compromise. I understand your concern, but it's pretty clear cut that we think that would be a violation of the charter. And we think this is a solution that hopefully could get us to a compromise place. So that's why we wanted to bring that up today, but we can send something up on the agenda as well, if that's what the council would like to see as well. Thank you both. Uh, the next speaker is the mayor followed by Councillor Nolan and Councillor Zondervan. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, quick question. I know that uh, solicitor, you mentioned uh, conferring with the various city departments, uh, solicitor departments in some of the cities. And I, I think I, based on a conversation I had with the city manager as well, um, it's my recollection that there was, I think there was an outside opinion given on this. Um, and if that is the case, you know, could the council have that just in writing? Um, whenever you do respond to the council, I think that would be helpful. And then, as has been mentioned, that the the proposal that's that you've come up with um, uh, would be helpful for the council to get. Along with, you know, the memo had some good suggestions around staffing and so forth. So I think uh, having that all in one place uh, as a responding to the waiting report would just be helpful uh, because I think some of the um, those you know points uh, that were brought up um, you know we should be implementing because often it does come to um, you know it's more kind of understanding you know of okay I know we have this there was an order put in and let's now timeline it and we know the law department's working on it but there's just, there's the communication hurdles that occur. And I think we can, we need to work through those uh, to move the work forward. So that's all I have, but it would be helpful to get, um, if that you did get an outside opinion on this question, it would be helpful to have that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That adds uh, some more detail to our discussion. Uh, Mr. Clerk has corrected me. He said Councillor Zondervan is actually before Councillor Nolan. Um, so Councillor Zondervan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, through you. Uh, thanks to the city manager and solicitor for the response. Um, I, I continue to agree with my colleague. I, I think this is a, an improvement and I, and I do appreciate the, the compromise approach, um, but it still, I think, doesn't fully address the, the underlying question because if, if it's legal for us to get pro bono opinions on, on matters as individual counselors, then I don't understand why it would not be legal for us to get opinions and that we pay for. And I think having a, a majority vote uh, approach can certainly be helpful in, in some cases, um, although I'm not sure how that's truly different from what we do now because we currently request a legal opinion through a majority vote. Um, so I, I guess 
we would explicitly say that we wanted an outside opinion in, if we wanted one, um, but I'm not even sure how we would make that determination. So I'm a little bit confused about that, but but I guess we'll we'll have other opportunities to discuss that. Um, but I I remain of the opinion that just as you know the the manager has authorized the budget for uh, the council office and and we have an executive assistant and uh, receptionist through that budget. I don't see why we couldn't have um, some outside legal counsel uh, through a similar arrangement. But I, I look forward to um, you know implementing this and. Uh, We'll see how, how it works out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nolan, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chair Carl Carlone and all my colleagues for uh, addressing many of the questions. I, uh, For me, I, I think it would be helpful to see the full one in writing. There had been a memo that included a, an attention to the idea of responsiveness to the council. And, and I can say as someone who has sometimes reached out and I definitely appreciate um, getting responses from the, the city solicitor. And there's been a couple times when a question has been raised is, should I ask that question if I haven't had a majority of the council? So for me, this is partly about getting and ensuring that we have uh, an understanding of, if I have a question and I'm thinking, for instance, of putting forward something that raises a legal question, can I have the law department help me understand various things about it instead of having to put a motion on the council agenda to ask for some help. So that seems still a little murky to me and a little confusing, honestly, um, that um, the role of the city solicitor's office in helping us as we think through some of our own um, proposals that we are working on, if that makes sense. And, and I'm hoping that will be clarified in a write-up around this, but that is one of the areas that has been, I think sometimes challenging from my side to know whether it's okay for me to ask and also from the city side, does it make sense for them to respond? I'm just one counselor. It, it hasn't come from the whole council. So I think that's this area that sometimes is challenging. And if there was a clear, here's a legal researcher, or anyone on the council can just ask them questions. That's the kind of thing that I think might help uh, all of us be in communication about this, if that makes sense. I see the city manager nodding his head that that might be I mean, I think this area. That we can talk about, I think the there is different interpretations, but I think the bottom line is we're here to help the city council get to where they want to go. And I think we can make sure that that continues to happen. But I understand your question and we can clarify it. Right. And 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 I understand that if I ask a question, sometimes it, depending on how long it would take for the city solicitor's office to, to not be sure if they should be, it, that makes sense to everyone. But the other question I had sometimes in the responsiveness, am I right in reading the budget that there are three vacant positions for assistant city solicitors in the office right now, which is what I saw in some of the budget backup? Nancy, do you wanna give a status of where we are with your positions? Because that would certainly explain a challenge in terms of workload. Sure, we have had um, a vacancy of, of one assistant city solicitor that has now been filled. We had a vacancy of our first assistant city solicitor that position has now been filled. So we're in the process of um, trying to do the inter trying to get through the interviewing process to fill the new assistant city solicitor vacancy that was created when we uh, promoted someone to the first assistant city solicitor, as well as the other assistant city solicitor position that was not actually a vacancy, but was approved it in a delayed way because of COVID. So those two positions are in the process of being filled. And in this year's budget, there's also an additional position. And we've also been inundated with uh, public records requests. So there's also a, a position for that. So we do believe that with this additional staffing and getting up to our full staffing, um, addressing those vacancies, the two of which, as I said, have now been filled, that that would give us much greater bandwidth to make sure that we're addressing all the needs of our office promptly. Great, thank you. Um, that explains it, because when I did review that, it seemed you know that there had been those three full-time uh, positions vacant. The first assistant city solicitor is listed as someone, maybe that's not the current person, but that was the budget backup from, from recently. And what I'm hearing is that once fully staffed, then that, and that's in process and very much on, on track to be fully staffed soon. Um, the other, 
question I want to address is in this um, area, there are obviously sometimes when there will be a somewhat different interpretation. Otherwise, we wouldn't have courts of law. There would just be, well, there's a law and that's it. And nobody would ever go to court because everyone sees it exactly the same way. This isn't about shopping around necessarily for second opinion. It's about understanding the full flavor of um, interpretations of various law when sometimes it's a little bit gray. So I, I do think this is a really positive step forward to both between the earlier memo about ensuring that we will clarify how it is that we can get some of the, the research help that, that will make our jobs easier to do and also understanding as we move forward this uh, idea of when it makes sense to have outside counsel. So I appreciate the work that's been done on this and I yield. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nolan. Uh, there are no other hands up and I think we've had a good discussion and had some further clarification, but we all know there'll be more work done in this area. So. Unless there are other comments, I will um, propose that uh, I move to forward the department's budget section to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Mr. Clerk? On that motion, Vice Mayor Matlin. Yes. Yes, Council McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Mm -hmm. Present, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Present. Present, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councillor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, seven in favor, two present. Well, thank you all. We're going to take our lunch break now um, and reconvene at 10 to one. So that's just under 45 minutes, uh, unless I hear a reason to change that time. Uh, that's what we will do. I don't hear any comments. So let's reconvene at 10 minutes to one. Uh, we're making good progress. We do have a few topics that um, have many questions coming up. Thank you all. I'll see you in 45 minutes.
Yeah. yeah. Well, it's 1250 and we're going to start with the afternoon session of the Finance Committee hearing. Uh, welcome back. Uh, the first. Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Clerk. We'll take a roll call uh, to gather attendance at the second half of the meeting. So, again, this is the attendance. Vice Mayor Mellon. Uh, present. Present. Councilor McGovern. Present. Present. Councilor Nolan. Councilor Nolan. Absent. Councilor Simmons. Present. Present. Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Present. Present. Councilor Toomey. Present. Present. Councilor Zondervan. Present. Present. Mayor Siddiqui. Present. Present. Councilor Carlone. Present. There are eight members present. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, the first uh, department in the afternoon will be the License Commission. And uh, both Vice Mayor Mallon and Councilor Sabrina Wheeler have uh, submitted questions. Uh, Vice Mayor, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the city manager and the license commissioner, I just had some questions around some impacted fees that might be impacting your department and their revenues this year. I know that the license commission um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the situation that a lot of our restaurants uh, found themselves in and small businesses uh, decreased a number of their fees and um, that likely took a hit on the department. So my questions um, really are around the total amount of fees that were collected to, by your department as compared to your overall budget um, and what was the difference between estimated fees and actual fees collected in fiscal 21 and how that is affecting your budget going forward uh, in terms of um, revenues. Hi, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so you're right. We What we did is we reduced all of our fees um, except for uh, disposal waste haulers, leaf blowers, pulling conduit and flammables by 40%. Um, and, and we also changed the way in which we accepted the payment of those fees. So some of them uh, came later on in the fiscal year and then a small portion of them of the ones that we're renewing now in the spring will receive an FY22. Uh, so we obviously we did receive a um, decrease in terms of revenue. Um, in terms of projected revenues for FY21, we have um, 1,607,930. Um, that's where we're at. Um, and then we had our budget, our budgeted revenues for FY21 were 2,506,400 um, with a further reduction at recap. And so then, for, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I think Mr. Kale was jumping in. No? No, just checking my budget book, sorry. So that looks like a million dollar shortfall of what was collected a projected revenue collection for fiscal 21 and the budgeted for fiscal 22. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to assess the magnitude of, of the, the impact in the 40% of the reduction in fees. So basically it was a saving of a hundred, well, a saving for our businesses of approximately $888,000. That okay. number is not specifically the number that you'll see in the revenue that we collected because we had about half a million dollars from the second half of the renewal fees of last year come in on this fiscal year. Okay. So <clears throat> the savings for businesses that we, that this, by reducing these permit fees, these revenues by the license commission, the license department is $880,000. That's what you're saying? Yeah, approximately. I think it's $888,000. That's a nice round number. <laughs> I'm, sure there were, I'm sure there's a few dollars extra there, but um, it's the number that's stuck in my mind. It's easy to remember. Okay. Well, that's very helpful because I think, um, you know, 
what we're hearing out in the community is that the small businesses and the restaurants would like to see this reduction continue into this fiscal year and possibly to the end of um, calendar year 22, just to do, because um, we know that the recovery effort, for, particularly for our restaurants and our small business is going to be long. Uh, so I wanted to, for us to really understand the impact of, of what that looked like over the last year and what that could potentially look like over the next year, year and a half, if we were to entertain um, further reducing fees for our small businesses as we move from sort of uh, this phase, which we're calling COVID recovery, uh, which I think, as we all know, is going to be long and there are going to be impacts on revenues all over the city. Uh, we talked about tax assessments and, and tax abatements earlier. This is just another place where I think um, we are going to be asked by the business community to continue this reduction of fees. So I wanted to make sure that uh, myself and the council were all aware of, uh, of the number and um, what we might be, be asking the city to, to do next year. All right, so that was really my only question. So thank you very much for putting that together. And it's always nice to see you, Commissioner. Thank you, same. Um, and just so that you know, uh, we are internally discussing the issue and obviously we're trying to do our best to support our businesses throughout this recovery time. Thank you, that's so great to hear. And I know that we have a, we actually have a, a meeting coming up at the Economic Development Committee where we'll be discussing that. So I look forward to that expanded conversation then. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I, I yield. Thank you both. Uh, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, <clears throat> my question was in a, a sort of similar vein to the vice mayor's. Um, the, the city's provided really critical support for uh, restaurants, for outdoor dining, and, and for all our residents for people-centered streets, and, and including in places like Inman Square. Um, and as we you know, start to come out of the pandemic, what um, funding, or how are we thinking about uh, those kind of you know, outdoor spaces for, uh, for restaurants, but also for residents, and, and how are we thinking about that in the budget? Thank you. So yeah, so you know, in terms of outdoor spaces, that's a that's a question that involves multiple departments, uh, particularly in the public ways that includes traffic and parking, ISD, um, DPW, city manager's office, um, and obviously we are continuing to work with that. And as you know, we have our one-stop shop temporary extensions, um, which continue to be applied for. Uh, we have the ones that people applied for last year, and even this year, we've seen an uptick. Now, in the last few months, we've had about 30 to 40 new ones come in. So we're definitely dealing with that. I know that the city, um, and I don't wanna speak for uh, the city manager, but I know that we're committed in making sure that um, we have spaces for these businesses to be able to um, extend to. And, I, and the, I, don't, I don't know, Nicole, if Matt has anything to add, but I do wanna recognize Nicole, because she has been the point person in getting the information out after the governor in the city has decided, and she's done a phenomenal job with the communications out incredibly quick. And our team has been there 24 seven, so thank you. Matt, is there anything you wanna add? Sure, thanks uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to the council. And um, just a quick, uh, just to follow up with Nicole quickly, this is uh, an internal group that um, from multiple departments, internal working group with public works, traffic and parking, ISD, the law department, license commission, community development, and the city manager's office. And you know, back in March, we officially announced that we are committed to maintaining outdoor dining through the end of this calendar year. Um, that is currently also working with some um, authority given to uh, the city through state executive <coughs> orders that are tied to the public health emergency. Um, so in the meantime, we are also reviewing that internally to figure out if the public health emergency ends, what that means and how we how we need to, to sort of change our focus here in the city. Uh, as far as beyond that, we're also working closely to try to figure out what what the next uh, next year might look like as well. But it, and just in addition, you know, as, as a city manager mentioned to council last night, uh, traffic and parking has um, offered up over 160 60 parking spaces for our restaurants. DPW has sent out uh, almost 150 Jersey barriers to help protect our restaurant diners from the street, um, as well as our patio heater reimbursements and uh, continued commitment from all of the staff, the staff time that um, often happens at nights and weekends, because that's often the time that restaurant managers have time uh, to communicate with staff. So we've adjusted our our flexibility and our ability to, to um, work with our, our restaurants and the business community um, really around the clock 
and we're we're committed to continuing that throughout this throughout this year. Councillor, I have anything else. Thank you very much. So we have uh, Councillor Nolan and Councillor Zondervan in that order. Councillor Nolan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlone. Thank you to all the staff working on this. I wanted to follow up some on uh, the Vice Mayor's question. And it, if this is something that will be addressed at her committee meeting, that's fine. But it would be really helpful to have a clear list of what fees were waived by how much with number of entities by category. Because it, it's always been a little bit unclear to me. Were fees waived entirely or just 40%? Was it just restaurants or was it all businesses? And I know we've talked about this back and forth and the city manager has, has worked on ensuring that as many fees as possible are waived, although it hasn't been all fees in all areas. So is there a list of that somewhere or is that something, and is that something that could be provided to the Economic Development Committee and Vice Mayor Mallon will be addressing it? Thank you. So, so yeah, I mean, there's a memo uh, with the board's vote and it's actually posted on our website. I'm happy to forward it to the council as well. Uh, but to answer your question, we reduced our fees by 40% or renewal fees. So meaning existing businesses only by 40% for all of our businesses, except four categories. So that means we reduced it for comma victuallers, alcohol, in holders, lodging house, entertainment, used car dealers, dispatch companies, open air parking lot, garage, Hawker peddlers, secondhand goods, antiques, letting a motor vehicle, and fortune tellers. And that was all renewal fees. And and, all are, there, fees. and are those the only fees that your that the license commission handles, or are there other fees like weights and measures or others? No, weights and measures is um, ISD. Right. Okay. Uh, we also handle Hackney, and for I want to say I want to I think it's almost the fourth fiscal year in a row we've waived all Hackney fees. Um, so those, those fees, we also did not, uh, wait, we, right. we waived completely. So I apologize if this is in the, in the memo, I can look it up, but it does that memo include here's the total and here's the number of licenses that were reduced. And here's the total a dollar amount associated with that. No, because so when we took the board, when the board voted to reduce the fees, we, it was right before renewal season in, in the fall. So obviously we wouldn't have specific numbers when we voted. Right. But it does list the specific fees, um, and I'm, right. I'm happy to share that with the council. Yeah, it just and this is to follow up as as w when you look at the budget book, the total budgeted revenue for licenses and permits is expected to be 1.6 million dollars. The current year, it's 1.5 million. The year before that, it was 2.2. So there's been some reduction, but it's certainly not all reductions, which I'm not suggesting we necessarily uh, should have. But certainly in terms of a budget impact, if the fees will be similar to this existing year. Um, we should just understand what the um, repercussions of that are and whether there are businesses that are going to continue to need our help. Because we know while the numbers look uh, good, there's still small businesses and medium-sized businesses still struggling across the city. So it's really important for us to know it. it, it is still totals $1.6 million we're expecting to collect in licenses and permits. And it would just be good to know what the breakdown of that is, particularly for small local businesses and um and, and what the plans are for this for this next year because they will clearly need ongoing support. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor. Councillor Zondervan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the commissioner, um, thank you for your work. I did notice in the budget that um, there, there is a vacancy. I'm just wondering if you have enough resources to um, respond to to all these changes and um, challenges of the pandemic. Thank you, Councillor. So, so yes. Yeah, so, unfortunately, we um, we lost our chief investigator. She retired last uh, year. I think I want to say in September. Uh, and as you know, as the city manager sort of mentioned before earlier in this hearing, uh, the positions were sort of on hold. We have posted this position as an investigator position. Uh, the opening is still. Um, I believe it closes at the end of this month. We've been receiving resumes and we're hopeful um, that we can fill it as soon as possible. 
um, our investigator, Tyler Bubenik, has been doing an excellent job. And of course, um, Inspectional Services Department has taken a lot of the load as well in terms of uh, the COVID-related matters during this emergency. So thankfully, we've been able to survive. But yes, we are looking to fill that position as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, you are completed your conversation? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't see, uh, Mr. Manager, did you want to add something? Nope, oh, you, you, you came up on the screen, that's why I asked. No problem. Uh, <clears throat> so with no further uh, discussion. Sir, hold on. Councillor Nolan, yes? Sorry, I had written down another question and forgot to ask it. I'm, um, I'm I, sorry, Council. No, keep going, of course. Um, in this discussion, I know that, um, as Mr. Gianetti alluded to, and um, the city staff, that you're working with a group of people and bringing in all the different players. It, how is it that the outreach is done to the to the business community to ensure that their voices are, are there. I know that there's a small business advisory council, but that, as I understand it, only is one small business owner on it. So how how can we make sure we're working with and hear the voices of the range of maybe even a survey done by every single business association in the city so that we can have that dialogue and make sure that as you do your work, that it's um, responsive so that we can understand as we move forward with these budget questions about what would be most helpful to them. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um you know, I think since the start of the emergency, I've made myself the point person for my department in terms of our licensees. So literally all of them, um, they sometimes mock me for <laughs> the amount of emails that they have in their inboxes from me. Um, but I've, I've sort of become the point person and, you know, we hear from them often and, you know, thankfully our business community is vocal. So uh, we get information from them. I know Matt Nelson from the city manager's office has sort of been the point person at the executive level in terms of business associations, we, we, which we also have made ourselves available, but we know we hear from them. And I know that CDD has uh, created these uh, programs in virtual office hours in which we participate or I participate as well uh, to make sure that we're hearing concerns um, in terms of the survey. I leave that to the powers that be. I think um, uh, there's other people in the city better equipped uh, to answer that question than me, but I would, I would obviously uh, welcome any feedback. Thank you. Uh, I, can, I can jump in before I turn it over to Matt. I would say between the output of the economic development in CD, Matt Nelson license and other departments, uh, our availability, our urging, our supporting with our business community has been exceptional. Uh, we've made sure that we've heard them. We've reached out to them. And I really think the decisions we've made has been with tremendous communications with them, with partners and Matt played a key role in this too. So I don't know if Matt has anything to add. Just sort of uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just uh, reiterating what um, a licensed commissioner and the city manager just said, it, it is a team effort here in the city. And I would just also like to call out um, Economic Development Division and Community Development as well. Uh, they have Party Safari plays, plays the specific role of a small business liaison um, and has done that uh, even before COVID and does a, a great job uh, with our whole team over their economic development. And I work really closely with them in the role here in the city manager's office. Uh, we do have the small business advisory committee that was set up for COVID reopening. Um, and they still are our folks we go, we go to, but we also um, utilize Nicole's list because she's got every licensee's email address and phone number. So when things, when things change, when there's new orders, new uh, reopening guidelines, we, we aren't just going to the advisory committee, we're going citywide and asking for support and input. Thank you, does that conclude your comment, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So there are no other hands up, so I move to forward the department's budget section to the full committee with a favorable recommendation. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councillor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councillor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councillor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. 
Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you. Well, the next department is the police department, and uh, we have questions from a number of councilors. Uh, the first question in was from the vice mayor. Vice mayor, you lead us off. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the city manager, the police commissioner, um, and his team. I had a couple of questions. Up, um, so the first one is about the ROCA allocation of $100,000. Last year, I think we this was a free cash allocation in June after the budget was passed uh, about of the same amount to ensure that there was a Cambridge-based ROCA outreach worker. Can you just speak a little bit to the successes of this program um, and any challenges and why we're choosing to continue with this model and invest in this partnership as part of the budget this year? Uh, I think that there have been that some great stories that have happened over the, the course of the pandemic, even though people were still at home. So I was glad to see this as part of the budget this year um, and hope that it's an ongoing allocation rather than us uh, always doing it through free crash. Three, free cash? Sorry about that. That's my question. So through the chair, um, thanks Vice Mayor. Uh, yeah, so I mean, just understanding Roca. Roca's mission is to break the cycle of prison and poverty. And it does so by being really the conduit or the touch point between young adults, the, the courts and the police. Um, they help young adults to address trauma uh, and, and drive change. What they do is use cognitive behavior therapy and uh, life skills training. And, and really such a short time and, and understanding privacy issues, our successes have been numerous. We get monthly updates from our youth worker, Hannah. And I must tell you, it's a joy to see some of our most challenged young people uh, doing so well with her, getting high school diplomas, driver's licenses, and jobs. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Mallon, ever since you saw Roker present at our quarterly stakeholders meeting, which you always attend, you really were relentless in making sure that we had Roker here in Cambridge. And I have to say it was an excellent judgment and thank you. But when you see who has been impacted and to what extent, it's a no-brainer to include Roca, and, and you know it's just a, it's, it's just an important program. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I, I mean, I I think this is one of those excellent opportunities where we can take a function that, um, you know, was was trying to be worked through the police uh, department, but just really was kind of missing the mark. And there was this amazing nonprofit doing this deep work um, with our most at-risk youth and providing just a, you know, a single uh, city outreach worker just sounds like it really was um, the right way to go. And I'm excited to hear that Hannah has made some some really great strides with some of our young people that I think, you know, we worry the most about. Um, so I'm some of our most challenged uh, young folks whose name you used to see on a different list is now a, a blessing to see them on her list. Right. So I Again, um, you know, when we think about nonprofits and other organizations that can take on some of the work that the police department maybe is not as equipped to do, I think this is an excellent um, example of one of those one of those places where we really had a win, and for not a lot of money, right? If you think about um, one hundred thousand dollars, moving it to uh, Roca, which to them is is quite a bit of quite a bit of of support, so. Uh, I'm really glad to hear that this worked out and that, um, you know, it wasn't just a one year pilot effort that this will now be part of our, our police or our, our budget moving forward. So um, that was my first question. And then my second question was um, providing, if you could provide an update on the procedural justice dashboard and timelines for its implementation. It's not listed as a fiscal 22 objective and performance measure in the budget narrative. Although there is a lengthy narrative on I-43 of key initiative section of the budget. And I know, I think there was just a, a person hired. So just giving us an a, a idea of the timeline of when we can actually see this work moving forward and online. I think, you know, there's been a lot of things that have been happening behind the scenes and it's been several years, but we're just wondering, I'm just wondering when we might see this uh, up and running online. So the procedural justice section and the impending dashboard is an important, you know, police department initiative. It's something that I conceptualized uh, several years ago, um, and it's just one of the many ways that 
the Cambridge Police Department is protective of the people that we serve and accountable to the people we serve. Um, uh, it guards against racial profiling and, and racially biased policing. And the, to your question, the city solicitor is in the final, or well, the law office is in the final stages of a contract review and approval. approval. The vendor uh, should begin implementation shortly after that. And the vendor has also promised that they'll bring the dashboard component online as early in that process as feasible. So, you know, I'm really excited about it uh, because the completion of that work, it really marks a significant achievement for me personally because, you know, I get to see an idea through from conceptualization to implementation. So, um, you know, we're, we're in the final stages of it and, and excited to see it come to be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the city manager, I wonder if, um, I don't know if Ms. Bloa is still on the line, if she had um, just an update of when we might see that approval coming from the, the legal department. I don't know if she's on the line, but if she's not, we'll be happy to send that out tomorrow. Um, uh, through, through the chair, just to add on, um, the city solicitor's office has done a great job representing us here and making sure that everything is done in the most favorable manner to the city. So it's been a back and forth process with the vendor, but I'm I'm told that it's in the last days of being approved. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the commission and the city manager. I, I think if we could get just a just a written update to the council on um, you know an estimated timeline of when that approval will go out, uh, just so we have an idea. I think we were all eagerly awaiting this. <laughs> This dashboard, and so just having some idea of whether or not that means this summer, this fall, um, that type of thing. I think that would be really, really helpful. So those were my questions uh, for the police budget. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, the next speaker is uh, next councilor with a question is Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Councilor, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I had submitted a question um, on Friday about the alternate public safety program. And I know we've talked about that, um, some of that already. And, um, you know, we've been uh, told by the, the program sort of isn't funded in the FY22 budget and the, the opportunities to fund it going forward. Um, so I'm you know, not trying to go back over that. Um, but do um, want to try to get an answer on something that a lot of Cambridge residents have asked me about. Um, and that there's a, a significant increase in the police budget this year. Um, and you know, a year after we have talked about some you know, really important and, and public conversations on shifting some of the way we're thinking about public safety. Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm thinking about conversations about how we're under addressing the underlying causes of public safety um, and not necessarily, um, not in not, I should say, um, sending armed city employees you know, to respond to issues if we don't have to. Um, you know, and that program isn't in the budget, and we're also seeing this this increase here. And community members are expressed frustration to me that we don't see the program in the budget, but there we do see this increase. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to sort of relitigate the conversation from this morning, but um, because we are talking about the police department budget now, and there's this increase, um, did want to give uh, city manager and the police commissioner a chance to respond and, and put that question out there. Was well, that even a question, Chair? It was a long statement. Which is that question, Councilor? Sure. Uh, to put it in the simplest form possible, why is there an increase in the police department budget? Oh, there, there was, I'll just, first, and I'll turn it back to the commissioner, but there's going to be an increase on every budget because of union negotiations, because of health insurance. So right off the bat, the police budget has been treated like every budget in the city right now. And we are still waiting for where we're going to go when we get the recommendations from Council Simmons and Council Collins, I mean, uh, McGovern's committee. But the increases in the police budget I like mostly every budget. They're based on contract settlements. They're based on increased costs in insurance, increased costs in pension, and any other initiative that the police commission wanted to move forward. So I'll turn it back to the commission. I would, I would also add, Mr. Manager, that if you look at the budget book, we have the actual, we have the projected budget, and then we have want to go over that. the yeah. post budget. So clearly the police department is not spending its allocation this year in full. So therefore, it really isn't an increase in, in totality because the projected number is lower than what their adopted budget was. Through, through the chair, you'll see that for each of the last three fiscal years, FY20, FY21, and FY22, we've requested level funding for staffing. Um, any increases in our budget is, are simply, as the manager stated, due to 
uh, contractual raises and, and other fringe benefits, the, the increase in costs. Um, from FY20 to FY21, our budget went up, three, our, our request went up 3.63%. And this year from 22, from 21 to 22, the request went up 4.38%. But once again, totally for, you know, salary considerations, contractual raises. Um, in terms of the uh, task force, um, you know, we've already talked about it, that the city manager has already embarked on this more thoughtful process in the form of that task force to examine uh, the future of public safety. If it has the effect of reducing the footprint in, of policing here in Cambridge, which we fully expect it to do so, then it's going to do so in a measured way. Um, I think that some people are under the, the misconception that if we create a new division that has X amount of employees, that that means that X amount of employees can come from the police department. And, and that's not the exact way it would happen. If it did happen, it would be through, you know, uh, a measured transfer and attrition of services. If you just look at the, the benchmark in the front of the public safety section and you just see the calls into ECD, you'll see that 63% of them are directly for the police department. And then of the other 37%, uh, the vast majority of those we attend with fire and medical services also. So what we seek to do is to create alternative responses to some of those calls that we go to. And we gladly, you know, we'll turn that work over. And, uh, but the city manager has already started this more thoughtful process. And we're letting that play out. And I don't know if the co-chairs, I know they're here, if they wanted to say anything, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited about the recommendations and, and how this process is, is turning out. And one other, one other minor increase that would be in this budget is the continuation of the cadet program. As we add more and more cadets, the budget will grow uh, for that as well. That was planned and we hope to continue to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, through the chair, you know, I um, got some more additional questions, but I know other counselors uh, do as well. So thanks for that additional detail. Uh, and I'll uh, yield back. Thank you, counselor. Uh, two people would like to comment on this subject. We have Councillor McGovern, followed by Councillor Zondervan. Councillor McGovern, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If it's, I know I have a question um, pending. If you want me to hold everything till then, if that's easier for you. Uh, well, you if the question is related. Yeah, yeah. Just, re just, just sort of real quickly, because this was brought up earlier too, and I think it applies. Um, to the police department budget as well as really any any department budget um uh mr chair you you valiantly fell on your sword when the issue came up of um you know that we haven't had additional finance committee meetings over the course of the year to talk the budget and you took responsibility for that um i would also point out that you know it's really a responsibility of all of us because any of us can ask for the finance committee or any other committee to um have a committee hearing to discuss a budget issue or budget reallocation and so i agree with Councillor sabrina wheeler that you know at this time last year <clears throat> there was a lot of conversation about um the police department budget and reallocating money from that um and it was a relatively in, in some ways it was a relatively new discussion for the council i mean i know people in the community you know have talked about it but the council really hadn't addressed it but from last may till now you know, we have had a year um, and we haven't really talked about what that if we wanted to make a reallocation from the police department budget or any budget department budget, what that would look like, what, how, how much money, how, what, how, where would that money come from? What would be the implications of that money? Where would that money go? Um, you know, if we're cutting, you know, most of these budgets, the vast majority of these department budgets, including the police, are salary and benefits, which are much harder to cut because of contractual and collective bargaining agreements. So typically when you money comes from discretionary funds, which are certain types of programs and supports. So if we were going to cut those programs and supports funding for those, would some another department pick them up or not pick them up? So we really haven't had those deeper level conversations. And then we get to the we get to today and it's not really the the opportunity or the time to really have those deeper level conversations so i would just i would i would 
suggest that if this is something that we continue to want to discuss, whether it's the police department or other departments that we use our committee process as well to have those conversations over the course of the year so we don't find ourselves in this situation uh, next year. Um, but I think, you know, th th this has been um, because, you know, it's not quite so easy as just cutting money. There's a lot of implications as to what that means, and we just need to give it its due process. And I don't think we've really done that thus far. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so the next speaker on the issue is Councilor, Zonder, uh, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. You came on the screen. Did you want to add anything? Oh, sorry. Councilor Zondervan is up. Councilor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to you. Um, <clears throat> I did want to briefly respond to the previous comments. I, I, I'm a little bit um, struck by those because you know we we did have extensive conversations in the Public Safety Committee, um, both on alternative uh, crisis response as well as alternative uh, traffic enforcement. Uh, as well as demilitarization of the police. And so, you know, we have talked extensively about areas that we want to see change. And the uh, policy order last year that asked for a reduction in the police department made it very clear, outlined specifically where we would like to allocate those, those funds. Um, so I, I'm not sure in what sense we would say that we haven't had these conversations. We we didn't have them in the finance committee, and and it would have been better to do that. But but we nonetheless had those conversations um, in in some form in the public safety committee and elsewhere, um, as well as in the in the community overall. Um, and in, in terms of you know salary obligations and and so forth, which are not so easy to uh, to cut, I, I understand all of that, um, but we can choose to not fill vacant positions. Um, we can choose to shrink the overall footprint um, of the police force, which is what our community has called for. Um, we can shrink some of the equipment and the weapons that, that we are deploying, which again, our community has called for. Um, and, and we're not seeing any of those things being proposed. We're seeing, again, continued routine uh, increases. And I appreciate that, you know, the um, police department is, is spending less than, than is in the budget, but nonetheless, they're spending what they're spending and, and asking for increases um, each year above that, um, which is, completely the opposite of what the community is asking for. The community is asking for less policing and for more services um, to assist with housing, with economic opportunity, with mental health and other domestic crises. Um, that's where we want to see the, the investments going, not in continued uh, policing of the form that, that we have seen uh, for decades and decades, and you know, we're, I, I'm just responding to to that not coming through, both in in terms of no conversations about the budget over the course of the year in the finance committee, and and even now with the budget before us, there's no apparent recognition of that call for a decrease in policing and a decrease in spending on um, policing. So I, I do have a couple of quick questions. One is on the um, training, uh, travel and training budget. And, and I would, wanted to know if there was any uh, overseas training that was being paid for by, the, by that um, budget line item. Through the chair, uh, the specific trainer question about training and overseas training, no. Thank you. And um, also in terms of the uh, overtime budget, I know that uh, some of that pays for the traffic details and, and some of it um, presumably for events. 
have there have you seen any reduction in in the overtime expenditures because of COVID? And are we making any adjustments to that in the budget? So, so the chair, uh, see, we're we're operating right now with an unacceptably high number of vacancies, both in sworn and professional staff. And continuing to operate with the high number of vacancies is it, it, not sustainable. Um, it, it, it's unsound fiscally even because it, it doesn't even permit us to make sound projections on overtime because in real time, we always have to backfill vacant spots um, because of mandatory, to make sure that we're up to mandatory minimum staffing levels. If you just look at FY21, our backfill overtime ballooned 40% from uh, up to $1.4 million. Um, and that's not counting any COVID related monies, uh, which we spent over a million on also, but those monies were paid for out of the CARE Act. But we're, we're operating with incredibly high um, vacancies that really threaten the stability of the, of the department. Vice Mayor Mallon on the, the previous question alluded to the fact that we um, hired uh, our procedural justice informatics officer but the truth of the matter is that that candidate backed out over the uncertainty of what this body might do uh, with our budget, believing that if cuts were to be made, that civilian positions would likely uh, go first. In fact, our, our top two candidates backed out for that same reason. So um, these actions that threaten to negatively impact the department's budget, even if they don't happen, they don't simply dissipate in the abstract. They, they have real world identifiable negative consequences. So, you know, I, I would speak to your poll soliloquy, but I, I'm not, but we're operating <laughs> at extremely high uh, vacancies right now. Thank you. And, and to you, Mr. Chair, I, I believe that the, particularly with regards to traffic details, and that's part of the collective bargaining agreement that um, unfortunately requires police officers to conduct those um, when, when in fact there's no actual need for that to be limited to the police. Um, and I, I don't believe we ever got an updated um, collective bargaining agreement since the previous one expired in, in uh, 2020. So any updates on that agreement and whether we are going to continue to require traffic details to be conducted by police officers. I believe the latest agreement is online. That's what I was told. So I'm surprised whatever that is. I mean, yes, we will continue to have police and the commissioner can talk fire by the way that it's important to have them conducting those. Uh, but I think, again, the plan we have in place is not only to have them on details, but it also provides safety to our community. And I, I don't want to underestimate in the middle of COVID the responsibility that the police department has had to continue to make this city safe. And I think, you know, I have not heard the cries of 118,000 people say defund the police department or eliminate police officers. What we have heard is we need to try to provide the services differently. And that's a big difference. So I, I do think it's, it's unfair to say that the cry is to eliminate police officers. I have not heard that in a population of 118. What we have heard is, and what we're working on is, how can we provide service better and differently? And both myself and the commissioner have worked with Councilor Simmons and, and Councilor McGovern in the committee to recognize that and will recommend a plan that does that. But that doesn't mean eliminating police officers. And, and to piggyback on what the manager said through the chair, um, the USA Today just published a study that said that only 18% of the population favors defunding the police. Um, and I've heard quite the opposite, you know, uh, and to, to talk about traffic details, I just want to point out that um, the reason why officers statutorily in many states are required on traffic details is because of the incremental wisdom of having the police officer there as it pertains to increased public safety. And I think that there's a common misconception that um, if you replace officers with civilians, that the price goes down. One, the city doesn't pay it, the, the vendor pays for the officers, but a flag man, and, or, or as they call a position, a flag person, which it should rightfully be called, um, is, is really nominally cheaper than a police officer. And I mean, dollar, little, nominally, maybe a dollar or two cheaper than the rate for a flag person and the rate for a police officer is 
is no appreciable difference. It was a misconception that it's going to save some money somewhere, and it's not. Um, thank you uh, to the chair for those answers. I, I don't want to get into a, a policy debate, but uh, I, I have certainly been in conversations with many community members, particularly those who are negatively impacted by over-policing, who absolutely are asking for a reduction in the size of the police force and, and a reduction in the interactions with uh, police in, in the community. Um, and, you know, I, again, I, I don't want to get into a policy debate, but the, the people who are asking for that are primarily the people who are negatively impacted by the current system. And, and of course, it's not surprising that people who are, generally speaking, um, wealthy and privileged enough not to be bothered by it are, are perhaps not so concerned with it. But I, I don't think we, uh, certainly I don't take that as, as the policy direction just because um, you know, privileged people aren't, aren't necessarily calling for the police to be defunded. Um, and, and with regards to- Mr. Chair, the, uh, I, I have to jump in. Our uh, decisions are not made. Me. I, I have the floor. I mean, Kanza, you, you, you announced that our administration uh, is being run by privileged people. That is totally uh, unfair. And that's all, I'll let it go, that. but it's unfair. My I reputation has been committed to everybody in this city. And I've got 50 Mr. years Chair, of it. And for you to continue to make that statement Mr. is unfair. Chair, I have the floor. Yes, but the idea is to ask questions and get responses. That's what this session is. Well, and, and, and I appreciate that, but if if the manager and the commissioner want to engage in a political debate, I to avoid that, but, but they're um, being, you know, provoking this political argument that I'm not even trying to have. Point of order, um, Mr. Chair. In, in any case, I, I wanted to respond to the commissioner's statement about uh, traffic details because I, I'm not asking about that in, in order to see a, a reduction of cost, but because we are limited by the current arrangement to uh, police officers. And, and in the past, when I've asked about this, it's been made very clear to me that we're unable to fill uh, all the traffic details as a result of that. And, and this leads to ex extensive um, safety concerns in traffic that, that I've reported and observed many times and, and others have as well, where we are able to fill those uh, details and, and you know, traffic is uh, left to manage on its own, which, which doesn't always go so well. So uh, again, I, I think it is really important. Is there a question here, okay. Mr. Chair? This, um, I think this is a discussion that can occur outside budget hearings especially since we don't pay for these details. And I totally agree we can discuss it like we have in the past, but we need to move on and focus on the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, the manager alluded to the uh, bar collective bargaining agreement being available online. Um, I, I was not able to find it, but I, I would appreciate it. Okay, I, I, I think you that is a good comment, and we'll all look for it. Now, we have other people waiting with questions that they submitted. Um, Councillor Simmons, uh, you are next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's this conversation, uh, and thank you for reminding us the difference between a budget inquiry and um, ex extemporaneously pontificating. Uh, some of this has been addressed already, but I think it's interested. I just want to put my, my question into the context of a bit of a preamble. Um, a committee meeting is not a hearing or a discussion on the budget. I, I think that's being conflated, and I respectfully ask that we don't do that. Uh, but in addition, I, I think it's we have to be careful how we frame what and who the community is. As someone who lives in the port, who's lived in the port 50 of my X plus years uh, and intimately speak to my neighbors on a regular basis, um, and it has been stated here, I have not been hearing a long yearn a, or uh, 
desire to defund the police as has been represented here. We all have our constituencies and we all um, have the ear of them, but we have to be very careful not to say that the community feels a certain way when the community does, is not a mon monolithic body. None of us gets the opportunity to speak to the entire community. So I will say, and I would hope that we kind of think of it in this context, the people that I have spoken to a great deal in my community of the port in particular, but other parts of the city, do have a concern about the conversation around defunding the police, which is a budgetary discussion. It's really not a, a any other kind of discussion. So I'm glad that we're going to try to talk a little bit about that here, because when we talk about defund the police, everyone has a bit of a different idea of what that means. And it would be helpful uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to our commissioner, when, when you think about defund the police in the context of the police budget, what would that look like? Because one person in particular mentioned to me, and I would like to hear from the commissioner on this, is if we were to take positions out of the police department budget, which I hear sometimes is what people mean when they see defunding the police, uh, <clears throat> We would, we would lose so many of our qualified staff, particularly those of color, black, brown, Latinx, and women. And so I would like to hear a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I would like to hear a little bit about the impact of this defund um, notion, knowing and not expecting that the, the commissioner can give us a full array of the impact, but, if he could talk about that. We, in, in, in addition to that, we have spent a, um, a, a good amount of time lauding the police academy, the procedural justice project, and all these interventions that either our commissioner has maintained, invented himself, or expanded. And it's almost like a disjointed conversation. You know, build and do, how do we build and tear down at the same time? So for, the community that I represent and speak to very often, particularly those that are very worried about this notion of what defund the police might look like, it might be helpful in this budget context to talk about what that actually would look like, particularly does this mean that we would lose some of the diversity that we have worked so hard to, to get and maintain and that we're trying to bring on? So through you, to, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to our police commissioner, if you could speak to that uh, briefly. So through, through the chair, um, the council Simmons, yeah. So yeah, that's a multifaceted answer. So um, if you look at since uh, FY18, our diversity in the department has increased from 34% to 39.2%. And if you talk about in terms of reducing positions, Contractually, we, we, we go by the, the last in, first out, last hired, first, first uh, laid off. So, you know, you're, you're talking about reducing that diversity that has come into the department from that point on. Although we lost a slew of diverse candidates um, prior to being able to start the academy here in January, we were able to put in uh, 12 individuals. And of the 10 who remain, because we always expect attrition, through um, when we go into the academy. It's still a very diverse class. We got four uh, females. We got four Hispanics or Latinx. We have uh, uh, four, Afri four Caucasian and two African-American individuals. So it's out of those 10, you got diversity there. Those will be gone. When you look at mission critical functions um, and, and what you know the police department's main function is, which is the prevention of crime, then that means that we have to reduce everything that we do down to those mission critical or those core functions. So you lose a lot of the protective measures that this department has spent more than a decade building up. Um, I, I spoke at length, I believe it was July 10th at, or June 10th, at a budget hearing um, last year and just talked about what uh, that proposed $4.1 million uh, reduction would look like and what services will be Look like, would look like, um, what we would lose. And when you think about that, all of the protective measures that 
that we would lose, we end up looking like the, the police department that you're talking about defunding. And that's not what you want. The Cambridge Police Department goes out of its way to have all of these protective measures. I found me in the social justice section. Um, people conflate it. But what it does is instead of promoting social harm or furthering social harm, the family and social justice section connects our most vulnerable uh, people uh, to the appropriate services, thereby steering them away from arrest or more punitive measures. Um, our safety net collaborative, which is housed in our family and social justice section that would cease to exist if you, when you talk about defunding us because we would only be able to do our core programming. It, 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 I mean, it was started under the notion that we know that anytime you take a young person and put them in contact with the juvenile justice system, that they're seven times more likely to be in contact with the criminal justice system as an adult. So it just makes all proper sense to do everything you can not to put them in contact with the juvenile justice system. And that's what we do. So you, you, you're going to lose what makes the Cambridge Police Department special. Um, and, and just as in a pragmatic view, nothing um, gets better when you take monies and budget away from it. If you want to improve things, oftentimes it um, requires additional funding. And, and we're, we, you know, we can read the room. That's why you see requests for level staff. But yeah, you lose the diversity because that's what's come along lately. You, you lose the protective measures because we would have to build, go back to only performing mission critical functions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, that was very helpful and informative because I think people just see it um, one way or the other and not the shades in between. One other follow-up question to that. Uh, for several years, and Mr. City Manager can attest to this, I had asked because of the people that I speak to in Central Square in particular, because I do live in the Central Square area, had said over and over and over, uh, why don't we have a little bit more presence in Central Square? So I want to add, not only have I been hearing about presence in Central Square, but presence in the port. But that's a conversation I'm willing to have with one of my colleagues offline. Um, and it wasn't until uh, Mr. Commissioner Bard came, and I want to thank him very much, that we actually got the coverage uh, that particularly the seniors, I'm talking about at 411 Franklin, 237 Franklin, 55 Essay, 114 Norfolk, the ones that I speak to, uh, it, took it, it took to getting this commissioner to actually get that public safety outpost with the, with the support of the Cambridge Savings Bank. So two things. One, it talked about community collaboration between two a private private entities getting together and collaborating around a service to the community. But two, I cannot tell you how many folks have said thank you, thank you, thank you for making that happen, thanks to the city council, et cetera, and so forth. And so my question to you, Mr. Commissioner, will any of uh, cuts to the police department budgets have an effect on that central square uh, station, substation that's now um, on Mass Avenue by the T station? Through the chair, um, uh, Madam Councilor, uh, yeah, it would. And and just think of it in terms of um, I've I've assigned a much larger group of officers to Harvard Square and Central Square. Much of their time, obviously, because of the clientele there, is is devoted to reducing social harm and connecting individuals with resources and services. So, once again, we'll have to constrict as a department and only perform mission critical functions, which is answering calls for service and patrolling. Um, in, in the vehicle in the normal fashion. So yeah, it, it cuts away at um, certain uh, amenities that folks become accustomed to, and that would be one of them. Anything that you see added on recently, would, would you would likely see uh, go to, go the way of the button down shit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I think that's an important, as we discuss this budget in, in talking about allocation or reallocation of funds or cutting funds, we have to think it through and see it through the lens of services that are provided that people have gotten accustomed to and have asked for. And again, uh, as someone who spends a good deal of their time talking to people, actually talking to them, not talking to one or two people and making that a, a gaggle of folks, but talking to people, 
uh, this is what I hear. And so I want to thank the commissioner and particularly the city manager uh, for putting those services visibly in the square for people who, as far as I have heard, have only had positive things to say. So I want to think, I want us to be very thoughtful when we talk about our, uh, what, what, what defunding actually looks like. With that, Mr. Chair, I, I, again, my thanks to the commissioner and to Mr. De Pasquale. I will yield the floor. Thank you, Councillor Simmons and Co-Chair Simmons. So we have three councillors so far who have their hands up. The first is Councillor Nolan. Councillor, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chair Carlon. Thank uh, everyone who's answered so far. I did have a similar question to some of the others. Um, but I will ask, I, I heard pretty strongly from Commissioner Bard that he is understanding that if we offload over time some of the um, functions from the department that there would be an opportunity in the future to think about um, reallocation. So I'm just curious as to whether it would be during the budget process or another process that that kind of discussion would happen. And obviously it would happen in conjunction with all the other departments of the city to work for because the work of your department is obviously very tied to human services to so many other areas of the city as well. So um, I, I appreciate that that I certainly saw on the school side, some of the diversion programs and yet there was also um, some question of bringing that into other areas as well. So, um, and I noticed in some of the performance measures that include some of that diversion program. And as you said, if it turns out that there are ways that we can address some of the underlying issues that um, at some point in their future, it would make sense to then rethink some of the um, positions in your department. So I'm just uh, curious as to whether it would be, that would be a budget discussion or that would be longer term on some other area. If that makes sense as a question, Commissioner, through you, Chair. Through the chair, Council Nolan, I think it makes sense as a question, but I th and I think the most succinct answer is that as long as it's done thoughtfully, then um, then I you know I, I don't care you know I, I don't think it matters so much what process it comes through. It just has to be a thoughtful, measured process, and not this you know harried or histrionic process that, that you know some in the, some places are, are undergoing. And and just look around the country. We've seen a lot of hurried processes in a lot of cities around the country have to then be reversed and now you got councils going th and, and going through asking for increased police budgets when in cambridge in my opinion we can and should do it <laughs> better so uh, I, I i really trust the, the the more thoughtful process that the manager has already engaged in with the task force to examine the future of public safety i think some some very helpful and game-changing recommendations are going to come from it and all I, all I ask is that the pro process, however it happens, to be done thoughtfully. Yeah. Thank you. And I certainly, I don't know if others had a chance. I, as just a member of the public, read there were a couple of very interesting articles specifically on this issue in the Boston Globe magazine and in particular about how many of the police uh, training modules, some of which were developed by uh, someone out in um, uh, Amherst about something you either changed or solidified, which is the duty to intervene is something that also requires ongoing training, that it's one thing to have a policy, but it's another thing to ensure that folks know about it and they're in essence trained in, in, in how to do that. And there are programs you know, that, that I think our department already has. And I look forward to continuing those discussions. I do think there's some really exciting energy around this moving forward, that there's, there's folks weighing in and bringing together um, specific models that I would love for us to um, continue to develop because I think we have both benefited from other people developing those models that we then start and also other people looking to us for some of the models that we start, right? And that's the way across the country we're gonna get to a better place. So I, I look forward to working with you on that and um, thank you for, uh, for answering that question. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McGovern is next, followed by Councillor Zondervan. Councillor McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to follow up on something that uh, Councillor Simmons mentioned about, um, you know, the as we talk about potentially reallocating money from the police and defunding the police, whatever, however you want to phrase it, um, that, you know, not only are there differences of that no one, none of us, I, anyone on this council, anyone in the city, anybody in the community, nobody speaks for the community as a whole. Um, there's a lot of different, opinion, different opinions across the community, and it's not just there's difference with, uh, differences of opinion within 
subgroups, right? Not every, there's a lot of white privileged people in Cambridge who uh, don't have negative interactions with the police who are asking for the police to be defunded, right? There are people who live in public housing who are non-white who are asking for more policing. And I just think it's important that if we're gonna, if we're gonna talk about this issue, that we not speak for the entire community and that we, we be respectful of those differences of opinions. I'm not saying who's right or wrong. I have my experience and my experience is not the same as others and I respect that. But if we're really gonna talk about discussing this as a community, we need to do that as a whole community. And just today we received a tweet uh, to the city, to the commissioner why don't we in Newtown Court in Washington Elms have walking and bike patrols? The shooting of a Watertown man happened in our community. And again, a summer of cowering in our homes with our kids and grandkids is no way to live. Please, we need help. Now, I'm not saying that person is right. I'm not saying that person is wrong. I am saying that this is a person who lives in public housing, who is saying, is not calling for a reduction in the police department, is asking for more. So I just think it's important, again, that we just, especially as elected officials who represent the entire community, that we acknowledge that there are different voices and different perspectives and we, we be respectful of those. And again, I'm not saying who's right or wrong, um, but there are differences and we should be respectful of that. I wanted to ask the commissioner, um, and, I, and you did touch on this a little bit, but if you could be sort of more specific, when we talk about, um, potential reductions in funds, what are some of the areas where that discretionary money could come from? Because again, it's harder with collective bargaining to pull it out of salary and wages, but what are some of the programs that potentially would be impacted? So, so I, uh, through the chair, um, counselor, if I understand your, the, your question, uh, and let me just be clear, there, our discretionary funds are, are so limited. I think that they, that any discretionary funds go to, uh, increased costs in fuel and things of that nature like the the reduction in our budget is personnel is salaries that's the 95 percent thing that's the that's the thing to go at that you, it's easily easiest to touch so it would be salaries and you know you you know we talk about our diversity increasing last year we had to sit out the cadet program because of the uh that negotiated hiring for um, this year, we look to bring it back. I mean, remember, the purpose of that is is to increase diversity and to ensure that we can put Cambridge kids in these public safety jobs that are actually very well paying. We've already seen benefits with our first initial class. We have uh, one African-American female successfully graduate the academy. We have a, a Hispanic, Latina, Latinx male who's scheduled to graduate in a month. Um, so, you know, we, we have these successes and we're able to put diverse candidates, you know, in these public safety jobs from because of these programs. But then these programs would obviously be in line to be cut and would not be in line to be cut. They would be the first among the first to be cut if we um, reduce our, our budget. It's, 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 there's no way to get around the personnel impacts that reducing our budget have. Um, you know, we, we can do, we can look at you know, what any new programs that we implement and how they impact, you know, us and then thoughtfully look at um, whether there's an opportunity to retreat a trip. But once again, it has to be measured, it has to be a thoughtful process. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, just a quick follow up. And with those personnel cuts, I mean, I, I, and I, I don't know, I don't know the answer to this. I mean, we know that there are some, um, members of the police department who are in unions and there are certain rights that are collectively bargained with those unions that make reductions sort of more, more more difficult and i assume that there are probably personnel in the police department who are not members of unions i don't know that for sure and so would we be talking about those would be the first cuts that would happen because those are sort of the easier ones to do and those are those positions more in line with kind of the more social service work that gets done i'm just trying to figure out where it would you know, where exactly it would come from um, if, it, if it happened. So um, it's a it's a both and uh, through the chair, counselor, it's, it's, a, it's from, you know, it's going to affect every corner of the department budget uh, decreases because it's going to result in a reduction of personnel from, remember, like the social justice, restorative and procedural justice work that we do is so interwoven throughout the fabric of the entire police department that if 
you touch it, you touch it everywhere. So, you know, those reductions will come everywhere. It, 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 it really impacts morale, uh, as I already indicated, as you just said, and I thought I indicated earlier, we got a, uh, a you know, a CBA, a, a collective bargaining agreement in place that flat out mandates that our, you know, we do reverse or inverse seniority when, if we're talking about layoffs. Um, I lost my, my train of thought, but yeah, we do inverse seniority in terms of layoff. In terms of morale, um, it when I tell you that literally we had two prime candidates, we had a number one candidate and a, a number two candidate in both civilian position, civilian and potential employees backed out because of the uncertainty of what might happen with our budget because of the histrionics from last year. Um, that impacts morale um, for us, our professional staff because they also believe that if cuts were to happen, that they would likely be first to go. And then it impacts the overall morale because, you know, we're this symbiotic organ organization. So it, 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 as I said, these discussions don't just dissipate, even if they don't happen. They they really manifest themselves in, in real world consequences that you can point to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Zondervan has his hand up. Councillor Zondervan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion. I, I, I don't quite understand um, the the claim that these discussions themselves have such an, a, a negative impact. Because again, part of the challenge here that we're trying to navigate is do these positions even need to be in the police department? And, and when the commissioner says, for example, um, that we, we need to do uh, patrols in, in Central Square to um, reduce social harm and, and provide access to services, are, are we saying that, the, that those services can only be provided by armed police officers, that there is no way that we could provide an alternative service that did not involve armed police officers that would accomplish the same goal? Through the chair, if that was a question to me, Councillor. What I said was that you have to look that they also um, perform, or they also engage in harm reduction strategies. That's, that's what I said. So they patrol the squares, but then they also spend their time, you know, helping out vulnerable populations. Thank you. So, so it's my understanding that we could be providing those services without um, using armed police officers. And that is frankly what um, I'm suggesting here. You know, nobody's uh, suggesting that these services go away. We're, we're simply asking, do they need to be provided by armed police officers? I, I also uh, find it interesting. That's, that's a conflation though, Councillor. That's a conflation. I'm, nobody said that they, that they solely had to be provided by. The, public, the police officers are there for a public safety component. And it's something that they do ancillarily um, because we adopt a protective strength stance here in Cambridge. Okay, so, this this is not budgetary right now. This is policy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I firmly believe with all my heart, this is what the council will be discussing in June, policy about the future. I, as I've said before, I believe there is truth in, in what is being said from the other side of what we're doing now from the other side. And I believe the administration will, and, and I'm including the commissioner at the top of that list, will look at this seriously. But this is not the proper time. We've already did this in the first hour. And um, we got a lot to get through. We're not. Even, we're about halfway through. Not even. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would appreciate the opportunity to, to finish asking my question. No, not you can ask a question, but it has to relate to the budget. That's thank what we're doing today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe all my questions have and will continue to relate to the budget. That's why we're here. Um, I, I also heard in in previous statements. Um, as well as last year when we had this conversation, that every time we ask for a reduction in the police budget, we are told 
that the only way to accomplish that is by reducing the diversity of the police um, budget. At the same time, we're told that we are operating with a lot of vacancies, and I can see that in the in the budget um, backup. So, uh, so I don't quite understand that. If, if the police commissioner could help me understand, if if we have all these vacancies, and then we're trying to fill some of those uh, with cadets, why why would we? necessarily reduce diversity just because we're reducing the size of the uh, of the force uh, through the chair so counselor um as i stated earlier we're operating at it with an unacceptably high number of vacancies we have minimum staffing levels that require us to force officers almost daily um to stay on overtime shifts so it, it it's about um, those vacancies, we have those vacancies. We don't have those vacancies because it's a desirable state to be in. We have that, those vacancies because it uh, just so happens to be a negative consequence of, see, we succession plan for these vacancies. When we had this arbitrary hire and freeze, it disabled us from being able to fill spots that we knew were coming up to be vacant because, you know, we succession plan and we plan for these vacancies. So um, not only were we not able to fill the 18 to 20 vacancies that we knew we would have uh, been, but we had additional vacancies. So it's not an ideal state that we're in. So we're forcing officers. That if you heard me also, I said that our backfill over time has Thank ballooned you. 40% from last fiscal year, the prior fiscal year, um, just because of filling those back, those overtime because of the high vacancies. It's not desirable. Yeah, we're trying to make sure that we onboard diverse individuals and in Cambridge kids. So the cadet program is helpful in that, but it's not the only way or the only measure we use to fill vacancies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I think that's perhaps um, some of the, um, I don't even want to say disagreement, but different visions here, because again, what, what I'm hearing from members of the community that I'm in extensive communication with is that we would like to see a lot of these functions provided not by the police, not by armed police officers, but by other uh, trained community members who can perform the same function, um, but but are not uh, associated with um, uh, law, law enforcement specifically. Um, my final question, and and you know this has been mentioned several times last week, uh, Monday during the council discussion, and and even today that the task force. Is, is somehow going to make recommendations that uh, would lead to a reduction in the police budget, but, but nothing I've heard today uh, indicates to me that that's in fact going to happen or, or even that, okay. that that's what the commissioner or the, or the manager would like to see. So- Okay, yeah. we're going to discuss that in June. That is not on the budget at the moment. I agree it's important and we're gonna deal with it in the future, not today. And we've talked about this a number of times already. Um, and my job is to move this meeting forward. And, and that's what I'm going to do. And I might add, there are other people who've submitted questions who've not had an opportunity uh, to talk yet. So I'm going to take uh, my lead responsibility and move on, in fact, there are two other counselor, or one other counselor who wishes to speak on this, and they've been waiting a good time. So, so Mr. Chair, this was my final question, and I would like an answer, which is, should we expect to see a reduction in the police budget in June or not? I don't think we can answer that until we see the whole report, the whole uh, committee report. It, it, that will you can bring that up at some other meeting that's about policy and when we deal with the extended budget or refined budget on this issue but we don't know we're not i'm not in that committee you're not in that committee we don't know where it's going but now i have to deal with this budget and i i've said before i concur with the principles and i do want change but it, it now we have to deal with what is before us, or we'll never get done with this budget. Councillor Toomey, you're next. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for your leadership and patience in this uh, first day of uh, budget deliberations. I will be brief. I just want to say to the police commissioner and to the entire department staff that how uh, much uh, on my constituents appreciate all that you do on a daily basis to protect and serve us. And that's a big thing. It's not only protect, but it is serving us. And I will say this, I, I'm listening to, to what the commissioner just said. I'm somewhat alarmed, but why his, his reference to unacceptably high um, levels of vacancies, uh, as you know, Mr. Chair and Mr. Commissioner, in the last month or two, we've had an, an awful increase in the number of shootings of, uh, of people in the, in the city. And it's very alarming to me. And I know there's been some other guns found throughout the city. And unfortunately, throughout the country, there's been uh, the gun sales are off the charts. The, the, from all age groups and all ethnic groups and, and everything. So com Commissioner, I guess my concern is, I'm sure you're hopefully ahead of what potentially is coming in the next couple of months in terms of um, gun violence and that we are prepared, hopefully that we are prepared to deal with that and that all our residents are safe. But these shootings have happened in all parts of the city and it's unacceptable. And uh, so I just want to uh, to say that. And, and when there is a shooting, I think the resident would expect an officer to appear on the scene with the, uh, the prop, appropriate equipment to deal with that situation that they encounter. Thank you. Commissioner Bard, did you want to, sure. please? I, I was going to ask you if the council wanted me to respond to, to his statement. But yeah, we, we, we're, we're doing our, our diligence to address the violence, working with our regional partners. Um, as you know, our most recent victims were um, from out of town, and, and we're working to make sure that that violence doesn't rear its head in Cambridge. But once again, we're not, you know, immune. We don't have this bubble wrapped around us. So um, we, you know, what goes on in the region impacts us here in Cambridge. So we are at unacceptably high uh, levels of vacancies and it's forcing me to um, utilize overtime to force officers to fill those vacancies at, so that we can meet minimum staffing requirements. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll let Councilor McGovern uh, have the next question. I believe the mayor and Councilor Nolan will add questions after him. Councilor McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, Mr. Commissioner, we we did have um, we've had a couple converse, we had a couple conversations last year around the potential of uh, body cameras um, for police, and I know it's something you have been working on behind the scenes. I'll just say that we know, as we sadly um, have seen that body cameras don't stop uh, incidents of violence from happening. And, and um, that's not really the intent, but they do provide, um, if we haven't had all the body camera footage from incidents around the country, there'd probably be, um, you know, these things wouldn't be as well known and there wouldn't be as much evidence to support the victims of, of these uh, violent crimes at the hands of law enforcement. Um, there's also been there's also been times where the body cameras have been used to, um, you know, where there's been debate around what actually happened at an event. So, keeping it in perspective, it's not an answer answer to every problem, um, but they have been shown to be useful in certain circumstances. So, where do we stand with that? It's not in the budget. Where I know you've been working on it. What's the update? Uh, through the chair, counselor, yeah, thanks for the question. So we're we're at the stage where we're working with the person agent. We're working with Ms. Unger to uh, get an RFP out there, request for a proposal for body cameras. Um, I, obviously, I'm a proponent of body cameras. I think they, you know, are, are the best neutral and detached witnesses, and they keep individuals, uh, you know, generally on their best behavior. Um, it's obviously a process that would have to go through, you know, the surveillance ordinance process, but. That's where we are right now, uh, working on that request for proposal. Um, I, I don't think that from you know inception to implementation is, is a long process. You got companies chomping at the bit, you know, trying to service Cambridge in that area. So um, RFP should be going out shortly. I'm not exactly sure when, but 
you'll have, the council will have to be intimately engaged in that process because of the surveillance work. Uh, thank you um, through you, Mr. Chair. And so does that, I again, I would assume that there, there would have to be some negotiation or some agreement reached with the union or, or around this. Is that true? And have those conversations taken place or we're gonna do the RFP first? We we're doing the RFP and we've had preliminary conversations with the R, with the unions, but obviously they view it as a substantial uh, change to working conditions. But um, contrary to what popular popular beliefs may be, they're they're willing to work with um, the city manager and with the city and make sure that, that they they believe that having body cameras is in their best interest as well. Let me just say that. I want to follow up uh, uh, that I am in 100% agreeing with the commissioner that we will get this done with the support of the unions. There's no Thank question you. in my mind. Thank you. And I would assume, again, maybe it's a silly question, but I would assume as with other issues uh, or other allocations, just because it's not in the budget doesn't mean we won't potentially move forward with it in the upcoming fiscal year. That will just come through a separate allocation. Um, through, through, through the chair, uh, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I look forward to that happening. Uh, Councillor Nolan, uh, you are, had a question that you haven't brought up already? No, I had uh, talked earlier. I don't think my hand was up. Okay. No, it wasn't up, but um, you have on your list of questions. Oh, you, I, I think they were, I, I mostly rolled them into, into. Great. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I do have some information on others. I might contact the commissioner later. I, I yeah, can talk later. I, I had a question, but Councillor Sabrina Wheeler's question pretty much covered it. But I realize there's another question, and that is, uh, Commissioner, in, in an average year, how many police officers retire? It must be three to six or something like that. Uh, two, well, through you and to you, uh, Mr. Chair. So this is what we are in uh, are well out of average years in normal times. So in a normal year, I look to have about anywhere from 10 to 15 officers a trip through uh, retire, retirement. We knew that 1988, 1989, 1990 were large classes um, in the you know, in for the Cambridge Police Department. I say that and I go back those years because that starts 32 years ago and that's when officers are, are meet, max out in uh, retirement uh, benefits. So we knew that we saw this large portion of our, our department eligible to leave and indicating that they would be leaving. So we, as I said earlier, we succession plan. So we tried to get, you know, enough officers in the academy in advance because think of it in terms of when an officer goes into the academy then we got the five and a half months of training then another 12 to 16 weeks of training here on the street before they even can you know, before we can even put them by themselves so that's how far off we are from replacing or that individual officer becoming a really viable officer on their own so we succession plan and the hiring freeze that was negotiated uh, last year was, you know, irrespective of our actual needs. So, you know, it, it was one of the negative consequences of that. Well, thank you uh, for coming. Unless I see another hand go up, um, I'm going to move, move the, budget. Move the budget. And I don't see one. So formally, I'll say, I move to forward the department's budget section to the full council with a favorable recommendation. I'm just gonna state it again for the record. Uh, the motion is to move the police department's budget to the full city council with a favorable, rec favorable recommendation. Vice Mayor Mellon. Yes. Yes, Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Councilor Nolan. Oh, sorry, yes. Yes, Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. No. No, Councilor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councilor Zondervan. No. No, Mayor Siddiqui. Mayor Siddiqui. Absent, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Yes, the motion passes, six in favor, two against, and one absent. Thank you. Um, the next area 
of discussion is traffic, parking, and transportation. Um, and the first question submitted to us is from the Vice Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My internet is a little bit unstable right now, so I'm hoping that I can get through these questions uh, to Mr. Barr and to the city manager. Um, I just had a quick question on some open positions. So there are two open positions under engineering project manager dash bike lanes. I'm just curious what these new positions are for, if they are to help comply with the cycling safety ordinance, if traffic parking and um, transportation can describe the roles and responsibilities of these two new hires, uh, that would be appreciated. Sure. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Mallon and through you, um, Councilor Carlone, uh, I'll just, before I answer, I'll just um, mention that I'm joined today by um, uh, a couple of my, a few of my staff, uh, Stephanie McAuliffe, who's our Assistant Director of Parking Management, uh, Brooke McKenna, who's the Assistant Director of Street Management, Patrick Baxter, our Engineering Manager, and Gardy Lawrence, who's our um, Financial Manager, as well as Handling Administration and Technology, so just wanted to introduce them. Um, the answer, the simple answer to your question is yes, uh, but I'll turn it over to Brooke to provide a little bit more details on the actual uh, duties and responsibilities. Great, thank you. Um, through you, uh, Councilor Chair, I'm not sure that's right. Um, so these two positions will be working on the separated bike lane projects to meet the requirements of the ordinance. Um, you know, this is, we'll be working at a much faster pace, a very accelerated pace than we have in the past. So having these two dedicated project managers will really help us keep multiple projects moving forward at the same time. Um, they'll perform a range of duties, including managing the public outreach, overseeing the consultants who help us with design, doing design work themselves, and um, helping with the collaboration across all of the departments who work on these projects, including TPT, CDD, DPW, the city manager's office. So they'll really be um, in charge of making sure that we're moving forward at the pace that we need to, to meet the requirements of the ordinance. And we're actually in the midst of the hiring process right now on these, and they should be in, on board in the next few months. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. McKenna um, anticipated my next question, which was when we would likely see these two positions come on board. I know that um, a lot of this work is coming up quickly. So I'm, I'm glad to see these two positions in the in the budget to support this initiative. I know it's an intense one. And um, Mr. Barr, thank you for introducing your team. I think one of the things that's miss been missing this year and last year too is um, gathering in the Sullivan Chamber and really getting to say hello um, to, to all the staff members and um, really seeing everybody face to face. So uh, thanks to your whole team for, for being here today and for, for your work over the last 15 months of the pandemic, I know I've said it before today, but it has not been an easy year for anybody. And um, I know you guys have all brought your best selves uh, to the city and to this work. So thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for answering that quick question. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilor Sabrina Wheeler, your question is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, there's a, a lot of things in this department that I could uh, pull and talk about and, and in general think uh, transportation department's doing a lot of great work. Uh, on things like transit signal priority, bike lanes, bus lanes. Um, I uh, just wanted to ask particularly about one uh, thing um, uh, and for the, the budget or potential budget. And that's uh, you know about uh, a little more than a year ago now, um, the city council passed a policy order on a fare free uh, bus pilot um, that was sponsored by Vice Mayor Mellon, uh, myself, Mayor Siddiqui uh, and passed by the council um, unanimously or near unanimously. Um, I understand, you know, there have been a lot of challenges with public transit during the pandemic and, and this past year, you know, in a lot of ways wasn't ideal for, for big new uh, public transit pieces, but uh, as we come out of the pandemic, um, I th do think it's going to be really critical to support uh, our buses and, and T and help make uh, it as easy as possible for people to take public transit. Um, in Boston, they are doing a, a fare free pilot. Um, there's a thousand free bus passes uh, being given to residents in five neighborhoods. Um, I know Boston has a larger budget and uh, more residents than we do, but um, it, 
continues to seem very possible in Cambridge, especially given our, our resources. Um, I know um, Cambridge is doing things to support public transit in other ways, but I, I think this is a, a key one to help people, um, encourage people to, to get on public transit so that when we uh, see people starting to go back to work, we don't see traffic come back you know, with a vengeance, which we're, we're already uh, going to see. Um, we need to, to find ways to, to help people and support people to take public transit. So I wanted to ask um, where we're at with that. Um, sure, uh, through uh, Councilor Carlone. Um, I guess uh, two two thoughts. One, um, you know, it's not something we've we've budgeted for specifically this year, just to be specific on the, the budget question. But I think it is something we are continuing to talk to the T about what the options are, and 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 certainly given I, they did read about the program in in Boston as well, and so I think it's something we should you know follow up on to figure out if there's some way to sort of build on that or or, or do something on our own. I think it's also um, important to say that, you know, the community development department whose budget hearing is a week from today is is very heavily involved in a lot of the sort of policy coordination with the T. Um, so I can certainly, um, not to say that they'll be able to get a conclusive answer in a week, but I can certainly pass the, the question uh, along to, um, you know, Rob Farouk and see if she's able to provide a little bit more information during next week's hearing if, 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 if it's available. But certainly we're continuing to pursue those types of initiatives. I don't have anything specific though to say that we can say, yes, we're absolutely doing this, but it's important. It's, it's you know, it's, it's important for us to hear that that's something that's a, that's a priority for you, so. Great. Thank you, and I'm uh, yeah happy to talk to this uh, about it with, with Ms. Farouk as well. Um, so I'll yield back. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I wrote um, a number of, of things, um, and just like the first two councillors, I thank you for a lot of great work on intersection changes. Um, it's pretty um, dramatic. The uh, the character of street traffic after you've redesigned with your team a number of intersections. My focus, as I wrote you, I think a week ago, is on the main drags, if you will, in neighborhoods. The straight roads appear to be wide and as far as drivers view, um, and where there tends to be speed. And yeah, I grant you it might be more than 85, less than the 85% that follow the rules of the road, but that one out of seven is where accidents come from. And I get each of the roads I mentioned, Garden, Linian, and Cardinal Maderos, people have said they will get neighborhood people to write letters demanding something be done. And I know you've heard back from You've heard from people in the past, and you have a budget, and you have to work within that budget. I get that, but it seems to me we got we need to start focusing on these roads where it looks like a speedway. The design of the road, not what you've done. It's it's engaging, and I see it on Linian, and I see it on Garden every day. And Cardinal, the reason I know Cardinal Maduro's is I visit people near there, and they complain of the same. So my question is, can we set a policy for where we're heading on roads? Last time we talked about this in council, you talked about the appearance of the width of the lane. Um, you know, that's just paint. And we talked about ex extended walkway uh, bump outs, um, and you've done it in other areas working with community development. So my question is, where on your master list are these roads uh, as far as reconstruction? I know you don't have an unlimited budget. That's my next question to you and the manager. But is that even on the list, these roads? Um, sure. Um, so it's it's a complicated set of issues to address and figure out how to pursue safety improvements in all these roads. Um, you know, whether we, I mean, a lot of what we do is through the DPW five-year plan for streets and sidewalks, um, which really defines, you know, the priorities for where streets will be fully reconstructed or have significant capital work, um, along with the sort of city's traffic calming program. I think we are trying to, sort of to your, to your point to, 
add additional measures where we can um, on streets that don't um, fall into that list, uh, because I think we, we do recognize that, you know, there's, a, there, you know, although Cambridge is not a huge community, it has a, a lot of streets that need help, and we can't necessarily wait for the, um, the five-year plan to get to every street, you know, particularly given that we don't, in fact, have an unlimited budget, and, you know, this has been a very challenging budget year, um, given the, the reductions in, in parking revenue that have occurred, but I think, you know, we're looking at sort of more, you know, kind of building on what we've done with bike lanes is more sort of quick build or tactical improvements, everything from, you know, we, we responded at last uh, year to a couple of policy orders about, you know, just things like striping, like you mentioned, to narrow travel lanes um, and, and other measures to, to try to visually, you know, constrain the road. Uh, we're working on, um, you know, procuring uh, speed feedback signs, which have been shown to reduce um, you know, speeding on, on some of those types of streets. Uh, I think all the streets that you mentioned are, um, you know, good candidates for, for those types of interventions. Um, you know, I think Garden Street in particular is a street that's listed on the bicycle network plan to become uh, hopefully transitioning over time into more of a low speed, low volume street that's more comfortable for cyclists. And that's something that's been, you know, stated in the bike network plan for, for a while. Um, and so we're starting to think about how do you actually make those, make changes to those streets you know, with the with the input from local residents, with you know the appropriate um, outreach to you know kind of get to where they need to be to be safer, you know, for all users, including cyclists and pedestrians. So I think it's there's no I hate to sort of provide a somewhat you know rambling answer, but there's there's not really one size fits all solution to these streets. I think we have to look at each one. Um, you know, we are trying through our Vision Zero efforts to be more prioritizing you know, based on safety concerns and, you know, crash history, uh, which is obviously always something we take into consideration, but trying to sort of make that the one of our more, one of our decision-making factors in terms of where we deploy some of these me measures. Um, but we, you know, I think it's, it's good to hear, you know, where your concerns are and, and where concerns are from the, the rest of the community. And then we can definitely try to respond uh, to those. I, I think Linian Streets, which I know, obviously you're very familiar with because it's in your neighborhood, um, you know, it's a good example where, you know, there was a traffic calming project done there several years ago. I don't think looking back at it now, it's it's as necessarily as aggressive uh, set of treatments as we might want to implement now. Um, but it was, you know, the subject of community discussions and and some changes. Um, but again, you know, perhaps like, like you know, that would we would we would take a slightly more aggressive approach now to the traffic calming, although it's also important to, to recognize that, you know, we want to, we, do, we have to do all that in collaboration with the fire department and make sure that we're, you know, not negatively impacting their response time. So that's sometimes why the measures aren't as aggressive as we might otherwise want them to be. But, um, you know, I think, like I said, there's no one size fits all, but we are certainly committed to trying to address, you know, as many of these locations as, as, as quickly as possible. But as, you know, as we sort of talked about in the, the answer to uh, Vice Mayor Allen's question, we're also, you know, we're resource constrained, not just on the financial side, but also, you know, staff capacity and just the capacity of the community to, you know, accept the, the types of changes that you're, you know, alluding to that are very important, but also require, you know, the right level of outreach and engagement. Well, you're, you're going to get a lot of letters in the near future on this. And, um, and which leads me to my second point, uh, really abysmal, and again, I know you have to work with numbers, abysmal financing, traffic signal program for the year, 350,000, and I know each traffic signal, that's probably three traffic signals, if not less. In the city, Vision Zero, very important, 300,000, traffic calming, 250. Bicycle spot improvements, $25,000. That's not the lanes, that's pedestrian crossings. And bus stop improvements, 25000 This is not Cambridge. I know you know this. I know the manager knows this. This, it is, this is almost like a small town budget for those items. And... Um, we have the funds to do something. I listed new park construction. That was meant for another list. That's a mistake on my part. But looking at that, it's abysmal, the budget. I mean, 25000 for anything. 
You know what the market is. I know what the market is. Traffic calming, vision zero, and traffic signal is under a million dollars in a budget that's hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I'm bringing it up because this is growing in the city as a prime issue. And I even heard in East Cambridge where you're working on Gore Street with community development and DPW, people are complaining about what's happening now, even during construction. Not with the const con construction workers, but with traffic. And it, it's only going to get worse, and I greatly encourage you to increase these numbers to something that's much more plausible and therefore can be implemented in my lifetime, because at these numbers, these streets will not be. I mean, that's the reality. Um, and it's just terrible given the financial situation we're in. I realize we're in COVID, but these numbers are ridiculously low. So I, please, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, um, I mean, and obviously we, we always would like to have more resources, but I think it's important to recognize that that's, a, that's only one piece of the, the totality of where we you know, spend our transportation or spend money on transportation. You know, many of the improvements we make are funded you know, through the capital program for DVW through the five year plan, which, you know, includes tens of millions of dollars. And that's often how, you know, traffic calming improvements are made, how traffic signal improvements are made. So these are kind of additional funds to help supplement that or, or, or intervene when there's not another project going on. So I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to disagree. I just think it's important to recognize. Yeah, yeah but here's the thing. The In the next four to five to 10 years, Garden Street, Linnean Street, and Madero's, maybe not Madero's, but I'll include it now. These are the only funds, type of funds that are gonna go there. We certainly know it for the next five years. And you see what I mean? It's, it's abysmal given where the, this is the only money that goes toward those kinds of streets. I agree, River Street, Gore Street, I, I get that. But we have to look at the where there's speed, we have to look at it. And you know that one of our counselors' homes were was hit. Speed through an intersection. And um, I, I just think we have to more broadly look at it. It isn't just the big streets. It might be intersection by intersection over time. But boy, we have to do a lot more. It's a matter of time before somebody gets hurt. So I again, I said this within the context of the great work and the great team that you have. We're impressed by that, and it's by far the best team I've ever seen in my 40 years working for the city. Um, I just think budgetarily, we got to rev this up. This is insufficient. Uh, I will be not voting for this particular budget because of that. I hope that will change. Uh, you, Mr. Chair, can I just say, most of these are in capital. So I, I, I certainly wouldn't mind revisiting this when you have the capital committee, but a lot of these are not part of the operating budget. Uh, yes, I realize that, but this is how you get things done, unfortunately. And, and I, I might add, Mr. Chair, one of the things that we were trying to struggle in the development of this budget is the decrease in our normal parking fund revenues. Yeah. And, and clearly we've continued the traffic calming program from property taxes within the um, capital budget where frankly was funded from parking fund resources. So again, one of the things that we talked about earlier in the day was, you know, some of our revenues are anemic um, hopefully to recover. And I guess the, all these things you just mentioned are funded from parking fund revenues, which has taken a hit, um, but we've been able to fund them in some part with um, uh, other resources. But I would say that, uh, and, and the amounts there have been consistent uh, that we've fudged in the fact we can talk about it during capital, but uh, just to put that in context in terms of available parking fund resources. 
thank you for saying that. However, these numbers aren't that far off of a typical year. So we've been doing this pretty much on and on. A little different, but pretty much on and on. And I realize scopes have increased over time, and I appreciate that, but we got to focus on where people live and where their kids live more. And I, I, again, I give credit to this department for asking about 20 mile per hour zones in our neighborhoods. Um, that was a major victory for the city, but this is what helps implement that kind of program, these issues right here. So thank you. Um, let's see, there are two other counselors with questions. Um, so uh, Councillor Nolan followed by Councillor Zondervan. Thank you, uh, Chair Carlone, and thank you to Mr. Barr and your whole department and the city manager for working on a really, really difficult year. I was surprised to see the numbers of signs put up not being about triple from the prior years because there were so many things going on with the pickup delivery, with the shared streets experiment. Um, my question is that in the past we have discussed a possibility, and this gets to the question of the decline in revenues for parking. Um, how often do we revisit um, various parking meters? In the in the book, it talks about it being anywhere from one dollar to three dollars, depending on the location per hour, to increase that to be in line with, um, with with what would be more appropriate and maybe more in contention, depending on the area of the city with garages that are around. Is the first question that I have. Um, sure, through you, uh, Councilor Carlone. Um, we we look pretty much every year as we go through our, our budget process at the meter rates. Um, we have actually been planning to do an increase um, in uh, Central Square and Kendall Square to $1.50 an hour, um, which is what our rate is in Harvard Square. Uh, we've put that on hold just pending COVID because we felt that, you know, we didn't want to have that potential impact on, on local businesses. Um, but I think as the, you know, I would hope, um, you know, and I haven't spoken directly with the manager about this uh, in, in other than to just say that we're holding off for now, but at some point in the future, I think we would go back to implement um, that that increase, um, you know, once we feel like it's not gonna be the sort of, uh, you know, the last incremental impact we wanna have on local businesses. So that, that's certainly something that we look at every, every year. Um, I think there is some additional, you know, room to go up on that. Um, but again, we want to be sensitive to the, the impact on local businesses and, and not have it become sort of a source of contention with, with those groups. I mean, I think, you know, since my days of finance, I've probably talked about this two, three times a year uh, with every traffic director in terms of making sure we're getting the most volume we can get. However, during COVID, to be very honest, there were so many open spaces in with the timing. Right. We thought it was incorrect, but you know, we're facing a million dollar annual loss in parking fund. And we're eating up the fund balance. So we want to increase revenues where we can, but we also understand the impact of increasing revenues in the wrong spot could have a reverse effect. But it's a great question and it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. And we have delayed some permanent meter increases that we've talked about for a while. But I think, again, the discussion will be when we should revisit that. And I know David's been in this loop as well. And, and, and the other, to you, Matt, uh, Mr. Chair, the other thing to consider is while we might consider increasing meter fees, we are decreasing the number of meters we have in the city, which then has a, another impact on parking tickets that are written. So it, it's a complicated issue. It's not just raising fees, it's, it's losing meters and uh, losing ticket opportunities also. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's very hard. We really do want to support small businesses. And yet we also know the roads and the parking spots are often, if they're not in contention or at the, anywhere near the same level of some of the private garages in particular on Kendall, then, then there's a, a, a disconnect that is um, something that we, I'm, I'm glad to hear it's addressed. And again, given the decline in revenues, it's, it, it's something to look, to look at. The other question is another thing that we've raised in the past, and I understand it is um, sometimes difficult. I am someone who does own a car. I drive it around. I am thrilled to be able to have my resident permit, but in the past we had looked at, it's, it's an incredibly low fee for um, an annual permit of $25 in one question that had been raised in the past. I understand it's COVID and we might not want to increase, but a very simple, not complex form 
of a, all right, the real cost is $50 each, but if you're low income, just check this box and yours is $25. You know, it, eventually are we looking at that? Because that is something certainly for a number of people in the city, like myself, I'd be um, even happy uh, to pay $50, but honestly, I don't think I would do it if it was just a voluntary checkup, <laughs> but I would not, um, but I would certainly pay it if it was expected to be paid, if that makes sense. And I understand this also is complex. I am someone who believes for some people, $25 is a lot of money. We do not want to increase it for our low-income residents, and yet there should be a way to do this quite simply. I, I, I'll let Joe go into details, but from what we looked at so far, the, impl the implementation of trying to put a discount on this fee is going to be a lot of work. And, and I'm not just quite sure if the work is worth the revenue we were going to bring in. And obviously we've looked at increasing that, but again, like everything else is we want to protect small businesses. We, we also want to protect our residents who are facing some difficult times. So we're trying to find the right charge when we go up on all of these categories. So uh, this has been the year where probably financially the city probably needs to do it. However, based on what we know people are facing, businesses are facing, We've taken the other approach to say, let's hold off and have this discussion at a later date. But it's, it's certainly valid questions. Yeah, I guess the, the only thing I'd add, uh, Councilor Cullinan, to you is that, you know, we, we certainly heard um, loud and clear from the, from the council, you know, the desire that if we are going to propose something along these lines, whenever the timing for that is right, that it needs to include some form of means testing. Um, and, and as the manager said, there's some complexities to that. Um, although I think that, you know, we're, we're talking to some of our technology vendors to see if there's ways to simplify that. So I think if that's possible, then that could make sort of the, the process easier on our end and, and for our staff. So I think it's definitely in our minds. It's not something we're pursuing immediately. Uh, obviously, you know, as, as all the counselors know, we would need to come back to the council for approval of that, whether that's through the budget process or at some other time um, as an as a, as a ordinance amendment. Um, but it's certainly not not something that we've lost track of, but not something we're necessarily planning to pursue in the immediate short term for the reasons that the manager mentioned. Uh, thank you all through the chair, back to all of you. Thank you. And since my other questions were addressed and just reading through this part, part of the budget, I'm glad to see many of those, the bus pilot, the trying to really accelerate the way that buses travel through the city. Right now they're mostly empty, but I'm hoping they'll be very, very full and that those lanes will give them even more of an incentive for people to fill them up. I mean, my other questions were addressed in the in the narrative. I thank you. I yield. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Zondervan is next. Councillor Zondervan, it's yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I, I echo a lot of the comments and, and questions that have, that have come before, um, and and I appreciate the uh, the attention to the to the corner where I live, which is. Um, you know, because of COVID, I've been home a lot in the last year, and and it's it's like a daily uh, near miss, and and every once in a while there's an actual crash, and and a lot of it does have to do with with visibility and and speed, as Casa Carlon uh, mentioned. So, um, and and you know, like the chair, I really appreciate the the 20 mile per hour signs, um. But my question there is whether whether we are now done with that uh, process of installation. And I, I've noticed a couple of places where we still have conflicting signs where it says 12, 20 miles an hour, but then a few feet yards down the road, it says 25. So where are we in that in that process? I'm sure, uh, and thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, I'm actually gonna ask uh, uh, Brooke, to provide a quick update on the 20 mile an hour program. We are pretty much complete, um, but we are trying to address the, the issue that you that you mentioned. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we are, as Joe mentioned, pretty much done with the installation of the 20 mile, 20, 20 mile an hour signs. There may be some here and there that we need to make adjustments to, and we're in the process of doing that now. Um, and as part of that, we will be looking to catch all of those um, conflicting signs and, and remove the 25 mile an hour ones as well. Great, thank you. Um, my, my next question is um, around the, the parking re revenues and, and I feel like we do have this um, conversation almost, almost every budget cycle 
Um, and it, it really does feel like um, a perilous way to, to make a living, especially as we are, I mean, we should be eliminating parking as, as well, car storage, as I call it, um, as we move forward. So what what's the alternative revenue mechanism here that we could um, be be leveraging? Can we do uh, an excise tax where, where we get um, more revenues based on the value of the car you know are there, are there other ways that we can uh, raise revenues that that start to lessen our dependency on this um, car storage model that that needs to be retired um sure uh, through council carlone and I'm, I'm sure that david will have some additional thoughts on this but i, I would say we're definitely it's you know, aware of it as an issue it's an issue we've been talking about internally obviously COVID has made it challenging to sort of think you know, too far forward in terms of uh, revenue, but it's definitely something that, you know, Guardian and I have spoken about looking at, you know, maybe even doing a study of future revenue sources, you know, what's happening around the country in terms of this issue, because we're not the only city in the in the country or in the world that's facing the same challenge in terms of changes in, you know, revenue from the traditional sources for transportation. Um, so I think, you know, we, what well, one that we are hopeful for, although again, it has gone down just as much, if not more, than parking revenue is sort of TNC, um, you know, Uber, Lyft, um, you know, surcharges, and there was a proposal that was that was passed and then vetoed by the governor to um, increase those rates. Um, so hopefully, those will recover in the future as we recover from COVID. So, but so I think you know that that is one sort of specific transportation source. Um, but yeah, I, I obviously I can't speak to. You know things like excise tax and other sort of you know sources that I would assume require state approval. But I think we are we are very much aware of the issue, and and you know would would be are looking to come up with some proposals for how we might you know not just continue to increase our traditional sources of revenue, but actually look for for new sources of revenue that that might you know be more sustainable in the future. Um, so you, Mr. Chair, I, I again I think Joe said it. Any alternative revenue sources that require um, legislation would have to be done at the state level. And typically um, those kind of conversations would mean statewide uh, initiation as opposed to just Cambridge specific, which is difficult to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the day, we benefit from the fact that the parking fund generates $20 million of revenue. That's a lot of money. Um, obviously to replace that um, would have to come from other sources and might have to come from property taxes if we didn't have the parking fund revenue to use. Um, so again, I think the new normal is that the parking fund revenue generation uh, probably will not bounce back as quick as we think until there's um, some increase in um, the activity that happens in various squares and the like. So, um, which then has a whole spiral effect in terms of meals tax and hotel motel tax and et cetera. So um, I think we've been privileged in, uh, in the way that we've been able to have non-property tax revenues, but this is one that uh, has taken a hit and we've compensated for it in the FY22 budget, but other revenue sources are not as easily replaced or I should say the parking fund isn't easily replaced without, without remedies at the state level. So. I mean, I would, I would also follow up that I do want to continue to say that the parking fund is self-sufficient. Uh, what we've been able to do is take related expenses in other departments and offset that. Those days are going to be fewer and far between. So the operation of the traffic and parking fund is still enough revenue for that. It's the money we distributed to other departments that we could attribute to traffic and parking revenue that is one that's been hit in this year here that has been substituted by property taxes. So uh, we've got some work to do, but uh, it, it, I just want to do bring home that right now the budget, what we bring in in revenue does is self-sufficient. It's the additional use that we had for parking related states that are taking the blow. And at this point, what we've been able to do is increase our taxes to support that. Well, thank you for your comments. My feeling is nothing is more important than safety and especially in neighborhoods where there are children. I know you agree, I'm not questioning that. And that if anything needs to be reduced, it's not safety. Um, 
that, and I'm, I was just trying to make an observation of something that I understand why the numbers are low, but this, those are not the numbers that should be low. And I just wanted to call that out um, so that we can discuss it further. And thank you for your comments. And once again, Mr. Barr, thank you for your department's work. Um, it's very noticeable, and we thank you for that. So, um, okay. please. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, counselors, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I appreciate that discussion we just had. Um, I wanted to ask about the shared streets. I know that. You know, when we did the pilot and, and there were some issues with that and, and um, the um, Mr. Barr said that we would be trying some other approaches in, in more more on the residential streets and particularly in Eastern Cambridge I'm, I'm eager to see that move forward so I, I'm just asking whether any of that's contemplated in this budget and, and what that might look like um, to you, uh, Councilor Carlone. So the um, we not we don't have anything specific in terms of saying we're going to do this or do that. But from a budgetary perspective, um, the uh, you know we were able to do the shared streets program last year, and, and I think we anything we would want to do this year, we were able to do out of sort of our normal operating budget um, and using um, you know sort of existing staff. It was a bit of a stretch, and that was part of the challenge of it, particularly in the midst of. Of COVID, but um, so I think if we if we if it did make sense for us to do additional, you know, shared streets um, or or something different, um, you know, in East Cambridge, then I, I don't think it's something we needed to provide additional budget for because it, it can sort of fit in within our existing, you know, operating budget uh, allocations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor, and for the question. So. Um, just keep the process going. I'll move to forward the department's budget section to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Again, just for the record, the motion is to move the traffic and to traffic parking and transportation department budget to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Vice Mayor Mellon. Yes. Yes. Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes. Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes. Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. No. No, Mayor Siddiqui. Absent, Councillor Carlone. No. No. Motion passes, six in favor, two against, and one absent. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So we have uh, we had listed five more discussions, but the clerk notified me that budget policy related to financial summary and investment policy is actually on May 18th. So we have a whole week to prepare for that. So the remaining four are information technology, employee benefits, electrical department, and the clerk um, office. So the first is information technology that was pulled by Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Councillor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, last year when we were discussing the budget, we used this section to talk about municipal broadband. Uh, I think that was Councillor McGovern's idea, but it might've been someone else's. Um, you know, we could definitely handle it in other areas. And it's sort of not a reflection on the IT department itself as wanting to see this in the budget. Um, um, you know, last year the council had voted to give the IT budget a negative recommendation because there wasn't funding for municipal broadband in the, the FY21 budget. Um, there was then funding added for a feasibility study. Um, I'd hoped last year we'd have the results of that study by now. Um, I know the RFP has gone out and that Councillor Nolan uh, and others have put a lot of work uh, into it and the, the issues that there are with it. Um, but there is not new funding from my understanding for municipal broadband in this budget. Uh, there's some funding for digital equity, which is good, but it's, it's not the same thing as a municipal broadband network. Um, and the pandemic has really highlighted the need uh, for this. It's harder to do work. It's harder to stay connected with friends and family, harder to talk to your doctor if you don't have a reliable broadband connection. 
Um, and the Wi-Fi hotspots that we've done uh, are a great help, but they aren't a substitute for this. Um, so, I mean, I would make that, that motion to send this with a negative recommendation again. Of course, happy to, to have other counselors um, speak on this as well. Uh, Council, there's no money in because we got an RFP out and we're waiting to see what the cost is going to be. So as we said we were going to do, we have followed exactly what we said we were going to do with when this budget was held hostage last year. Pat and Lee have done a phenomenal job getting us to this point. Once we get that number, as we've done with everything else, we will come back with a request for an appropriation. But we have committed to this. We are working on this. And I don't know why it's been so hard to convince the council that the work Pat and Lee have done has been exceptional and that we are moving it forward with this, but we don't have a bid yet. So once we get that, we will move forward with it. So I don't see how holding this budget hostage when you won't get a number before the budget is adopted is the way to go. But I, I think I'd like to get Pat and Lee at least have the opportunity to speak what we've done to help convince people that we are taking this incredibly serious. Mr. Chair, if I could respond briefly. Please. I just, um, yeah, I wanted to note that the saying that taking the Boston ho budget hostage sort of implies that the council doesn't have to approve the budget. The charter is, is very clear that the council does have to approve the budget. This is completely within our authority. So, you know, I appreciate that there are, are dissenting opinions on this, but let's be, be clear about what the role of the council is here. We have every right to, to demand this and request this. Um, so, you know, I'm sending this with a negative recommendation does not have direct implications on this. It's a way of registering dissent with the budget that we haven't moved as fast on this as I think residents are demanding we are. And I think it's you know perfectly within reason. I'm happy to, to hear from other members of the staff, but um, you know I don't think this is a, a crazy uh, suggestion. So I'll yield back. Well, uh, with that, Councillor Co-Chair Simmons raised her hand first, followed by Councillor Zondervan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just quickly, um, over the past few years, there's been persistent issues with regards to the city's audiovisual services when broadcasting city meetings, and both internally in the Selwyn Chamber and externally, such as, such as choppy video, audio issues, broad, broadcast cutting out. Are there plans to address these issues in the F-22 budget? And I, this is particularly important depending on what we decide to do uh, around continuing the Zoom meetings. I know that's sort of up in the air. Can we legally do it once there's no pandemic restrictions? But assuming that we can, the audio has to be better in here. So I'm just curious, through you, Mr. Chair, to the city manager or other appropriate individual, um, what what are we doing around the poor, you know, from a fiscal perspective, what are we doing about the poor quality of communication that comes into the chamber, in and out of the chamber? Hey, Pat. Yes, um, uh, through you, uh, Chair Carlone, um, to Councillor Simmons. Um, we are in the process of making a number of improvements to the audiovisual equipment in the chamber and elsewhere in the city. Um, there actually have been some recent upgrades in some of the hardware. Um, I won't get into a lot of detail, but um, there, are, uh, there are encoders that are used to stream the meetings. Uh, that have been upgraded. Excuse uh, me, Mr. Chair. What did you, I, there are something, there's a word that you said I could not quite understand. There are homers? Toners. I oh, uh, apologies, uh, encoders? Encoders. Yes, yes okay. sorry. Thank you. I, 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 sorry, I don't mean to get into too much. Of no, the it's the quality of the sound. <laughs> okay, yes. So, um, so yes, we recognize there are some improvements to be made and, uh, and we are working on those. I should also just add that I have um, the IT department assistant directors, Mike Dugas and Eric Belford with me today in case we do wanna get into more uh, details in any of these areas. Um, but um, suffice to say, we have budgeted for some of those improvements and uh, we're continuing to, to make those. Uh, uh, thank you. One other question. Um, so we'll, the council will wait to hear back from, from you, particularly if we take up this idea of continuing some remote access uh, for the council and for people's participation. The only other question they wanted to um, 
turn my turn my attention to, and this may be a more of a city manager question, I'm not sure. Um, so we talk a lot about municipal broadband, and I know we talk about it in the context of it being the be all and the end all. And what I mean by that is, yes, it is important, and yes, we want to have as wide as possible ability for people to use technology in a reliable, incredible way. And I know we do also have CT, C, City View 22, um, but even that requires basic cable. And are we exploring any ways, um, like local radio stations, to be able to push our, our meetings out so that people that can't watch or don't watch, I mean, there are a few people out there in the world that don't have TVs um, or don't are not uh, totally technology driven um, and um, certain kinds of radio abilities are free of charge. And I just wanted to know in terms of being able to use our dollars to reach people in the broadest sense possible, do we have we thought given any thought to that at all? Um, through the chair, uh, Councillor Simmons, um, we have given a lot of thought about the different ways in which we uh, reach residents um, online and through cable. Um, I have not heard of any discussion about radio as an alternative. Um, so that, that would be something to, to investigate. At the moment, we've been looking at, um, at, at, again, ways to see and participate on the web as has been true, particularly during COVID, but also previously, um, and uh, as well as cable. Uh, thank you. I, I would hope, and maybe this is more of a policy order directed to get more information about that as one of the many ways we reach out to people so that they can at least listen or, and passively participate in our meetings by being able to listen to see what goes on. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield the floor. Thank you both. Councilor Zondervan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to um, support my colleague and, and give a slightly different reason um, why I'll be voting um, against this budget and, and certainly not um, any, um, you know, disrespect or, or negative feelings towards the IT department. I think they do a great job. Um, it's just simply that this is where the council is chosen to take a stand on municipal broadband. So um, in, in support of that, I will be voting no. But while, while I do appreciate the, um, the municipal broadband feasibility study um, RFP, and, and I've read it uh, thoroughly and carefully, um, to me, it, it doesn't quite address the, the ask that we made because it, it really frames the question more broadly than than just municipal broadband it, it um, is really looking at you know how can we provide digital equity how can we provide competition and how does municipal broadband fit into that as a possible solution and and i understand um you know i think i understand why um it was framed that way but but from my point of view what what we want is a feasibility study that says is it feasible or not for us to build out a municipal broadband network? And, and these other questions, um, in my mind, don't really belong in that feasibility study. Um, now, I, I'm still hopeful that we would get proposals that, that do um, offer to do that part of the study that, that would really look at, can, can we do a municipal broadband build out or not um but but again the way the rfp reads to me it doesn't just ask that question and, and that's really the question we're looking to get an answer to and, and just anecdotally you know over the weekend we had a, a large section of of the city um you know comcast was was knocked out and there were a number of trucks working on hampshire street uh, that i that i noticed um and you know there was really no um, consideration for for us as as residents who increasingly depend on this infrastructure 
uh, in order to, to, you know, go through our lives. And so that's why it's, it's really so important to consider municipal broadband uh, solution because it's, it's the equivalent in the 21st century of our road network. You know, we, we just need it to be there and to be reliable and to function uh, so that we can, can use it uh, at all times and not be dependent on the whims of, of for-profit corporations that may decide that, you know, for, for their profits, they might knock out the network for a bit. And uh, too bad if that inconvenience the rest of us, um, let alone the fact that, you know, even when it is operating, uh, the quality is, is quite low compared to what is possible and in, in what we see in other uh, parts of the world or, or even the country. So, um, again, I, I do look forward to the responses to the RFP, but um, I, I do want to note that, that what we're looking for, what I'm looking for, is really the, the specific feasibility of a municipal broadband build out. Um. So I don't know if it'd be helpful through the chair to speak a little bit about broadband. I don't know that there were any um, specific questions, um, but I, I would like to try to uh, address some of these issues. Um, as the council knows, I was just a couple of weeks into the job last year at this time uh, when this issue was raised. However, my prior affiliation with the city was serving on the broadband task force. I've actually currently serve on two other broadband task forces. I've worked on municipal broadband in two different countries, three different countries. Um, I don't know that you could find someone who's more passionate about municipal broadband than me. Um, and that also goes for digital equity. And those things are tightly related, but they are not exactly the same. Um, if we think for a moment about digital equity, connectivity is one so-called leg of the stool. There's also devices, there are skills, there are that sort of thing. And our, uh, the, the city's digital equity study, I think did a great job to shed light on that. But in terms of municipal broadband, I, I think it would have been irresponsible to look at uh, a connectivity model and solution without calling out the digital equity problem. That is to say the connectivity portion in our city. And, and I will just say as a broadband task force member all those years ago, when we had community meetings, when we uh, got together with experts and uh, talked through the city, it was quite clear digital equity or the digital divide as it was referred to then was the priority of the city. And I think it is still today. These things are not in conflict. I, I won't speak directly to the RFP because it is on the street. I think I understand we've had great feedback. There's a lot of concern more about what will the response be? And I just wonder if that's a little premature to see what we get. The, the RFP clearly does cover municipal broadband in, in my view, as well as digital equity. I can't speak to the years uh, that this has been an issue in the city entirely, but I can speak to the year I've been with the city. And I, I understand frustration that that RFP didn't go out right away. But I, I also believe firmly that it needed to be informed by that digital equity study. It needed to be informed by the work we were doing. Um, and folks within my department, uh, within purchasing, uh, within Lee Gianetti's department, uh, worked very hard to try to pull together what is a very complex um, equation in terms of what sort of municipal broadband solution, what sort of approaches to digital equity can work for the city. So, you know, I will say that um, I'm sometimes surprised. I feel that um, we're mostly in furious agreement about these priorities, and yet it feels often like there's some disagreement. And, and I, I understand there are many approaches to any procurement or RFP, particularly one as complex as this, but it does seem to me we are doing um, what um, has been asked for by the, by the public and the council and um, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that we can achieve something um, that may not feel perfect to everyone, but is going in exactly the direction uh, that most of us want to go in. So I'll just stop there. Thank you and uh, to the chair, thank you for that answer. And, and uh, I do agree that the RFP covers municipal broadband and I guess the, the concern and, and, you know, by the way, we've heard extensively from Upgrade Cambridge, which um, 
really was founded to concern itself with this question, and and, and they are um, of the opinion as well that um, the problem isn't that it doesn't cover musical broadband. The problem is that it is is broader than musical broadband, and it covers all these other issues. And and I agree that digital equity is, is incredibly important, and I appreciate the city's efforts on that. But I do think they are separate. They're of course also connected, but but separately we need to just continue to address those problems and, and we don't necessarily need a feasibility study for that. Um, whereas for municipal broadband, <coughs> we clearly need to understand whether or not that is a feasible thing for us to, to build out. And, and that's really the question that we're asking. So we're not asking, you know, is it feasible for us to, to solve or provide for digital equity? We're, we're saying we want to just do that. Like, you know, take care of that problem and then separately but at the same time let's understand if we can do municipal broadband because we believe that's a better solution and ultimately needs to happen so i think that's where this agreement is coming from and, and again i appreciate uh, the response and, and the work that's gone into it and and certainly acknowledge uh mr mccormick's expertise and and i do hope that that we ultimately, despite you know some of the rough patches, will get to to where we're all trying to go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor and Mr. McCormick, for um, educating us a little further. Um, the next speaker is Nolan is first. Sorry, I had it the other way around. Councillor Nolan is next, followed by Councillor McGovern, and then I believe then the Vice Mayor. Thank you, Chair Carlon, and thank you to um, Mr. McCormick, to Mr. Gianetti and the city for moving this forward. It, this is a really difficult issue and topic because we're all frustrated. Um, this has taken a lot longer than any of us expected. And while I understand it, it's also really, really hard because even the digital equity study, yes, could we come up with 10 reasons why it's legitimate we was delayed more than a year? Yes, on the other hand, it was, which meant it wasn't ready. And could we understand therefore why the RFP, which was supposed to be drafted last summer and out by September wasn't even put out until April? Can we understand it? Yes, but it, it, it constantly puts us in a very difficult situation. And while I understand it, it's just still, it, it, it doesn't make it any less frustrating. And it would be really good if we had, in, could in the future avoid this by really understanding this was a, such a huge priority for the entire council that we actually took a stand on the budget last year. And so that makes it particularly challenging to, to you know, I don't want to be critical on this, but I, I need to be critical because it's put us now in this situation where we're really frustrated. Yes, um, as Mr. McCormick said, we were this RFP, what you said was it, it does what we were asked to do by the public and the council. And yet we're hearing from the public in Upgrade Cambridge who has hundreds and hundreds of people who, while they may not, I do think they represent a majority of people in the city have said this really doesn't meet the mark. Um, we just, for the council's benefit, um, uh, both the mayor and particularly the vice mayor and I had had several different meetings over the course of, of starting I think last August about this and really pushing forward. And we had one recently after the RFP was out and expressed some of the frustration. And I, you know, we have been asked by many people who know far more about this and are very technically expert, including people like Mr. McCormick who have done studies and very familiar with broadband networks that this is somewhat confusing and muddled and doesn't actually do what we asked for, which is a very clear ironclad kind of study that says, all right, you want to know if you should do municipal broadband. Here's four different options. We're not going to recommend any. We're just going to lay them out and tell you the, the feasibility in the form of what it would take and what it would cost. And then you all decide. And, and that's what doesn't seem to be, again, from people who have read this RFP, that that will be coming out of this. And I also agree that yes, digital equity is uh, obviously very important, but it, the digital equity study laid out most of the work, uh, most of the recommendations in that study are totally separate from this. We can, we can and we will move forward on addressing those, but we really do need to understand where we're going with uh, this study. One of the things that we had wondered once this was out, I, I really wish we had had more input into this. I know 
there's laws around purchasing, but I also know there's, you can always bring in people uh, to be involved in a process. You can do it under a legal banner. And I just, I, I'm frustrated that that uh, didn't happen here enough. So now we're faced with something that that is really troubling for those of us who, who have a clear sense that what we do want is a sense of municipal broadband, not just options for citywide service, an option for municipal, uh, a, a core principle of municipal broadband. We also know that since there had been some concern about confusion, do we have a sense of what the questions were and where we're going and how quickly we can make sure that we address some of the concerns that we and many people who are experts in this, I reached out to a couple different experts who know about this and they read the RFP and said, this is really confusing what the city even wants. So I think the question is, are, do I, we, we also were, were, I believe the vice mayor can correct me if we were told there would be questions and that that would give us a lot of information about how this was being interpreted and what kinds of people, um, what kinds of questions that possible respondents said would, would give us a sense of whether this was actually going to get us to where we are. But I haven't heard a report on that, which would have been nice to have if, the, if, if that question period has concluded. Um, sorry, so the, the question uh, through you, uh, Chairman Carlone, um, is about questions in response to the RFP. Right, we had discussed that at our meeting and you had said, let's wait until then because that will tell us a lot about how people are viewing this is my uh, recollection of that meeting uh, is my notes. Um, I, I didn't say that, but it might have come up. I, I think uh, the purchasing director, Liz Unger, is, is here and might want to, if she is available, address the question of questions, so to speak. Because those are public, right? The questions become a matter of public record, so. Oh, um, I will allow the speaker to speak, but again, this is a budget hearing. I know this is a big issue. It's a big issue for me, but my goal is to run a budget hearing. So if you would like one of your people to talk a little bit about it, that's fine, but let's get back onto the budget in a moment. So through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the question period has ended on the RFP. The answers to those questions will be posted via addendum as uh, instructed and laid out in the RFP um, so that all potential proposers will have an opportunity to see those answers. I would just caution uh, what we discuss here in detail about the RFP itself so as to not taint the open and competitive process and put information out there that some potential proposers may not be aware is available to them now via uh, this particular hearing. Uh, that would be my one caution and concern that to not taint the process itself. Yeah, I would think we should take that caution and concern very seriously because it could have major ramifications. And I know often the council doesn't always feel the advice they're given by city staff is the way to go, but I would hope in this matter, based on all the time and effort we've put into this, that they recognize that the purchasing agent has a very strong opinion on this one. Well, it, if we can't answer some of the questions about the IT department and the, the concerns about RFP, it would, I hope, and I, I hope Mr. Gianetti and Ms. McCormick and I have also spoken directly with the city manager about, again, what we're all hearing about concerns about, about this critically important um, process. But uh, if that ends the discussion, that ends the discussion. Uh, Councillor, we could hardly hear you. Um, could you just summarize what your last statement was? Yeah. I. I I understand we've all been working on this really, really hard. And if if we can't then move forward on understanding uh, that question I asked, I um, I hope, and Mr. McCormick and the city manager and Mr. Giannetti do know my concerns. I have been transparent about them, expressing them over the last few weeks since this came about and certainly over the last few months, because this is, it, it's a utility. We need to do it and we need to basically have this in place as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Mallon, you're next. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, I just wanted to echo some of what my colleagues said that this doesn't, the RFP as put out does not 
ask the questions that we asked, which was, how much would this cost for us to implement municipal broadband in the city of Cambridge with a few different options of what that would look like, whether that was a full expansion, partial expansion, et cetera. Um, and I understand that the digital equity piece that there is, a, it is a three-legged stool and, you know, the hard devices and the skills are definitely something that was covered in the digital equity study with specific recommendations. The RFP is out. It's in the middle of the process as Ms. Unger just stated. We can't talk about it here um, to keep the process um, moving forward and, and not taint it. But I, could, I also am frustrated that the RFP went out without any input from, from any of us, even looking at it. Um, I understand Upgrade Cambridge was not asked to participate in, in formulating the RFP and we had a long conversation with, about that. My question is now, what happens once those responses come back for the RFP? How does the council in any way participate in the responses from the respondents to try to figure out how to move forward? Because I think what you're hearing is everyone is not crazy about the RFP the way it went out. I would hate for the RFP respondents to come back. We choose somebody and it's going off in a direction that again, we don't want, that we are not gonna feel comfortable with. We're not gonna get what we asked for, which I think is going back years, right? Like there was a study that said that it was gonna be hundreds of million dollars to, to implement municipal broadband. The question really is, is that, is that right? And if so, are we gonna make that choice? I don't know that we're gonna find that out coming back with the RFP that we've put out, which does seem to just ask for an array of options, which we have never discussed here at the council. So I guess my real question as it relates to the budget is we are going to be spending money on this, this service, right? We put a, a request for proposals. We're gonna be paying a consultant to do this in terms of the budget, how is the council going to be participating in those responses and picking a respondent? My guess is we are not, but that's my question. You are not, that's not the role of the city council. I don't know who wants to hear that. Obviously our intent is to meet the guidelines of what the city council asked us to do. I am confident that Pat and Lee have sent on is on that objective to do that. I think, let us get the RFP, let's see where we're at and let's really decide where we're missing this because I think based on Pat's experience and what he has stated, I think he knows what the council wants. I don't, I know there was no intention not to give the council what they want. So why don't we wait and see where we end up with this. But the whole point here was to get to where the council wanted and I'm still not sure that's not the case. And I'm not sure why council feels so strongly that it isn't because I don't think Pat and Lee feel that way. And I would hope we could come to a conclusion, but I don't, I don't know what else to say other than I thought we would be on this point and I have confidence in the team that we put together to put this in it, that will address the concerns the council had. And I don't know if Pat and Lee want to add anything. Can I just respond, Mr. Chair? Please. I think, Mr. Manager, what you're hearing is from the majority of the members who have spoken already is that this RFP is not what we wanted. And it does not address the concerns that we had raised in a, uh, over the past, especially over the past year. So if there is no way for the council, as you said, that is not the role of the city council to review RFPs and to pick a vendor, our only choice, our only piece of this is like putting forth what we want so that the RFP can be written in a way that we end up with an outcome that we have envisioned. But now we're at a place where that horse has left the barn. So I'm just trying to figure out at this point what we can do. It, so, I guess I don't think Pat and Lee feel that's the case and, and I don't want to speak for them, but I, I think we have to have that discussion, but I, I don't know what else to do other than Pat. Do you want to try to answer why? Could, sure. Such a different could I just, this is uh, Councillor Carlong. Could I just add something? 
Yep. In my business, architecture, urban design, I get requests for a proposal. I used to all the time. And on occasion, I would get an addendum that said, change the scope, add this, whatever it was. Um, is that possible or are we beyond that point in your schedule? Liz, Pat. Uh, if it's appropriate through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we are not beyond <clears throat> that point in time yet. Um, I would say that for a matter of best practices, one should give uh, the least minimum 48 hours to issue an addendum uh, and give potential respondents an opportunity to incorporate whatever is included in that addendum in mm -hmm. that final proposal. Depending on the complications involved, however, with the addendum, um, more than that best practice time may be warranted. And I would certainly defer to Patrick and Lee on that particular element. Yes, I guess I, I would just add, and I think it, it is challenging to discuss this without um, getting getting into the specifics and potentially compromising the process. So um, I would say that um, I don't think there's complete agreement on um, how the RFP has been characterized. I, I think it does remain to be seen how the responses will be in terms of the specificity. Um, but, you know, if it's a matter of taking it uh, to, to look at an addendum, I suppose we can we can do that. I, I will say that um, I don't know that the council has heard this, but there has been a lot of positive response uh, to the RFP as well. Um, you know, and I, I'll I'll just read something because this is copied to a dozen people. It was from Upgrade Cambridge, and the last line was while well, it was pointing out some some uh, differences of opinion. The last line was, anyway, there's a lot of good work in the RFP, and I thank you and those on your team who contributed to it. It advances the effort in important ways, and that's truly important. That was sent to a large group of stakeholders around the city, nonprofits uh, from Upgrade Cambridge, and, and uh, as we were sharing um, the RFP as well as the digital equity study. So I, I just wanted to make sure that people understand there's there's quite a bit of commonality, even as we look at some, you know, very legitimate questions around the, the margins of how exactly this sort of thing is done. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Mr. Chair, do you mind if I add a comment? Please do, Lee. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the, the discussion and, you know, I do want to acknowledge uh, the council frustration that some of you had that have articulated, you know, something that has really stuck with me, and I know I've mentioned this before, one of the members of the broadband task force had always mentioned that, you know, we, do, we don't have an engineering problem, we have a goal problem. You know, when we talk about municipal broadband, there are many different systems that you can build, but it's not a one size fits all. At the end of it, you still need to articulate what goals are you trying to do with a municipal system? Does that mean you're going full fiber to the home or does that mean you're just doing a backbone? There are many different iterations and something that, and I think is what may be causing some of the, the angst with this is we have intentionally prioritized as and calling out digital equity as one of the key goals that we want to solve. If we're going to be exploring a municipal broadband system, Pat and I feel very strongly, and I think it's based on council orders that have been passed, both related to do a municipal broadband, but the policy orders that you pass related to digital equity and the goals, is that digital equity should be front and center in building a system. You'd, I don't think we wanna go through and explore how we could potentially build a municipal system and then back in, how could this help our equity goals? I think we start with equity and that's where we're trying to come from. And we don't have any preconceived notions about what that type of system should look at. And that's what we're really trying to get. So I think that is important. And that may not be the approach that I'm hearing that the council wants us to prioritize equity upfront in terms of the municipal broadband. And if we missed that aspect, 
Um, I'm sorry for that, but I think if you really read through the RFP one more time, you will see it is looking for municipal broadband options. It, it is in there, but we were very intentional about making sure that we were clear that digital equity was the first part that we really want to start with and have from a framing and then move out from there. So I, I feel strongly about that. And I just really want to get out that if that is not the intent or the council's wish for us to really have that strong focus on equity, um, then I apologize for completely missing that. Well, I'm going, uh, we have other counselors who wish to speak and uninten unintentionally I overlooked Councillor McGovern and I apologize, Councillor, you have the floor. Mr. Chair, given all you've dealt with today, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I am, I am really torn on this. Um, and you know, last year, and I and Councilor Sabrina Wheeler mentioned that I, I'm not sure it was I was the one that suggested not voting the IT budget. Maybe I was, but I did vote against it at the time, which is the first time I've ever done such a thing. And the reason I did it was because I felt we needed to send a strong message that we needed this process to move forward. And Mr. McCormick, you are correct. It, this predates you by many years. Um, and I guess before, and I'd like to hear from Councillor Sabrina Wheeler, who, who mentioned, you know, who wants to recommend, um, you know, not moving this forward favorably. I want to, I'm not sure what doing that accomplishes this time. Um, I think last time it was important and I felt strongly about doing it. Um, I'm not sure what we get out of it this time though. And what I don't wanna do is delay things any longer. And and with and through you, Mr. Mr. Chair to the manager, you know, again, I, I don't you and I've talked about this. Um, you know, I get accused of being too easy on the city, but I think for the most part, the city does things really well. When I don't think the city does something well, I say it, and I don't think we did it well. Um, I don't understand why this took so long. Other RFPs get out much faster and they're complicated. And I'm not even talking about within the last year. I'm talking two plus years. I mean, Councillor Nolan's been, you know, most recently, you know, leading this charge, but we've been talking about this before she was even on the on the council. And, you know, to say that, you know, the city has, you know, made this a priority and put this forward, I, I, I don't see it. But we're here. Um, you know, it, I'm further frustrated <laughs> that just a few weeks ago, maybe even less than that, on the news, we see that Salem, Massachusetts is moving forward with installing fiber through a private company that is gonna take two and a half years to install at no cost to the city because of the arrangement they made. Salem, Mass is or Salem, Massachusetts is 18 square miles compared to, to us. We're far more dense, but we don't, they're larger. And they took, you know, less than a year to put out an RFP, make an agreement, and they're going to get shovels in the ground. And here we are several years into the process and we have an IEP or an RFP that people don't, is maybe not going to get us any closer to really where we want to be. And so, you know, look, sure, we can vote the IT budget down. Again, I don't know what that does. It, you know, if we voted down in the final vote, we revert back, I believe, to the current budget, which would eliminate any increases or things. I, mean, I don't know what that actually does, right? We send a message, but I don't know what it actually does and if it's actually gonna be helpful. So I, I don't know, I'm still struggling with this as we talk about it. But I do agree with my colleagues that what I was hoping for was an RFP that talked about different options for municipal broadband and whether or not 
it made sense for the city or what were those op- what could those options be so we can then debate is it to do something like Salem is doing is it to do something you know different um I'm not sure we're going to get that out of this RFP. And I, I agree with Mr. Uh, with Lee about, um, you know, he, you know, he, had, he, he had said in his earlier comments about, um, you know, that the, that the council, you know, that the council had asked for different options. I said like, that he's right, but I don't think we're getting it. And I think, and whether there should have been two separate RFPs or two separate Mr. McCormick is right, and as other people have said, digital equity and municipal broadband are clearly linked in some ways, but not in all ways. And I don't know if we only wanted to do digital equity, would could we reach some sort of agreement with Comcast that says, you know, we'll pay for everybody in below a certain income level to have internet service? I don't know, maybe that's a solution. That's different than what we're talking about with municipal broadband. And so, I, you know, I, 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 I think I don't know what voting down the RIT budget actually gets us. And I'd like to hear Councilor Sabrina Wheeler's goals in doing that. Like, what's the point? Right. Where does that hope to get us? Is the hope to bring the RFP back and redo it? Is the and that, again, that's not even our decision. That's the city manager's decision. What what is it? that What's the you know, where are we trying to get to? But I would be remiss if I didn't express my displeasure with where we are with this a year later, you know, the RFP just came out uh, almost 10 months after we voted down the IT budget last time. Uh, so I'm just very disappointed in this one. I am. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy about a lot of other things, but this isn't one of them. And, um, you know, I guess through you, Mr. Ma- uh, through Mr. Chair to can I just jump Wheeler. in? First? Uh, well, yeah, uh, but I, I would want to hear from Councilor yeah. Sabrina Wheeler. What, what's what's the, the hope here? Because I'm really on the fence. Well, I, I just want to if tell you. Down the budget is going to get us somewhere. I did it last time. I'll do it again. If it's not going to get us anywhere and it's just <laughs> to make a statement, but it doesn't lead to anything. I'm not really inter- I'm not really sure I want to do that dance again. So I'd like to hear sort of what the end goal is. here. Well, I'd like to tell you what it is going to do. Uh, because a year ago, I had an option that I tried to move forward, and I'm sorry it took so long, and I'm sorry we're at this point. What it will do this year is the council cannot reduce the IT budget specifically. They will have to reduce the finance budget because that's the level you appropriate at. So it will reduce it by $10 million. And then at that point in time, come July, I will have to figure out how I would live with a budget that's $10 million shot. And that usually means people. That usually means lack of services, and that's the reality of it. Now, I know that's not what the council wants, but the last time I had a way out of this. I'm not sure I have a way out of this this time, and the reality will be if you cut $10 million from the finance budget, I cannot legally overexpend that budget. I will have to reduce people in the finance department. We'll have to have a long discussion with my team on how we're going to do that, but legally I cannot overexpend the budget, and I will not. So I do think these are very serious ramifications. I'm sorry we got to this point. I know it took a while, a year ago, to get this moving. I really thought at this point in time we have gotten a moving. Pat and Lee have made this a priority. I know it took long, but it was a lot of work getting there. And I just don't know how touch, cutting $10 million from the finance department is going to get us in any better place with this project last year, I certainly could understand it. I didn't agree with it, but I understand why it was done. And we had a solution that I think allowed the budget to be passed. I'm not quite sure. I have a solution of what I would even be asked to do in order for this not to happen other than the fact that reality is if it does happen, it could have major ramifications on the finance department's budget. Uh, could I ask a question again on on such RFPs? There's a uh, a meeting, and maybe this has already happened already, where interested people come, and Ms. Unger and and Mr. McCormick are there, and they can answer questions. Has that is, has that meeting occurred? Is it going to occur? I guess not. No response. Yes. Uh, 
I'm not sure what happened to Liz. Pat, do you want to address it? Um, that that meeting hasn't occurred. I was hoping that um, uh, through you, uh, Chair Carlone, um, I was hoping Liz would address because again, I'm concerned about how we talk about the process. That's all. Um, in fact, I was going to ask um, Liz if it if it were permissible to even just read out some of the deliverables of the RFP because because I, I do think there's some misunderstanding of, of what's expected um, in response. But again, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I just do not want to do anything that compromises the process. I think Liz has joined us. Yep. Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I would just ask the council to reread through the tasks as they have been laid out in the RFP. Uh, with an eye toward the details that they are seeking answers to. Um, so I would just uh, redirect the council to the tasks as they are laid out in the RFP without going into too much specificity to see if that could help alleviate some of their concerns. Uh, Ms. Unger, I know this is a living hell kind of thing for your position when politics get involved, but um, I, I, Hearing what Mr. McCormick said and what you said and the manager, maybe we're closer than we think. And um, I hope that once we re all review it again, we feel that way. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, because I feel the same way, because our intent is to get to where the council wants to be. Mr. Chair? Uh, Councilor McGovern, please continue. We, we, we sort of... Um, you know, one of the other, one of my other points or one of my other questions was through you to Councilor Sabrina Wheeler, and this is specifically about the budget. Please um, is is to understand. I know he wants to recommend a negative recommendation, and I'm trying to understand before I make a decision where he hopes that leads us. Is it just about a statement, or is it is there a point to doing it that he thinks might get us further along? Because I don't, I, I, this year, last year I was willing to do it to make a statement. This year I'm not sure that I am. I think the statement's been made and I'm just trying to better understand what he wants. Mr. Chair? Councillor. Uh, okay. I didn't mean to cut the line. I know other councillors have their hands up, so I can go, go at the end actually. Why don't you go ahead, Councillor? Apologies to the, to the councillors. Um, to, to direct response to, to Councillor McGovern's question, you know, I think we heard from, from staff right now that what we could do um, is an addendum uh, to the RFP that clarifies the council's intentions that this is uh, about a plan for municipal broadband and, and how much it would cost. Um, uh, as you know, the city manager and, and staff said, we can't, as the council, micromanage city operations and what ends up being issued and what ends up being done. Um, but we do have the power right here um, over the budget and which departments we recommend favorably or, or unfavorably. Um, so at this point today, we're just saying we send the IT department to the full council with a negative recommendation um, for the budget. Ultimately, you know, we could say there has to be funding for the RFP that we're, we're satisfied with or um, we're not going to move forward with the budget, but that's that's not the vote we're taking right now today. Um, and last year when we voted this department negatively, it didn't guarantee that there was going to be an RFP, um, but we did it anyway and, and we took a step in the right direction. Um, I'm hoping that if we, we take the step today, we'll see another step in the right direction. Um, the, the last piece I was just thinking of the, the sort of the RFP uh, focusing on digital equity versus municipal broadband. And I just think of it as you know, if the, the city council had issued an RFP for a school building or had asked for an RFP for a school building and the RFP that ended up getting issued um, focused on school equity. Um, like school equity is great. We should talk about it. That's that's not what we had asked for. Um, we have talked about our digital equity. We're going to keep talking about digital equity. We we need an RFP for municipal broadband. So I, I think that's the message we're we're trying to send today. And I think if there's a specific piece, and that's an addendum clarifying that that we can get to. I I, I do want to say this is a dangerous message at the expense of city employees, and if that's the game we're going to play. We're, we're trying to say we want to work with the council. I want to go on record and say I totally oppose that because I am not gonna support something that risks me having to fire or lay off city employees because an RFP isn't perfect, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, I think I still have the, the, the floor. Please, I, please. I, I would just say that, um, you know, last year and, I, and, and we, you know, last year when we 
initially voted unfavorably on the IT budget, we eventually voted favorably to pass it. Um, so whatever, you know, if, if, if it were to be forwarded negatively today, that does not mean that it's going to be voted negatively when we adopt the budget and we can adopt it later if, if we so choose. So, um, but it is good. You know, I asked the question as to what the implications would, would, would be, and we got that answer. Um, you know, I would, through you, Mr. Chair, to the manager, you know, I think you've heard, and, and, and maybe Ms. Unger or Mr. McCormick, you know, I think you've heard pretty clearly from a majority of the council at this point that, you know, we think there needs to be some, um, you know, some amend, addendum or some amendment or something on this RFP. Uh, is, that, is that possible? And if that is possible, are you could are you prepared to make the commitment to do that today? Because I would if, if that is possible and that can be done, I would like to not vote this down. And and I hate to get into that power struggle, but I think you've heard pretty clearly that we need to see something different or something more. Um, what are the possibilities of that? And are you committed to that? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I need to talk to my team about that. Obviously, the intent was to work this so that the council would be satisfied what role now we can do to make that adjustment, I'm not sure. So at this point, I would say I will do everything I can to try to get it in a place that makes this group happy. But again, if it doesn't and the votes no, it will be at the expense of city employees. And I don't wanna take that lightly. I don't want people to think that's a, a, a trek. That is reality, because I'm not gonna overexpend the budget. So I just want the council to understand if I can't work this up, that they will be telling city employees because of the broadband not being able to work out, they will be losing their jobs. So yeah, we want to play hardball. I have to tell the facts. So I want to work this up, but not risking a no vote on a final adoption night. It will mean potential layoffs come July 1st. Well, so I'm all in, but I don't know if I have the answer. The last one was an easy one and we were able to respond quickly. I don't have an answer that I am assured is gonna satisfy the council with this. So I'm in a difficult spot. If I did, I tell you, yes, let's make it go away. I don't. Well, I do everything I can to try, yes, I will commit to that. So Mr. Chair, um, just, you know, I think I'm gonna reverse what I did last year in that um, I think I will vote in favor today, but that doesn't mean I'm going to vote in favor next time. And I will give you the opportunity, Mr. Manager, to actually to do an addendum to do something that addresses his needs but i will also say this if you don't and we vote against the it budget later it, down the road it's not just going to be on the council's shoulders that positions will be lost this is a two-way street and so yeah i'm not sure what i can do so i understand I'm, that, but i can I, only do what i can do and i, I, I hear you but this is a this is a two-way street and I, I will give you the benefit of the doubt for this vote, but I, I need to see something better before a final vote. And I don't want to lose jobs either. Nobody does. And that's, you know, it is a reality. Um, but again, it's the council has to work with you, but you got to work with us too. And and, and, um, I, think, and I, I don't want to get into this power struggle every okay. time. We talk uh, through the chair and I know you're having a great conversation among the both of you. Thank but you, Mr. Chair. I, 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 I would just I, say, I, I'm going to close out on this, Mr. Chair. I, I just wish that we weren't having this discussion I, around this RFP. I, I understand. I wish we had it several months ago. Thank I you. thank you for bringing up that this is not the final vote, and that allows us a little more time um, to work this out and yet move forward. So, Madam Mayor, I know I stepped on your toe by asking a question that you had on your mind. Is there anything else you would like to add? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No worries. You know, I think um, I generally agree with uh, some of what's being said. I think back to Lee's point, I think there just wasn't a meeting of the minds on some of this. And I think I, I for one, I completely agree on the digital equity piece. And um, I think what you've heard from the council on last year's conversation, um, you know, there uh, inter intertwined, but they're also not m mutually exclusive. And so, um, or something like that. So I think they're two separate issues and I think we, we tend to conflate and I have gone through the RFP and I think I won't mention it, but I, there are some sentences that I think do speak to, I think what the council, um, you know, 
has espoused and so forth. But I also see how um, perhaps there, you know, there perhaps another further conversation, um, which is Councillor was Carlone and now Councillor McGovern's point around this um, to really uh, think about where the meeting the minds should happen on this because it will ultimately be a, be better for everyone. Uh, in the end, if we can get um, on as close to the same page as possible, because what you're hearing is there is this disconnect. So um, I think all that I'll say is, you know, I think I, I agree with what um, Councilor McGovern is saying uh, around this. Um, and I had a diff another point, but uh, I think it lost me. So if I if that point comes back to me, yes. I'll raise my hand, but I'll yield for now. Please, thank you. That usually happens at my age, not at your age, forgetting a point. Here, unfortunately. <laughs> Councillor. Yes. So, Councillor Zondervan is next, then Vice Mayor Mallon, and then Councillor Nolan. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Kale. Again, I, I think the conversation obviously will continue, but again, to remind everybody what the purchasing agent said about getting too deep in the weeds about addendums and what that may or may not include. Um, Cause I wouldn't want to put ourselves in a position where we just have to pull the whole thing back and reissue it. So I, I would just caution everybody to be a little bit careful about their public comments about addendums and the like, just so that we stay on solid ground, please. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you for reminding us of that. That is important. With that in mind, we have Councillor Zondervan, Vice Mayor Mallon, and Councillor Nolan. Councillor Zondervan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I, I appreciate the the request. But unfortunately, I, I don't think I'm <laughs> uh, aware enough of what the what the rules and boundaries are here to know whether or not I'm exceeding them. Um, but I would like to offer a slightly different analogy from my colleagues because I, I think the the challenge, <clears throat> at least for me, is that it isn't so much that the RFP is asking for something different from what we want, it's that it's asking for more options than we want. So, so by analogy, if we asked for a feasibility study on having a municipally owned um, electrical utility with the city of Cambridge, which of course we used to have, but we don't have anymore. And, and then we got an RFP that said, you know, that's one option and, and we can look at that, but there's also other options like we could have Eversource continue to provide electricity for everybody. And that's basically what we got, right? Is that we, the, the RFP as I understand it is asking for, yes, feasibility of municipal broadband, but also other options to provide digital equity and um, connect connectivity across the city and and what I think you're hearing from the council and certainly what I'm trying to communicate is that we don't want those other options. We, we want you to address digital equity however you need to and, and can best do it at the moment. And and then we want a feasibility study on municipal broadband. We, we don't want a study of, of whether Starry or Comcast can actually address the uh, broadband question in Cambridge because so far for decades, they have not been able to do it and, and we have no faith that they will be able to do it. So, so we're asking for a simple RFP that tells us whether and how we can do municipal broadband in Cambridge. And the answer may be we can't or the answer may be that, you know, there's three options and we have to pick, but that's the only question we want to ask. We don't want to ask a question about, can Comcast solve the problem? Can Starry solve the problem? Can we do digital equity some other way besides municipal broadband? We're not trying to ask those questions. So I, I'm not familiar enough with the procurement process to tell you how to remedy it, but if there's a way to narrow the question so that it's asking exactly what we want, then I think we can move forward in, in much more agreement than what we have now. Mr. Chair, I would agree. I just think, and again, I agree with Council, Council's on them and say, 
I think we're going on a path here where we're, it's difficult to know what we can or cannot say. And the more we talk about this RFP, the closer we're gonna be saying something we shouldn't. And I know that's nobody's intention. So I am getting leery that if we're gonna have these conversations, we're gonna put ourselves in a difficult situation, but I know they're important. And I wish I had a better answer, but I think if the next three speakers are addressing the RFP, it's yeah. just without knowing what we can or can't say, oh. We could be putting ourselves in a difficult okay. Uh, no one's fault. I, I believe McG Councillor McGovern had a great point in that this is not the final vote on the budget. That gives us a window of time where we can talk about this um, with the manager with, independently, together, a few of us, and we can work out whatever needs to be worked out or we have that final vote. I think Councillor McGovern's point is the good one. Now, I, I also agree knowing quite a bit about RFPs that um, the city's absolutely right. And the key is that one candidate who's applying learns something that others do not through our discussion. Maybe it's what the council favors, for instance. And that's unfair, and can, we can't keep talking about that. So with that in mind, I know the Vice Mayor and Councillor Nolan will not do that in their final comments, and then I'm going to move the vote. Vice Mayor, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I certainly will not talk about the RFP, <laughs> but I will agree with um, some of the comments that were made before, I think we, we do have some time to work on this, um, given where we are with the budget and where we are with the RFP process. Um, I do have a question though, it's kind of a, a more of a budget question than a um, RFP question. So I'm, sh I'm sure everyone's excited about that. In terms of if we did vote down the budget, um, not just for the IT department, but for any department, what would happen was, and I just want to make sure I'm clear, is that we would vote every month on a one twelfth budget for the finance department. I'd have to, if you're voting to eliminate a dollar amount, that budget is reduced from the total, then we would have to make recommendations. But the immediate impact is that dollar amount is reduced from the budget. So come July 1st, if there were recommendations to figure it out, now remember, free cash will not be certified, so it will be tricky to then add back. It is up to me until that money is restored to make sure that we do not overexpend the budget because legally I can't let that happen. So you're not voting a one twelfth budget. If you were doing that, you'd leave one month in and then you would say, okay, we will revisit it. That's a little different. Now, obviously a one month budget is tricky because if people do have to be laid off, we're going to have to figure that out. But that's what, that would be a different type of rescission. It would be leaving a one month's balance in there. But a rescission of a dollar amount means that that number is no longer in the total and I have to figure out over a year if that number is not added back, how I don't overexpend that budget. And I, I, I have to take some time to figure what that would mean. But at some point, if, if we did one month and we came back for the next month, we certainly could do it that way. That's tricky, but that is another way of looking at it. I just wanted to make sure I had a clear understanding of what it would look like if we didn't vote for the budget, which I'm certain and confident that after this conversation, everyone's sort of on the same page about where we need to get to with this RFP um, in order for it to move forward in a way that we all feel comfortable with. But I did want to make sure I understood the process around the budget, what would happen next, and then the one month budget that would move forward. Um, Cause I certainly think that that's something that maybe not everybody understands. And um, it's just, it's important to talk about when we're talking about maybe not voting for budget. So um, I did want to, one quick thing I wanted to say is I just wanted to respond to Mr. Gianetti who said something like, um, you know, maybe he was misunderstanding the council didn't want digital equity at the forefront of, of a municipal municipal broadband study. I think I've been very public about this. I think in our meetings, I've been very, very open and upfront about the fact that digital equity does need to be at the forefront of our work with the municipal broadband. I think everyone, I've been very clear. I just want 
I know it was stated publicly that maybe the council did not want digital equity to, to be at the forefront of this work. And I just want to be on record publicly that um, I certainly have always thought that it should be at the forefront. And that's why I am so passionate and adamant that we need to do this work correctly and make sure that we get to the desired effect. So um, I'm going to yield the floor at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, M Madam Vice Mayor. I, I think all of us really feel digital equity is absolutely up there. The question might have been focused on broadband, but that was what was behind a lot of it. Now, I've been told that two counselors have to leave at 5 o'clock. Um, so, uh, and we, I have still to speak, uh, Councilor Nolan, and then I will call a vote. Um, and then we have three more departments. And the clerk's office is the last, and he's beginning to really worry. So we, we have to move quickly. Uh, Councilor Nolan, your final comments on the issue. Thank you, Councilor Carlone. Thank you, all my colleagues. Um, I, I do want to uh, echo what uh, the Vice Mayor said. However, I might phrase it somewhat differently that, uh, of course, we all want digital equity and we want municipal broadband. And they are, you can have both. It's like saying, do you want to feed people food or give them a house? It, it's not a question. We do need both. The comment that the goal is digital equity suggest the goal is not municipal broadband first front and center. And I think that's part of the conflation here that is difficult that the mayor and others have talked to. I also want to point out it's critically important that we talk how do how are we defining equity from it's not just about very low income people. It's also about middle class people who are totally struggling. It's also about small business owners who are paying five hundred dollars a month for access to Internet for utilities that they are struggling to pay for. So it, it's really important that we keep the focus on municipal broadband means literally every single person in the city. Um, I, I do want to respond to something Mr. McCormick said about Upgrade Cambridge that, that does recognize the, the work that went into this RFP. However, they are the ones asking us to withdraw this RFP. That doesn't mean we're going to, but their ask was we've gotten many, many emails from the leaders of Upgrade Cambridge saying the city must withdraw the RFP because it is not meeting the goals of the city, um, which is something I, I certainly take um, uh, very seriously. And as Councilor McGovern said, this issue predated me. You know, this has been on, I think, 10 years ago when I was on school committee, digital divide was there. So l let's really work together and come together to finally get answers on municipal broadband. And I will also say I've learned a lot from the folks at, at Upgrade Cambridge who have said, as, as Salem was mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if ultimately that will be a city-owned um, uh, network. However, there are other cities. We are. It is not only cities that own their own municipal light plants, which we could consider in the future, but we're not talking about that. There are other examples of cities that have done this and have brought, we, we, we could bring them in and have them talk about it, but this is, this is not something that is totally unique and it is something critically important for us to do. I feel for myself that I will be voting uh, no on this. I am hoping that in the meantime, we do have some kind of discussion in between now and the final vote, which I do hope to support just like I did last time. Um, and, and we are on the verge of really having finally a study that will give us hopefully what we asked for, uh, not just a year ago, but this council did, I think, five years ago when the community asked for 10 years ago. So thank you, uh, Chair Carlone. Okay, so we're gonna come down to a vote that um, will have repercussions. And I think the more I think about it in my mind is Council McGovern's suggestion makes sense. One second, please. Uh, the clerk reminded me that there's three uh, types of recommendations that we could vote on, favorably, unfavorably, and without a recommendation. And uh, I think I'm going to suggest that we move this forward, the department's uh, budget forward without a recommendation. Um, and 
I believe we can catch up on anything that needs to be caught up on in the next two weeks. Um, as far uh, order. Okay, we have 40, uh, literally 50 minutes to finish our meeting, please. Go ahead, Council. Motion, thank you. I believe the motion is to, um, to recommend with a disfavorable recommendation, so wouldn't we have to vote on that? And then if it doesn't pass, Who, Whose motion is that? Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. We just, we've had a long discussion and then you have a motion. One second, please. There is no motion before the clerk at this time. So, I just made a motion. Mr. Chair, I would, I vote, I would support you in moving this, moving a motion forward and the motion can be directed by the chair. Uh, I concur with you. There's been a lot of discussion, so far fewer questions, and, I th and it's making the meet meeting run very long, and there's other important departments to discuss in, in, in maybe less than an hour. So I would support in moving, if, I, if it, it's less uh, cantankerous or uh, controversial, to move without making a recommendation, which the clerk has advised us is, is an option. It sort of comes down the middle, so I would support you or make a motion to do th that to um, move that we move this forward without recommendation. Uh, the uh, manager, uh, Mr. McCormick, Ms. Unger, all got the message loud and clear. And it might very well be in two weeks that nothing changes and then we go forward on that basis. But I have, my goal is to make things work. The message has been sent and um, and I move the the motion that I've suggested that we move the department's budget section to the full council with no recommendation. Again, I'll just again I'll just state this for the record. Again, the motion is to send this to the full city council. To send the information technology uh, department budget to the full city council without a recommendation. On that motion. Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Councilor Nolan, was that a yes? yes? Present. Present? Changed your mind. Councilor Nolan, present. Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. No. Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. No. No, Councilor Toomey. Yes, Councilor Zondervan. No. No, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Yes, the motion passes, six in favor, two against, one present. All right, we have three topics. Employee benefits pulled by Councilor Nolan. Councilor Nolan, you have the floor. A point of order, Mr. Chair, before Councilor Nolan takes the floor, could you just read out the last three or, or two items we have before us? Yes, uh, employee benefits, mm -hmm. electrical department, and the clerk's office. Thank you. And so Councilor Nolan has the floor with her employee benefit question. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, and I wasn't sure under what category this went because there's a few different parts in the budget but that various numbers appear but it would be helpful for me to understand why it was related under employee benefits that pension was up 12 percent 12.1 percent which was much bigger than any of the other uh, benefits listed and that actually under the um, budgeted uh, position there was um, it went from six million dollars 6.244 uh, in FY20 to this year being expected to be 14.245. So if there's an answer to that question, that'd be great. You jump in quickly and, and hopefully this is a very simple answer. Uh, in order to keep our 2026 pension obligation to have all our pension cleared, which would allow us to free up money for hopefully OPEB or other matters, we decided we would prefer to pay more and keep that date. We feel that's an important date. It's been a city objective for many years rather than pushing that out, which you could have done to 2028. So it was strictly a, a decision that we feel the importance of paying off our OPEB uh, our pension obligations by 2026 is something that has been a priority of the city. So that's, that's why we decided to make that increase. 
Thank you. That does answer the question. It wasn't clear from the write-up. I'm sorry if I missed something. Um, it's tricky. So I don't. That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It was it was big enough that I wanted to call it out. Thank you so much. And Thank someday you. in the future, when we've paid it all off, we'll have a seminar on OPEB and many other benefits. <laughs> I agree. Ideally, on some exotic island. <laughs> um, any other questions on employee benefits? Councilor Simmons, I'm sorry, repeat that again, Councilor. Move with a favorable recommendation. That, that's what I thought you said. Move with a favorable recommendation. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes. Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes. Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes. Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes. Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councilor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Okay, we're on a run. The electrical department is next, and Councilor Nolan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlone. This uh, might also be a quick question. I. Um, know that the electrical department has been working working hard in a number of areas and my question is that i didn't see and again i may have missed it uh what the plans are and expectation for future growth because we know that with the increased electrification of the city we um expect within 20 years the entire city will have to be uh, basically have uh, so much of our infrastructure be switched over and i'm just interested in finding out what the plans and training are in the expectation that even in the coming couple of years we're going to need to make sure that we are ready to, to meet that demand, both on the inspectional side, which I realize is on the city budget, and perhaps in order to, to help um, either residents or um, businesses in the city actually make that shift. And I'm just interested in whether that is part of the plans for this particular department or there would be another part of the city that would uh, handle that. Mr. Manager, Mr. Manager, I'm sure you know everything electrical. <laughs> I, I would suggest that this could be a capital question, Councillor, and uh, if you could send it to us in writing, I would certainly get you an answer for the next meeting, if that's okay with you. And it could save us some time tonight. Yeah. Yes. That's fine, and, and I do apologize. I had not sent this earlier on. No it was problem. something that came up. Okay. But, but when Thank I saw you. it on the agenda, I will do that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both. And now for the most difficult office to deal with, Move this item oh, with the favorable recommendation. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simmons. On, again, on referring the electoral department budget to the full city council with a favorable recommendation, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councillor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councillor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councillor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you. And now, as I was saying, we'll go to the clerk's office. Uh, budget, uh, Councilor Zondervan, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to make sure that we fully utilize the next three, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no one's laughing. I, <laughs> well, I'm trying, but I appreciate that uh, maybe this is not my talent. Um, anyway, I, I have two quick questions on the clerk's office uh, budget. So the first one is um, that the open meeting portal, uh, we've been facing challenges all year with the index are being broken. And I, I'd like to know if that's being addressed and whether we have the resources in the budget to, to address that. So... Uh... Uh, we've, we've discussed this uh, through you, Chair uh, Carlone, uh, Councillor Zondervan. We've discussed this um, uh, a little bit earlier in the year. Uh, we've been aware of the issue with the uh, meeting portal for several months now and, and really general issues with our current uh, minute-taking uh, and meeting software. Uh, we've been in conversations. We, When I say we, the clerk's office has been in conversations with the IT department through Patrick uh, McCormick and his team, and we've had a... Uh, um, been having discussions with the vendor. We are in the process of adopting a new software or looking for new software. We're at the stage now where uh, we're waiting for, we, we've identified a product, 
We think it may solve this, the problems and will add additional functionality and improvements to um, the issue you're talking about and the general um, operations of the, of the meetings, agendas, and minutes, and so on. Um, we are at the phase where we're looking for recommendations from other communities that are using the software and have, in, in, and importantly, have migrated from one data software solution to another, and you know what are the challenge, challenges entailed there, the costs, and so on. Uh, my current understanding, and Patrick McCormick can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the migration um, from our current system to the one we've identified so far would be totally free of cost to the department, um, and the pricing for ongoing operations for the new software would, would be in about the same range, so it won't affect our budget too much. Um, and we are hoping to get this up and running and done uh, by some time. Uh, I'll be optimistic here and say uh, mid to late summer, um, but again, it may be in the fall depending on how things, how things um, uh, work out. Part of that new solution is already kind of up and running. We've, uh, and again, Patrick McCormick talked, discussed this a little bit during the IT, his, his uh, uh, um, conversation during the um, information technology budget. Um, we've got our video up on a new um, video software. If you go into the open meeting portal, there's a link that directs you to another website. Uh, it's a little clunky right now, but that's because we're integrating pieces of upgraded, more stable software. Um, but the hope is to be on one unified system um, that works better, that does the indexing that we've discussed um, in the future. And it, again, the hope is that this is done uh, this calendar year, which you know obviously goes into next fiscal year. Councillor, any follow-up? Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's uh, one of the best answers I've heard all day, and uh, I wish the clerk much luck with that, and, and hope that uh, we we will be able to meet that timeline. It it is uh, challenging for us to do our work um, with the index being broken, so I appreciate the uh, the effort to get that resolved as quickly as possible. So my my final question is. On the committee meeting minutes, I, I know the clerk and I have talked about this previously as well, and, and it does seem to be a resource constraint issue that, that's causing some of the delays that we're experiencing. So again, my question is whether that um, is being addressed in, in this budget. Again, through you, uh, Chair Carlone. Um, we discussed this, I think I've discussed this with a number of counselors. Um, through the year, uh, and even though through COVID, we've tried a, def a number of different solutions. We've looked at some software options um, where we've got sort of a transcription software. Um, again, with varying, uh, varying levels of, of uh, success. Um, I think we talked about whether or not to ask for additional people, so on and so forth. I, I, I have not raised that to the city manager. I do not plan to in the near term, only because, and again, I don't want to talk out of turn, but I've been working with, um, the IT department, the cable, de the cable department, and, the, um, and I think the PIO, uh, the, the Public Information Office, has also been involved in those conversations about closed captioning. Right now, we've got closed caption for city council meetings. Really, the closed captioning is only on the Zoom, and it's also a sort of a separate, you, you open a separate website um, to go there. I know, or I don't want to say I know, but again, David Kale can correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a budget allocation to the cable department. There was, there's eventually, once some uh, technical and um, other issues are resolved, there would be a cable, there would be um, uh, uh, closed captioning for, the, uh, for, uh, um, for all city council meetings, including the committee meetings. Um, and I think those would be the best avenue to quickly churn out uh, effective minutes for the city council. Uh, if you look at the last two city council meetings where you see the, um, we saw the uh, submission of the record that the council approved. Uh, those were generated using the closed captioning recordings from uh, those two city council meetings, and I think that those turned out very well. Um, so I think that'll be, uh, 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 from, the, from the clerk's office department, that'll be a sort of a cost neutral and very efficient method to fix that going forward. Um, again, I don't want to speak, there's, there's a couple of moving parts there, a couple of other departments impacted, so I don't want to say too much and get out of my area of expertise, but I think knowing that we're, that we've generally moved in that direction, um, I sort of want to follow that path. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, to you, to the clerk. Thank you for that answer. So I don't know if anyone else can can speak on 
how soon that might be implemented. I, I do agree with the clerk that, that that would be great as a, a solution. Um, but I have no sense right now of how soon that could be up and running. Uh, I can reach out to, again, it's a, it's a multi-department um, effort. Um, and I can speak to, we've, we had, we've had, we haven't had too many meetings recently, but we've had several meetings about it over the past year. And I can reach out to some of the people. Again, the, the departments that I've been in contact with mostly have been the public information office, the IT department, and cable. And uh, it's really kind of been facilitated by uh, uh, David Kale. And again, we can get together and we can uh, get a response to, um, I don't know how long it'll take. Again, I'm not in control of these departments. Oh, so, Mr. Chair, yeah. we'll, we'll, so, Mr. Clerk, we'll. Please, we'll, Mr. Kale. We'll regroup. We have our weekly IT um, operations meeting, so we'll put that on the next agenda just to get an update and see what is still left to be done, um, and we'll we'll be able to fine tune this. And I don't have a good timeline yet because I don't want to speak out of turn without knowing what what pieces are left to finish. Thank you, Mr. Kale. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to you. Um, Thanks, Mr. Kale, for that answer. And is it, would it be possible to get an update at, at our um, final budget discussions on this item? We'll provide an update, and um, yes. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments on the clerk's office? Really, don't hold back. <laughs> Mr. Chair? Please. No, too late. To, uh, Thank the thank the clerk for his efforts, and uh, really do appreciate the the work that he does. Thank you. Move the clerk's office budget favor forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Simmons. Mr. Clark, on that motion again, for the record, the motion is to refer the city clerk's budget to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councillor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councillor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councillor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councillor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councillor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councillor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. So our, our next meeting is um, a week from today, and it will be as exciting as this past meeting, and um, we all look forward to your input. If you have additional questions, please get it to us by f Friday morning of this week um, so that the clerk has more than enough time um, to disseminate them. That could be an additional question, or if you've not submitted questions on the departments of next t Tuesday. Yes, yeah, that's, I did say to the clerks, uh, the clerk, is getting back at me and wants me to repeat that these should be sent to the clerk's office in care of his attention. Mr. Chair? Please, Madam Mayor. Um, one thing, uh, or two things. I had, I know that we had um, in the beginning pulled diversity committee and committee on civic unity. I, and I think we just, there's a lot that happened. And um, I, all that to say, the question that I had, I'll follow up later. Um, there's no need to suspend the rules uh, on that. Uh, and the second thing was that we do have a school committee budget hearing um, next week as well. And uh, I will be asking members of the council to uh, email me questions um, uh, so I can give a heads up to the school administration and superintendent to be prepared. Uh, and I think what we did last year um, was keeping it to, you know, to uh, two to three questions uh, so that we can get through everything. So uh, I will follow up with an email on that as well. So And that meeting is Wednesday in my room? Wednesday the 19th at 6 p.m. Yes. And the budget is, you should have hard copies, and if you don't, is also online. And I believe Naomi sent out those links. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Any other comments before we end? Move for adjournment. <laughs> Councillor Simmons has suggested we move for adjournment. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Vice Mayor.
Yes, Councilor McGovern. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Simmons. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, Councilor Toomey. Yes. Yes, Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Mayor Siddiqui. Yes. Yes, Councilor Carlone. Yes. Motion passes, nine in favor, zero against. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience and your input and for good discussions. Have a good night. Good night.